Hello, hello, hello. I am extra early because I actually wanted to have enough time to say hello to everyone. I was actually going to do a proper stream today. But I slept so bad last night that I could not get up this morning. But then I did get up. And then, hey, Kasky, hey, Gina, how you doing? Um, I did get up. And then I got a ping that I was needed, that I had been summoned to the Hippie Dippy podcast. So today we're going to be talking about, uh, let me see, I got to keep an eye on their channel for when they start talking. It looks like Dylan Burns still isn't live. Everybody's still chatting and stuff like that, which is fine. That's fine. Um... Oh, we got some sound. Hold on. I'm going to mute my desktop audio just in case. Um, we are talking about mandatory service, uh, prisoner voting rights, and the Paris Climate Accord. I feel like these are pretty open and shut issues. Um, yes. Well, look, no spoilers. You know what? You all know what I'm going to argue, but let's see what the right-wingers are going to come out with. I'm not super prepped for this one, so this is going to be one of those pit-fighting episodes where, um, you know, I'm going to be going in with whatever I got in my noggin. And we're going to see. I don't know basically any of the people on here tonight, which will be really interesting. Um, I do know Breakfast Detective. But I don't know the Turk. I don't know Cinco's. I don't know Bela. Um, so that will be interesting for sure. For sure. We're getting a little bit closer. We got like four more minutes or so. I don't know if I'll stay for the third. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'll stay for the third issue. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Like, I am not super interested in talking about the Paris Climate Accord. That feels like really old news. But all right. If people really want to talk about it, then I'm open to it for sure. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. I do want to talk a little bit about a few things afterwards. Um... It, t it just takes a lot of practice, honestly, and confidence, basically. Um, I've gotten more confident over the last few months because I've been doing so many. Um, but I was really, like, I mean, I still get kind of nervous. And I also did get really nervous. But I've also been debating for a long time. Like, it used to be really common for my family to debate with each other all the time. So I would go into every holiday um, expecting my family to pick a fight with me basically so what is the what's happening here all right i'm just listening for when dylan burns uh says it's time to go l -l live um certain topics i'm really comfortable with doing on short notice like i could probably argue any like um yeah the boomer dinner table exactly yeah it's like um my family used to be like super opinionated and it would it would often end up with me arguing against multiple members of the family. It was really it was really odd and interesting. I really liked political discussions when I was younger. Um but they got a lot worse once I wasn't a right winger. <laughs> they were really intolerant to any and in fact even before um, cause I mean, obviously when you're a kid, you kind of just take whatever political viewpoints for the most part that your parents have. I was actually slightly different than my own parents. Um, it was more religious than my parents. Well, okay. I should qualify that. I was not more religious than my parents, but I was, um, more like biblically based than my parents. My parents were super, super involved in the church. I was kind of like, Hey, like, Hey, Ruffled Bricks, good to see you. Um, I was more like in the like, oh, I really like the Bible and I know a lot about the Bible, but churches are institutions of man, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, yeah, that used to be the subject of what I used to argue about a lot back in the day. Um, but once I realized, once I started having like critiques of religion in general and was trans, my family 
fucking lost it. And they never wanted to have conversations again. So. Such is life. Such is life. But yeah, basically the boomer boomer dinner table. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what have I been doing? Oh yeah, I edited a whole bunch of highlights today. And those are going to go up on my YouTube channel soon. So I'm going to have some video clips up on there. Um, I put up the full VOD of the Hippie Dippy podcast from last week. So if anybody missed it, you can catch it there and watch it in nice 720p. I guess that's nice. Um, I have my got my Sodi. Now we're just waiting. Yeah, it was a trip. Last week's was a trip. Yeah, 720 is fine. Oh, I think it's time. I think it's time. Oh, is it time? Is it time? I'm going to undeafen. Mellow. Yeah, oh, that's okay, Kasky. Never feel bad. 720 is fine. I, I capture my video in 720 until I get a better... I forgot to make that. I got to make that. I got to make a goal thing on the bottom that says how much. Soon. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I realized, Gina, and that's why I stopped worrying about it so much. I was worried about it a lot, but then I realized, like, wait, I actually usually listen to things in lower lower fidelity. Uh-oh. It's getting intense. I, I'm excited. There's some, there's some, it's looking like it's going to be a, a tough crowd tonight. So we'll see. Sorry for. Sorry, I can hear the chat. I don't want to broadcast like a private chat to uh, my own stream. I feel like that's kind of, kind of rude. Um. But yeah, I'm going to be setting a goal to get a CPU. No, I'm not going on the kill stream. I'm going on hippy dippy. It would be bad if I was going on kill stream. Although I do think there's some pretty extreme right wingers on here. So we'll see. We'll see what um what the shakedown is. I don't really... I mean... Yeah, I don't I'm interested. We we've, we've talked about voting rights for prisoners before. But that was with just Republican Nation and his was pretty bad. I have a pretty open and shut argument like Oh. We got some gifted subs going. Yeah, Hippy Dippy is Dylan's thing. I got tagged in at the last minute. I wasn't planning to do anything today. Um well, I did. I had a stream planned, but I was not feeling well this morning because um I got woken up like four times last night. So, hey, there we go. We got some people in here. Uh, let's see. So, me, Pixie, Breakfast Detective, and <gasps> I can hear you. All right, it's time. It begins. But I was able to get it all squared away. I really appreciate Demon Mama coming in last second, and I appreciate Sledge uh, coming out from the woods, you know, from where he was wrestling grizzly bears to come on the show as well. I really appreciate both of you coming on last minute. Real appreciation there. Okay. Once again, this is the Hippie Tippy Podcast. I appreciate everybody tuning in, and I once again want to thank my guests for making the long trudge to this hellhole, which is my Twitch channel, and help me out today with uh, a little bit of engagement on ideas. I'm going to pass it around the room. Everybody can introduce themselves, and then we're going to go into the first topic. Uh, but first, of course, I need to go through some of the rules. Uh, everybody will have one minute to introduce themselves on the topic and what their position is. Nobody is allowed 
to interrupt them. If you do, you will be muted. Uh, you'll also have a one-minute outro for the same topic where you'll be similarly allowed to talk about the topic uninterrupted. The last time you'll be allowed to comment on the topic is during the one-minute intro to the next topic. That is the last time you can talk about it, do any jabs or whatever you want to do around that topic. After that, it's over. No more bringing it up unless it's somehow relevant to the topic. Okay, uh, next, do not at other people in the conversation in chat. You can talk to chat. Hmm. Jabs. I, uh, it always gets people a little heated when they have to respond to chat and that to the other panel hosts. Right? You will have time to talk if you uh, use it correctly. Uh, Pixie just jabbed me in chat. That's a permaban from future shows. <laughs> Wonderful. I believe that's all of the rules. Um, I'm soon actually putting together a Google Doc that will formalize a little bit more rules going into the future. Um, yeah, so I think that's actually everything. So I'm going to pass it around, and we're going to start with Demon Mama on the top left. Who are you? Hey, uh, my name's Demon Mama. Um, I talk about politics, um, talk, do a lot of debate, do a lot of panels, stuff like that. Um, you can find me at Demon Mama Live uh, here on Twitch or on Twitter at Your Demon Mama. I'm going to post those in the chat. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, I know it was kind of short notice, but I'm pretty pumped. So thanks for having me on. Hey, I'll take you. Oh, look, I know we disagree on aliens, but recently with that new stuff that's coming out. I, <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you? Like, oh, my gosh. I don't know, man. It's pretty weird. But but I will say this. You're much better than a wizard. Uh, next, I'm throwing it over to Bela. Oh, hello. I am Bela. I talk environmental science, justice, policy, and activism over on my channel. I'm live in the morning because I am an early bird heathen. Um, I have six reptiles. I haven't been on a panel in a couple months, so kind of nervous to be back, but also very excited. Um, I have many plants, and yeah, that's me. Wonderful. Uh, I only have one reptile on my stream, and that is me. Uh, next, last <laughs> username. I love Dylan. Hi, I'm last username. And uh, last, under last underscore username on Twitch. I'm a uh, libertarian. I uh, uh, love this panel. I love all of you. And it's good to be here. <laughs> oh, how wholesome. That'll go away very quickly. Pixie. <laughs> Hi, Hello. I'm Pixie. I just talk politics on Twitch. I, I've been kind of like going in and out like a streaming, but I always love debating and conversing with people. So here I am. It's always a joy to have Pixie on, truly. And I'm happy you're back on Twitch. I'm happy you're back to stream, and I love watching your streams and lurking in chat. <laughs> and my favorite tech guy, who I get, who I watched to build a PS5 on YouTube, amazing video. Uh, who are you? So I'm a Turk. I'm uh, one of the resident right wingers on this panel. And uh, like I, like uh, Dylan said, I stream science and tech on Twitch. I post to YouTube. Uh, so if you like computers and all that stuff, uh, hit me in a follow. Awesome. Uh, breakfast detective. And by the way, what is your favorite breakfast item? You've never been clear on that. You're, you're muted. Can you hear me? God damn those mutes. So clear. It's got to be the Same. Liege waffle. Mamma mia, the Belgians know how to do a good waffle. So much better than that IHOP bullshit, too. Uh, I am Breakfast Detective. I do news, politics, epistemology. Uh, we have LGBTQIA panels on Saturday. Tune in tomorrow at 2 p.m. if you want to check that out. Demon I will be Mama there. Demon will, Mama will, will be there. So if you like any of these spicy takes and you want round two, you know where to find it. Thanks, chat. And Sledge has, has come out of the woods, you know, come out of come out of the True. cave to come onto the show today. He's taped together a computer, figured it out. Who are you, man? I'm just Sledge. Yeah, that... I'm not doing anything else. I'm just me. He's that's just Sledge. That's who he is, and that's why we love him. Next, we're gonna bring up uh, is Sissos, correct? Is that how I pronounce it? Cinco. Sicos. Okay. No, Cicos. Cinco is like five, like Spanish. Cinco. Got it. Cinco. So who are you? Uh, just yeah, I just love back regular guy. Backdrop. Wanted to check Twitch out. Found a new streamer. So dipping dipping my feet in the water on this one. I enjoy just connecting, talking to people. So. Seems like a good place to be. Wonderful. I mean, it is a good place to. Uh, eh, you know what? I'm just gonna. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave that out in the water a little bit. I don't know if it's exactly a great place to be, but it's a place to be. That's for sure. Okay, let's get to it the is first a place topic. To be. Pretty True. simple one. I don't think it needs much explanation. Should prisoners have the right to vote? 
Uh, don't confuse this one with the other topic, which is felons, but prisoners, as in people who are currently incarcerated. Should they have the right to vote in prison? There you go. Just wanted to make that clear. Uh, take the topic however you want. I'm going to start on my top right side with my favorite uh, communist, the last username. Absolutely. Um, prisoners should have the right to vote. Everyone. Uh, okay, so um, I I'm, have my criticisms about democracy, but if you're going to do democracy, you might as well do it right. And I think the way to do it right is to have a simple as criteria as possible for who gets to vote. Because any kind of excuse you come up with for, oh, this person shouldn't be able to vote because they're not smart enough, because they're not uh, law abiding enough, because they're not old enough, blah, blah, blah. You can always say, well, why should that matter? And um, doesn't this create a perverse incentive for the authorities to create, you know, to ger gerrymander the criteria about whether you can vote um, to favor them? And it, it always does. And certainly the prohibition against criminals voting uh, has that major uh, moral hazard. So. Um, so yes, let criminals vote, let everyone vote. I would even let, like, I would take away the age limits about voting, like let babies vote if they can crawl to the voting booth. Sure. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I'm sure we'll get into the, the weeds about, um, about these arguments, but I think I'm, I, I can argue that even babies and criminals should be able to vote. There we go. Well, you know what? I'm sure, uh, I would have voted John Kerry as a three-year-old. I'm positive. Uh, Bela. Uh, yes, if we want to have a true democracy, uh, people in prison should be allowed to vote. The end. Well, that was short and sweet. Uh, and I have some weird feelings. I'm not going to get a lot of disagreement on this next person either. Demon Mama. Yeah, um, I absolutely believe that prisoners should be given the right to vote. I think it is uh, atrocious um, that that uh, we have certain areas of our country where that is not the case, uh, where uh, felons are not allowed to vote. Um, there's no reason why... Um, committing a crime um, should strip your ability to participate in the country that you live in and are literally imprisoned in. Um, and I think that um, most arguments that I've heard against this tend to be like, oh, yeah, well, what if prisoners just vote to let themselves out? But that just doesn't make any sense. There's it's not how a democracy functions. Um, and if they do, maybe they have a good case for it. If you can get enough people to support that, maybe that's what they should do. So yeah, uh, prisoners should absolutely have the right to vote. Um, stripping it away is um, inhumane. Okay, next I'm gonna throw it over to the Turk. Uh, well, I'm gonna have to disagree with a lot of these points. Uh, you know, as a citizen of the United States, we have a obligation to be kind to one another and do all that kind of stuff. And once you violate laws that are established by, you know, the people we vote into office and all that stuff, uh, you no longer are, are still in good standing fun. with society. And thus you should uh, not have you know, <laughs> certain privileges that you are granted by the constitution and the law. So that's my opinion. Wonderful. Next, we're going to throw it over to Pixie. Um, so to be like, extremely blunt um i think everybody yeah I, I definitely think everybody should have the right to vote i think um having this idea that like oh no criminals shouldn't be able to vote um to put it like you know evil tyrannical and like the worst like interpretation possible like it gives a perverse incentment um for the government to jail those who are against them right because then they don't have the right to vote and we've seen this historically speaking with the war on drugs 1960s nixon so I definitely think everybody should have the right to vote. Wonderful. Next, I'm going to throw it over to Sis. Uh, oof, oh man, I'm bad with I'm bad with any other language. Uh, say it one more time for me. Cinco's. Cinco's. Okay, I'm throwing it over to Cinco's. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm going to have to disagree with the majority of the panels thus far. You know, I think whenever you commit criminal actions, you give up and you go to jail, you give up a lot of rights. Basically, most of your freedom, you're in a jail cell. It's not meant to be a fun place. It's it's a place where you're supposed to go and reflect on what you did. And, you know, it's supposed to be re rehabilitation. I mean, that's what we call it. And, you know, I think that if given the choice of having the right to vote, say, to another right, they would probably choose the other right, say, to having a day off out of jail. But like I said, it's not meant to be a good, fun place. It's a place you go because you got in trouble because you did something wrong. Yeah. Now, I'm... Afterwards, I think we can have a discussion about having the right to vote. They paid their time. They did it. But while while in prison or in jail, no, I don't think they should have that right. Okay, next I'm going to throw it over to Sledge. 
uh, depending on the crime, depending on what your definition of prisoner is and everything else. But all in all, I would say no. Okay, and next is going to be, and next and last until open debate. Damn, it's last year's name on our detective. side. Yo, so there's a lot of misconceptions about this, right? So currently, um, m most prisoners, 65% of prisoners in the United States, uh, do have uh, the right to vote. That's 65% of prisoners held in jail. The only people who don't have the right to vote are felons. Um, so we, we can have a separate conversation about whether or not felons should be uh, re-enfranchised with their right to vote. But currently, 65% of the people in jails today the uh, yes. have the right to vote and are not able to vote. So uh, these are people who are arrested on misdemeanors who don't have the ability to post bail. Those are people who would not be disenfranchised from the right to vote. And as a result, uh, I think that we're failing ourselves as a democracy if we're letting 65% of our jail population not vote. True. Okay, thank you. And that is the last intro. We're going to put it up to open uh, discussion. I just want to make clear one last time that if I, uh, oh, I, I didn't say this earlier, so I should say this now. If I do raise my voice or I'm starting to like talk and try to stop things, I do want everybody to shut it down. If you don't shut it down, I'll mute you. I do need to keep some order here. I am the law, as they say. Uh, okay, so it's now open debate. If you, anybody said anything you disagree with or you want to expand on something, you are now free to do so. I'll, yeah, I'll go. Yeah. Um, wow. So something that I wanted to expand on there when talking, um, I should have written it down immediately, but so we also have to take into consideration how disproportionately we arrest people in the United States and how many people just be labeled a felon when they really shouldn't be. Um, and so like, and also how we mentioned 65% um, have the right to vote and are unable to vote already. Like we need to make that accessible for those who are able to vote. And we also need to go and readdress the way that we label people as felons and how often we arrest people. Because the private prison system in the United States, the only way that it's allowed to thrive is because they're keeping people in there. They're deliberately going out of their way to arrest people to keep making bank. So I think it's incredibly unjust. Um, and that also needs to be addressed in this. I didn't expect coming into this conversation that I would be doing the arm meme with last username over prisoners' right to vote. <laughs> um, but I'm happy. I'm happy that I mean, on what's that? You know the arm where it's like the the predator arm meme, and they're like in agreement. Yeah, the, that's uh, Rocky. Come on. Oh, is it Rocky? Was that what it was? I thought it was Predator. People always say it's Predator. predator. That's what I've heard. Whatever. Um, Rocky. Fine. <laughs> All right, all right, fine. I didn't go to know your meme. Jesus Christ, fucking boomer me already. But um, but yeah, I'm glad that we're. I'm glad that on that axis of libertarianism, you and I are in agreement. Um, I think. Our meme. Yeah, our meme. But uh, but yeah, um, I think that there is a certain callousness that's taken towards um prisoners and criminals in general in our country that I find really uh, increasingly troubling. And it seems to be, um, at least by my gauge, and this is a bit of just a, you know, gauge by my uh, watching and, and paying attention to a lot of politics. It certainly seems like it's getting more intense these days. But lots of people can become a criminal for a lot of reasons. There are all kinds of things on the books. And there are even really unjust laws that get put on the books. Um, and the idea that you would be stripped of your constitutional right to vote for being a prisoner for any reason is, is to me, incredibly troubling. So I'd be interested um, to find out, for the people who did say yes, um, who did believe that prisoners should be stripped of the right to vote, um, I would be interested to find out where that line ends. Do you think that people who are charged with misdemeanors, who are technically criminals, um, people who are charged with imprisonable offenses and the judge decides to put them into prison um instead of charging them a fine because of the judge's own jurisdiction should they be removed um the, you know their right to vote their constitutional right to vote and also as a follow-up like why for that you keep mentioning this their constitutional right I mean, is it against their constitutional rights that they get thrown into a cell and can't leave? Or can't leave the premises because I mean that is technically a violation of their constitutional rights to be free. So I mean it's, I mean yeah it's it's a taking away their constitutional right, but so is everything else about prison. It's literally meant to take all that away and be a punishment. I don't see how that's what constitutional right is that violating. 
Constitution doesn't say you can't be in prison, doesn't it? I, I mean, I, I guess not. But I mean, would you not say that you have a I, you have a right to freedom, to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness? Is that uh, okay? Life, liberty. I mean, mm, uh, yeah. Is this a thing that anything period. the government does to you, like that's not interpreted uh -huh. to mean that you know you can't be you can't be put in prison for committing a crime. I mean, if you're so you know, like there are many other constitutional rights that are respected, like your right to free speech and everything. Um, I don't see how it's particularly unconstitutional as, as the constitution is usually interpreted legally. And uh, from my perspective, I am in the long run, a prison abolitionist. So you will not find any, uh, any, uh, any disagreement with the idea that we should get rid of prisons altogether and come up with new models from me. However, I don't see that given our current system, why we should remove the right to vote from prisoners when that removes their, their agency, um, to even participate in any sort of process that would determine the law. I mean, what happens if there's a law on the books that, I mean, for example, in some places there are still laws on the books that, uh sodomy is illegal having sex the way that you want is illegal in some places which is obviously unconstitutional but if somebody was imprisoned on that don't you think that prisoner should have the right to participate in a democratic process that would determine whether that's a just law i don't know at least i think so and also again then what's the line where's the line where you say you can no longer um have any participation in the self-determination of the country that you were born into most likely i mean we're not I assume, you know, we could be talking about people who immigrated here, but regardless, we can assume that it is their country as well as, as it is anyone else's. If you're imprisoned in this country. Yeah, I heard some 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 views, uh, you know, supporting the prohibition of voting. So when people say that criminals have sort of like opted out of society or, or have declined to like participate in society, therefore they can't vote as part of the society. That's just simply not true. Um, just because you're a criminal, just because you're being punished for a crime, you're still part of the society. If, if you think that's not true, you're going to have to, it is predator. you know, being part of society in some way, you know, to clarify what you mean by that. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you are a criminal part of society, you're still a part of society and you still have the right to vote. Just we have many other rights. Um, the other thing I've, I heard was that prison is, is not supposed to be a, a fun or nice place. Um, so that kind of implies that that your right to vote is a sort of fun thing that the government lets you do out of its kindness of its heart, which is obviously, I don't think we really think that's what voting is. Voting is something that you have a right to do. Um, and I don't see any particular reason prison should take away that right any more than it should take away any other right. Like we're very specific about what how prison punishes you. And we have ways to, to um, control how severe that punishment is without sort of arbitrarily taking away various rights. I, I guess, can't. So, Cinco, do you want to go, and then I'll, I'll. Uh, well, I, I was just going to ask him what is what is the purpose of prison? Okay, so with all due respect, that's a totally separate question. So I'm going to go back to answering what we were just talking about. Um, let's, the two things that I see it. as most problematic with this is number one, uh, prison is not designed you, to I take away it. your right to vote. That. If that happens incidentally as a result of us imprisoning you, that's a mistake. <laughs> so that's number one. Number two is that, uh, you know, when we, I lost my train of thought. It'll, it'll, it'll come back. Cinco's ask another off topic question. Wait, I have, oh, I have. Well, to be, to, 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 to be fair, I think figuring out what the function of, 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 you know, prisons are is an important thing that should be taken into account when asking, should the people inhabiting prisons be able to vote? I do think that is an appropriate question to ask, isn't it? Yeah, let's get to the heart of this. So, like, there. So, what are the very the the there's several things that that are often cited as the purpose of prison to to uh, punish people that sort of out of justice to keep the public safe um, <clears throat> and to rehabilitate and to deter, I guess. So, um, I yeah, those do any of those things justify um, taking away or preventing people from voting? A pixie, you wanted to say something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I wanted to reiterate my point from earlier on when we, like, I, I know it sounds like extreme, but literally, like, this has happened historically. I want to talk about, like, the war on drugs, about how, like, we had a uh, advisor from Nixon's board 
quite literally say, oh, yeah, like, we knew that we couldn't throw people in jail for being, like, Black or for being a hippie, but we knew we could throw them in jail by associating with the marijuana and LSD and then heavily criminalizing those substances. Um, Literally, like, the roots of the war on drugs were to um, diminish these communities, break them down, and throw these people to jail. And also, I I would argue, like, an extension of that is also to limit their right to vote, their accessibility to democracy, to be able to like gather up, to be able to like form coalitions. So when we effectively say like, hey, you know what, like your right to vote um, is going to be taken away when you're in jail or you can't vote when you happen to be in jail, you're effectively giving the like, dangerous power to the state um, for if like things ever get like, let's say worse, or <laughs> let's say that things ever get like more tyrannical than what they currently are, it can easily are, lead to like more and more justification tyrannical. of like, oh, why you should be in jail, even if it's for a law that maybe we shouldn't even consider immoral to begin with. Like, I think the fact that we consider drugs to be a jail issue instead of a mental health his- issue is preposterous to begin with. Okay, what, one thing I have is that y'all are mentioning that it seems like a way to control the vote that we can't have all these people and then it started out as a way to control the vote but yet breakfast just gave us the statistics that in 65 percent of these of people that are jailed have the ability to vote i mean whether they can pay for the bill or not that's a separate issue but you're talking about a uh you know presidency or a group of politicians trying to make a policy to jail or an idea i guess to jail a whole bunch of people when only you know a small percentage of jails actually take the way take the right to vote away so i don't know if i no, no, necessarily no, no. believe in that whole no lot. I, I think what uh, I, I should let breakfast detective i was just gonna I'll sit. pass it off to you in a, okay. in a quick second okay god so uh so the the point was not that only 65 percent take it away it's the point that 65 percent of people in jail are not disenfranchised from voting so they have the right to vote if they were to be able to just walk up to a poll or get a mail-in ballot at the jail for instance they would be able to just mail it off but these jails number one usually don't know this they don't care to count and then you know number three you know kind of skipping along there they just they don't have an incentive to there's no jail guarantee program the one thing I was just going to, I remembered from what I was going to say before to kind of underline Pixie's point is if we allow, or if, rather if we disenfranchise some people from voting just by nature of them being in jail, let alone prison, um, then essentially what we're allowing for is politicians to be able to use this as a weapon, exactly the way that Pixie was talking about, where they can, they can surgically and target specific communities to disenfranchise them even if it's just temporarily even if it's one or two or three elections that has enough to set ju- judicial precedent i mean like true multi kind of true for politicians we like or politicians we hate yeah um so and so just to clarify brexit there's no there's no law that says that prisons are obligated to provide uh facilities for voting right right which seems like there could be if we wanted to do that right so That's at that point, point, wouldn't it be up to the individual to find a way to get a ballot and cast it? I mean, there's there are, that. well, they there can't in prison. That's how it is now. What, what is so time? basically, what is so so basically, Turk. That's exactly how it is now. So like, for instance, let's say you get picked up on a seatbelt charge. You know, it's seventy bucks. You're homeless. I don't know. It's I don't know. For let's say for the sake of it, you can't afford the uh, ticket. They throw you in jail, lock up, whatever, awaiting pre like pre trial. Your bail is set over an amount you can't afford. You have no credit history, so you can't get a bail bond. So in prison, without internet access and without access to your phone, you have to somehow find the address for the board of elections, your local board of elections, and then either send them an email, call them, or write them a letter and say, "I would like my ballot sent to this jail." Which is, I mean, I think we can agree is kind of cost prohibitive for people who are already behind bars. Yeah, there's um, some troubling overlays um, between our current existent uh, prisons uh, and jail system, our um, our bail system um, that that uh, is basically designed to allow um, you know rich criminals or people accused of a crime to um, get out of jail. Uh, at a at a at a price or at a cost um, that can't be afforded by everyone, um, and that means that those people who are locked up in jail, um, who can't afford bail, uh, are not going to be able to practice the right they're actually guaranteed currently by law. So that's that's a, a big problem. Um, but there's another problem, which is that the way that our prison system is 
um, set up, it, we don't have uh, currently a clear um, sort of philosophy as to what our prisons do. Um, in fact, the only um, sort of universal philosophy that I think that can be currently distilled out of our out of the American prison system is that we don't care about using prisoners to make money um, or to save the state money. For example, in California, this was a story that was really big last year, but it's been going on for a long time. Um, private prisons um, would would uh, essentially um, lease out prisoners to the state to fight fires um, by depriving their prisoners of necessities, um, having an internal prison store, and then giving them absolutely atrocious pay um, if they go do firefighting for the state. Um, that is really bad. And I don't really, like, we could talk about the severity of various crimes, but to any goal besides profit, an incredibly corrupt profit, what does that actually accomplish? It doesn't really punish people in a meaningful direction. It doesn't really reduce recidivism. And in fact, if anything, it's more likely to put someone in a position where they're going to have to commit a crime again in the future, maybe a different crime than they committed originally, um, or maybe the same. Um, so I think that's a really problematic system that a lot of people don't think about. And then there's an approach, um, there's an approach to prisons that's just like, yeah, well, prisons aren't supposed to be a fun place to place a punishment. Well, I mean, is that really what a prison is supposed to be? Are we a vengeance state or are we trying to protect people maybe um, and and reform people? I don't know. I don't think that we have a clear philosophy in our country as to what our prisons are supposed to do. And the type of, um, you know, if we're going to have prisons at all, I would argue that the goal should be, number one, to protect people who've been harmed from future harm, and two... Um, to help people fix whatever caused them to commit a crime that harmed somebody else in the future. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, the increasing privatization of prisons seems to say that our motivation is rather to find free labor by any means possible, even if that means coming up with crimes to throw people in prison, remove their ability to vote, and then force them to go do work. Well, I'm going to take this in a logical direction. It's very simple. They have, They lost the right to vote. So the argument is they should have the right to vote because it's a constitutional right, correct? Is that the argument you're making? What? No. I mean, I would argue because that— the constitutional right, they have the right to vote. They should have the right to vote. Oh, I mean, if, I mean, for sure. I think that everyone so should have the right to can vote. We, which rights can we take away? Because if, if on that same note, then they should all have guns as well because, you know, Second Amendment. Well, or the ability to participate in the militia, depending on how you interpret it. But yes, um, but so uh, you more guns. I mean, you're for that too. Wait, I mean, that's not close uh, to the uh, same thing. I mean, but my position, it no, it really, it really actually right. is the same thing. Yes, uh, it is because it's a constitutional right. No, actually, what we were talking about originally was it was it's been established in this conversation that most prisoners, not felons, we've already we it was very distinctly. Um, brought out in the beginning that uh, that we're not talking about felons here. Uh, most prisoners do legally have the right to vote, and they are being um, restricted from that in extra legal an extra legal manner. Now, I personally, on a philosophical level, have a problem with prisons because I don't think prisons are effective as a means of protecting people from future harm or from uh, or reforming people, and therefore I do have an issue with simultaneously um saying like oh well you know why can we put, put somebody in a concrete cell in horrible conditions potentially exposed to disease um but but then we're gonna have i mean i have problems with both of those things is what i'm saying um but in given the the circ the, the, the currently existent circumstance we have another form of injustice piled on top of it which is that prisoners who currently do have the right to vote the legal right to vote are being stripped of that arbitrarily or through via neglect Um, Sledge, okay, I have a, I have a question for you. Um, let's say, hypothetically, for whatever reason, they decided to make a law that tomorrow having a beard is illegal. And if you have one, it's going to be thrown in, you're going to be thrown into jail. Would you say like, hey, you know what, that's unjust? I don't live in a hypothetical world. Sorry. Well, so that's, I mean, we keep saying like, okay, if they create a law... And I mean, I, I get it. We can have a whole conversation about, you know, like weed. I understand that there's a lot of people in jail for weed and pretty much that's become like the new norm. And, and yeah, my personal, so I don't believe that people should be jailed for that. 
However, it's it's like what what possible law that could come up out of nowhere that just gels a group of people to control the vote. And I, I believe if something did like that happen where they said, hey, you got a beard, you're you're going to jail. I think if something like that was to ever come about, there would be an uprising of people saying, no, we're not going to let this happen. Because obviously it's I mean, it's kind of a bananas scenario that something just went so crazy. Well, but I, well, but I mean, I it already was, exists today. Like yeah, you I just said you a, that it did. So I can give you a perfect example. Uh, about a year, year and a half ago, you could go to a gun shop and buy a bump stock, uh, completely, completely legal, and now it's not. You're a felon if you're caught owning one of those. So yeah, Stand what y'all are talking though. completely legit. You no, know, people making laws out of thin air for good reason or not. You know, you're you're making people that used to be innocent uh or not guilty now guilty of a crime and this is this is what i brought up about having like um an increasingly yeah. common uh like callousness towards uh prisoners that all of a sudden if you go to jail if you are um locked up for whatever crime that all of a sudden you should be stripped of all of your human dignity um again as somebody who in the long term would like to get rid of the prison system entirely um i think that uh but obviously that can't happen that sort of thing can't happen overnight obviously but i think that we can uh you know i think that it's a rational thing to say hey um yeah it's already pretty fucking terrible that um we lock up people in a concrete box um and do horrible things to them and subject them to horrible conditions for all manner of crimes everything from possession of marijuana to not being able to pay certain fines there's all kinds of reasons people get thrown into jail a lot of them are very unjust i would argue the whole institution is unjust but on top of that, I think that it's it's even worse to say, hey, not only are you going to be jailed and locked into a cage by the state, but you will, during that time, be incapable of protesting in any way at, in, in the form of civil democracy that we understand. You're going to be uh, illegally, in this case, stripped of your right to participate in that. Um, I think that's pretty wrong. What's the punishment for violating law? So, so I'll, I'll jump in here really quick and I want to ask like has anyone here actually visited a prison before? Yes. Okay. As I got to go and visit Norco um, here in California like two years ago. And hey, from the experience the of Appreciate going into it. an actual prison and seeing the people there, it brings a... It shines a light on how inhumane we treat people. And... So, like, I forget who mentioned it earlier. My chat, we were, uh, we pulled up a climate paper a second ago because someone had some new data to share with me. Um, so I for, didn't catch who exactly said that we should be abolishing our prison system because I completely, like, agree. Um, our system is made to dehumanize, strip away, like, basically treat people like animals with how closed, like, close quarters everything is. Um and then we do not provide any sort of way to re rehabilitate them to bring them back into society. Um, and I, that was just something that like I popped in my head. I know it's a little bit off tangent here, but I'm like, our the United States prison system is completely trash, and it needs to be reformed and or completely abolished because all it is it's perpetuating a cycle of keeping people in there only to be re released. And then more likely than not ending back up in the same situation because they weren't allowed to learn. Like I remember there's one private prison that was like, it's about a $5 to read a minute of a book and some nonsense like that. Like that's, we shouldn't be treating people like less than human. And then when you look at the statistics of the like demographics of people that are more commonly arrested compared to others. And it's just adds into the narrative of a lot of racism and a lot of, um, again, like just treating people like cattle basically. So random tangent, I know um, it just popped in my head and I was like, oh yeah, I remember when I visited Dorco and it made my heart break for everyone there. Like I know that they were criminals, but it was disgusting and people should not be put in conditions like that. So. Right. So America has a massive, you know, is massive problem with over incarceration. They they imprison more, more prisoners per capita than any other country in the world or any sort of big country. And this, you know, compared to like, like crazy totalitarian countries. 
Um, you compare it to like Canada, for example, which is culturally very simple, it's similar, has similar crime rates, but America has like twice or twice as many um, prisoners or something. Um, and conditions in prisons are pretty bad. Uh, and frankly, America has a lot of stupid laws. Someone pointed out that, you know, you can be a felon for having the wrong kind of stock on your gun. We have drug laws, war on drugs, massively imprisons innocent people. Um, the only, the mechanism that exists, the only mechanism ultimately for keeping the government accountable for the laws they make is voting, is democracy. So if you take the vote away from people who are criminals, then you fundamentally, you just break that mechanism. You create an incentive for, for the government to outlaw, um, uh, make laws that, that prevent people from voting against them but, and holding them accountable for those laws. And that's fun. That is absolutely essential for democracy to work. So that's an extremely good reason to allow criminals, allow felons to vote. Um, and there's no particular reason to not. So I just don't see what, what the justification is for, for stopping them from voting. Yeah, we've but, had multiple periods of our history, too, where that's been the case um, with the prohibition, the war on drugs. Um, I mean, we have we currently have criminalization of consensual sex work. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know, like we have a lot of things on the books that are personal choices that do no harm to anyone else that have been determined as some form of like moral wrong by the state. Um, sometimes with very direct, like uh, what Pixie brought up about, um, you know, Nixon specifically hoping to target um, black Americans and hippies um, with marijuana laws. Um, like that is an absolute abuse of power. That is a goal by those who are in charge to stay in charge at any cost, even if that means locking up their their you know anybody who disagrees with them in a concrete box. Um, also, I mean. There's just like, I, I don't know, I think that uh, our culture has shifted to this um, very strong polarization between the absolute and abject um, dehumanization of criminals. Um, and then there are there are like criminals and there are people. And I find that really, really, really troubling um, for a number of reasons. But additionally, like, I mean, do you do we really think does anybody on this panel really think that like possession of, of marijuana or like not being able to pay your speeding ticket should land you in a place where you can no longer participate in democracy, supposedly the, you know, founding uh, ideology, political ideology of our entire nation. That seems to me to be a massive flaw in, in, um, in any sort of proposed democracy. Hey, thank you, John Zuck. Appreciate that. Here's a quick point about prison populations too, right? So the United States, we got about 330 million people Yay, um, thank you, John Zuck. We have the world's most prisoners by a huge margin. So uh, communist China, a country of 1.3 billion, they have a billion people more than us. We have over a million more prisoners than they do. So like when people criticize other countries, you know, for being like authoritarian regimes, like it's it's worth keeping in mind that like we we are the preeminent jailers of the world. We jail more people than anyone even close. And on top of that, you know, like I would, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, but grateful to uh, agree with last username on so many of these points. Cause I, I think about this, if, if I was a free market person, right. I would think that a jail is an environment that creates a monopoly where there is no competition. These, these, th there isn't, there isn't the ability for, let's say a cheap startup phone company to be like, Hey, we'll offer prisoners like unlimited internet access for like a dollar a month or what, I mean, whatever. But they're, they're monopolistic structures that control the entire operati the, the, the entirety of the operating of someone's life. So what we're essentially doing is we're, we're renting these people off to these private prison corporations in most situations who profit off of people when they're at their absolute worst. And then as a result of that, we allow for these private companies to deprive these people of their current rights to vote in many situations. And to what end? Like, what does that accomplish besides enriching the people who happen to own those prisons? Does that help society? Do we really think that having massive, um, like, stagnation in the form of people being locked in prisons for years and years on end is doing anything good for our society? Do we think that's actually accomplishing anything? And if so, what? So what do you do with a rapist or a murderer? 
You put them in jail and let them vote. I mean, in our current system, that seems pretty like a like a pretty like standard legal procedure. Like, um, I don't know. Like, are you asking in like an ideal society? Because I don't uh, I don't know that we even have a a complete answer to that. Um, it's incredibly hard to determine like what what anybody should do um, with someone who does a wrong. Like, uh, I think that murder and rape are pretty much the worst things. The wor like some of the worst crimes you can imagine, um, but does that mean that we just just kill them like instantly? Like I I, I think a lot of people uh, from many many perspectives would say, oh, that's probably not the best solution. Um, just and it, because also there's there's huge issues with the with it, how you actually do a judicial process with that as well. In addition to whether you think it's like a death penalty is just. Um, I would argue that for 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 something like um like murder, we have um pretty well established systems currently in place um that tell us what we what our you know what our laws are to do with somebody with murder. Now, if you want to talk about like in a post prison system, I can make a ton of recommendations as to what we should do um and what I think might be a better solution than just locking someone in a concrete box. Um but I don't know. That that really depends. Right now, they should be allowed the right to 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 vote. Even if you've done yeah, like, something heinous, I think we're, we're kind of getting distracted by a lot of uh, like interesting issues, but the things that aren't really relevant to the issue of voting. Like, regardless of how harsh punishments are and how unpleasant prisons are, there's no particular reason to to deprive people of the right to vote when they're in those prisons. So, like, maybe we do execute murderers and rapists, but we should still let them vote while they're on death row. I don't see why not. Uh, I, I don't like step in, but this is a point that I hear a lot when this discussion comes up is, you know, there's a lot of pretty evil people out there, you know, people who've raped people, killed people, slaughtered mass shooters. Um, would we really want these types of figures participating in our democracy? Why not? I mean, like, are you worried that they're going to vote to legalize murder? I mean, if enough people really want to legalize murder, like if half the population wants to do that, then I guess we should do that. But I don't think that's going to happen, right? Like, I don't think there's enough murderers to to have any significant influence on an election. Like, if a politician runs on a pro-murder platform, it's probably going to hurt them more than, than help them, right? Yes. But, we shouldn't fear the pro-murder lobby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think also... Then I guess murderers should be legalized. Like, I don't know. What, yeah. What, what, the only mechanism we really have as a society for objectively knowing what the law should be is is what people vote for, is what's popular, right? Right. And and there's another thing, too, which is that at the end of the day, um, like um, someone who commits a crime, like like there's like a million reasons why people do it. And at the end of the day, it comes down to we have a system in place where a judge gets to, gets to sort of determine what they think is appropriate after a lot of thinking and a lot of back and forth with juries. We can't know what's in someone's head and make and saying like, oh, someone um <laughs> You know, someone shouldn't be able to vote on any topic because they did X crime like that contaminates every single other thought that they have in their head um, is kind of concerning because then it's like, OK, well, then, like, should we also strip the right to vote from people who like who who I think are involved in like really, really terrible and toxic and harmful systems? Like, I mean, like I would argue that um, some like churches and stuff like, I mean, Scientology is like a great example. Um, maybe maybe there's some Scientologists here, but um, I think Scientology is a church that's, you know, has a very checkered past, some really, really uh, like openly bad, um, like toxic structures. And do, should the people who happen to be involved in that church, even if they support those bad things, should they be stripped of the right to vote on every other issue that affects their life? I don't think you can build a functional democracy where we um, say like doing one bad thing, like knocks you out of the ability to have a say on everything else in it. And again, I, I think it's kind of a, um, a silly concern to try to be like, there's going to be a pro murder lobby by murderers in jail who want to vote to make murder legal like unless you literally believe that there's a majority of murderers in this country i don't think that's a realistic belief i think people who commit murder will always be a minority um regardless so i don't think that there's any um way that they could make a, a political movement to legalize i think that's a, like a, like a, almost like a silly argument but you're using an example that's like way fringe right you're Am saying I? let's abolish the the law of capital murder right let's abolish that that's not you know something people vote on they po vote on 
party platforms. They vote for people that represent people. And, you know, let's say, you know, if a high percentage of these people are in areas that are going to say, hey, we're going to try and defund the police, you know, that's, you know, kind of stacking the deck. P these people have already uh, violated laws and are being incarcerated for things, that, you know, they could be influencing something that could intentionally harm the public. Do you think that it's going to come down to, like, the vote of, like, 10 imprisoned murderers? It could. District, hmm. district policies and district uh, congressional districts can be swung by hundreds of people. But, but I mean, if most, pe if most people wanted to defund the police, I guess the government should defund the police. Like right. You, That's how... I, I don't see why you shouldn't count the few people who have violated the law in this survey, right? It, it's not the specific topic. It's the quantities of people that are voting towards particular topics could in fact have a ripple effect going forward right but i mean i mean that holds true now even uh, what would it ripple through like would the criminals manage to convince the rest of the population to to they legalize would murder or defund the police representatives that could hold uh positions one way or another and those positions can be swayed by you know corporate policy could be swayed by lots of different things i mean i, I say if the criminals can convince their the rest of the law-abiding so, population to vote in weird laws or get rid of laws and crazy policies. This doesn't seem like a like, this doesn't seem like a very well, serious so... claim. Like I mean, right? Because I mean, like fixating on only murderers kind of slants the discussion, right? There are tons of people uh, that, that are in jail. Six million people that could potentially be voting right now. But it's, it's wait, not wait. A I mean, wait, wait, wait. Are you saying yeah. that it's like how many murderers are currently imprisoned? Oh, prisoners. That's the okay, so right, but but what are those people in prison for? Should somebody who goes to jail because they can't pay a speeding ticket, um, should they no longer have a say on whether the police, you know, on like what police budgets are? Should they no longer have a say on education that their kids might go? Like this is this this is like the definition of like like break like like. I don't even know. It's like it's like using fire to 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 fight fire in like the worst way imaginable. These people, like, I don't think it even matters what they're. Well, well, wait, wait, wait. Let's let, let's let Turk finish. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So these people have already violated law that has been voted on by people. They might have been part of the election process for those people. They have intentionally violated a law, and they're going through punishment or going through the process of punishment. Right. So now you're saying. There's no like feedback mechanism to prevent uh, this negative action that these people committed, regardless of what it was. Uh, you know, there's people need to not uh, they need to be held accountable to their actions, and by allowing them to continue to be in part of the process, that's there's no feedback there. Wait, okay, you're so telling me there's no. Wait, can I say something? Yeah, go for um, it. See, I haven't heard a lot from you. So yeah. And there, there is a couple of things to take into consideration here. When you're saying like, oh, they need to be held accountable to their actions, um, that's a very heavy loaded phrase. But let's say, yes, you know what? They have to be held ac accept accountable to their actions. They're already doing that by commit by having a prison sentence. Um, there's no reason that you have to put like, oh, you know, not being able to vote on top of that, especially since we already discussed before how it can be um, the only way to hold the government accountable for its actions. Um, so saying like, oh no, like that's how we're going to hold accountability by basically giving away P or taking away people's ability to hold the government accountable. Do you see like so, why that's a little bit strange there? No. So then let's, I, I don't, I don't think people should lose their rights to vote period. You know, it is a, uh, rehabilitation process. People go through the courts to serve their judgments you know, I think what's what, 47 states in the United States have a mechanism for people to eventually, unless they're felons, that's not part of this topic, uh, to get their, you know, suffrage back or whatever the word is. So I, I think what we have is decent. And I, you know, there's definitely ways we can reduce uh, sentences that the amount of people that are being incarcerated, but it's like these people have violated known law, they're going through the process. They, need to be held accountable and part of that right now is to not have the right to vote but that's okay, not true so, though it isn't so let's We've say, already determined um, that. we elect a, we elect a politician hypothetical in a simplified political legal system let's say uh that makes it illegal to not be a redhead um all the non-redheads are thrown in jail for life and thus cannot vote and when it comes down to who re-elect this politician 
though they would presumably be unpopular for coming up with such a ridiculous law, only redheads can vote. And it turns out the redheads love this law. So they reelect them. And there's nothing else everybody else can do about it because they're all in jail and they can't vote. This seems to, that sort of illustrates the way in which this idea undermines democracy and undermines the idea that the, the law is legitimate. Um, but, but, sorry. What? Go ahead. I was going to say, it, people would have to vote that that small percentage of people are the arbiters of the truth or of the law, right? So that's already a really large hurdle that's practically impossible. But, but that's, that's not the that's case, a problem, though. though. Histori that, that's a problem, though, right? Like They're the only voters. No, but yeah, but also like when we look yeah. historically, one, 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 like at time, one, one at a time, Pixie, Pixie. Yeah, when we look historically, when we look like the, as recently as like the 1960s, um, we had policies in place to disenfranchise minorities so that they couldn't be part of that process, so that they couldn't be like, hey, you know what? Like, I think this policy is bad for my community. I'm going to elect leaders that are going to fight against that policy. So when we're talking about like what's happening right now, we have to take into context like this whole like historical situations of like years and years past where we had continuous voter disenfranchisement that, you know, laws take a long time to change and are still in place today, even when you have a lot of people, even the majority of people disagreeing with them. I believe like right now, like like when it comes to like popular polling, the vast, like not vast, sorry, the majority of people um, don't think that marijuana should continue to be criminalized as it is right now. Yet, why hasn't it changed federally? Um, so we, so basically what I'm trying to say here is that this idea of like this huge hurdle that has to be passed first, um, it's already been passed and it's been passed because of these systems of oppression that we've had for a while. Yeah. But, but do we need prisoners in that election pool to change that correction? Cause it already sounds like there's a lot of public sentiment without their input right now that could possibly change the sway. I, you know, I still think that that's, you know, Prisoners shouldn't have that right still. Well, I, I think can there's you, also... I, I, I'm still curious about addressing my hypothetical, right? Like the politician who's originally elected by everyone could realize, oh, if I make this crazy law that favors the gingers and disenfranchises everyone else, I'll, I'll have permanent... They'll, they'll elect me forever. Cause I'll have wait, wait. Is that, is that TOS? I actually don't know. Is that TOS? <laughs> is I don't think TOS? So. Okay, just make a joke. Okay, blue, let's imagine there's blue-haired people. Uh, and, and it's them, it's the blue haired people. So doesn't that, that, do you see how that creates a very dangerous mechanism to, to uh, just, that fundamentally undermines democracy? By uh, uh, allowing people to democratically vote away the voting rights of other people? I, I think, and that's, so you're saying someone that's got a specific human trait is being, or is being now called a law violator. The fact because that it's a trait that's... is kind of a relevant example. If we want, it can be something, something that's not an innate quality, something that they do, something that they believe, whatever. The point is, is that it's something, some kind of quality, an unjust law that's unjustly made illegal for the purposes of disenfranchising them. Uh, I, that's, I don't know. You don't know? I mean, do you I, see how, it, how it that seems to me? So if I'm if I'm in fact violating a law, I have the opportunity to either correct the action before I violate further law or I am actively violating law and I have that responsibility of being punished, right? That's how but what if the law it. is is blatantly unjust and was created just for the purpose of disenfranchising people who don't vote for the and I would do my darndest to not get that law passed because I would say I mean, that thank God we have the second amendment. You, wait, you can't wait, do I want to hear. I want to hear from. Uh, God, I lost it again. Uh, Cinco's. Cinco's. I want to hear. I don't I, hear a lot from him. Well, so that I, all I said is, then thank God we have the Second Amendment. If something like that pops up, if something so terrible and so blatantly unjust and targeting of a, a minority or for or whatever the hypothetical is, thank God that we have common sense and the Second Amendment that Cinco's we can stop that. Muted. Or I can't hear you. Uh, no, you, no, no, hear. he's he's not muted. He's not muted. I think. As much uh, as Pixie. I am. Can you hear us, Pixie? I can hear everybody but Sinkos. Um. Huh. Oh, well, I I've never uh, heard of that before. That's I'm not sure. All all the rest of y'all hear me, right? I'll leave and come back. Yeah, Sorry. I <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Problem. Yep, I can hear you. Um, I was gonna say. I mean. Big fan of the Second Amendment here, uh, but I don't think that we should strive to have a system by which um, there are like it 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 biases itself towards 
in, in continually restricting who gets to vote until we have to have a bloody revolution of of you know armed people going and like i think feel like that's that's like damaging that like ruins the system from the get-go like wouldn't it just be better to say hey like if we're ever going to take away people's rights we should do so with great with like great consideration um and especially the right to vote because the right to vote is what determines basically all other rights like like um also we don't have like a direct democracy so there are many many laws and rules that get put into place via like um like like uh, indirect systems so like for example you'll vote for somebody and that person might then write the law and then other people might vote on it so we don't have a, necessarily a direct say in every law there might be a law that existed before you were born that you could be put into prison for um and keep in mind there's also on top of that on top of the fact that like we don't have direct like any sort of like direct form of consent for every law um we also have um just, i mean enforcement is inherently selective so i mean there are tons of laws on the books that aren't enforced because they're either outdated or um or just like people don't know about them or whatever and um the reason why we don't like strip people of the vote for every single crime is because that is something that we understand is a flaw of any system that it's possible that things like uh i mean for example um in in um god i'm trying to remember exactly which state i want to say it's mississippi it's still illegal to sell um sex toys at all um and so like you can literally technically be fined um and brought and and, and if you can't pay that fine you will then go to jail because you happen to sell a fucking vibrator or something like that's that's not a particularly extreme example these type of laws exist all over the place and if you are then at that point then you no longer have the right to participate in the government about around that law at all you don't get to vote for who would actually be able to reform that law that seems like that seems like building a system that's designed to fail actually uh it looks like we just hit the one hour mark so we're actually gonna be able to wrap this up quite smoothly uh you all have one minute uh to wrap it up what your final thoughts on the topics are and we're gonna go on to the next one which i am actually quite excited for uh let's start this off with demon mama yeah um i think that uh normalizing on mass a system that removes the um enfranchisement of a massive amount of american citizens is an inherently completely broken um system that does not resemble democracy at all um obviously in the long term as i've said multiple times i believe that we should move to abolish prisons and replace um our currently existing justice system with a system that actually works to protect and rehabilitate people and justly dispense law um our current system um does not do so and uh yeah uh prisoners and and those who've been jailed should always have the right to vote of course um that's I feel like it's a terrible broken system if you don't allow people to vote. Bela? No, I completely agree with everything Demon Mama and Pixie was saying. Um, I think our justice system is incredibly broken, and I think it needs massive reform. And we, if we claim and tout that we're in a democracy, and clearly we are not, um, and if we're going to try to be like the pedestal of a democracy in the free world, then... Like, of course, prisoners should be allowed to vote. It's very hypocritical to not allow them to. So. Last uh, on the top, we have last username. Even simpler hypothetical example. You live in a house with a bunch of roommates and you're deciding to decide whether to allow people to wear shoes in the house. And so you put it to a vote, naturally. In that vote, would you allow everyone in the house to vote unconditionally? Or would you only allow the people who don't wear shoes to vote? And thus... The people who do wear shoes don't even get a say in it. Obviously, it seems intuitive that you would let everyone vote on that, whether they wear shoes or not. Um, if you, that is, and so that choice tells you that people who are, who are violate the laws should be allowed to vote on those laws despite violating them. Um, any other right that you want to take away from criminals is probably easier to justify than taking away the right to vote because that fundamentally undermines the mechanism by which you decide that they are I criminals actually in really the first really place. super agree with last username here holy shit thank you okay uh next is going to be Cinco's. all right um i mean yeah still still got the same opinion that they shouldn't be allowed to vote as long as they they couldn't respect the rule of law 
in the manner of whatever they're doing. Like I said, I think if it's a crazy hypothetical situation of people, you know, making some crazy laws to just so they can get the vote in their favor and so they can jail a whole bunch of people, I think that's kind of a common sense thing that everyone would see and probably rise up and stop. Um, but yeah, I just if, if you can't if you can't respect the rule of law in where wherever you're at, then I don't think you should have a say in it in voting who's going to make those laws or to vote to affect that. Okay, next is going to be the Turk. Can I answer last username's hypothetical real quick? Of course, it's your one minute. You yeah. do with it so, as you please. So if you got a party of people, half have shoes, half don't have shoes, and then they're going to enact the law and say, oh, you're not going to be able to vote because I'm not going to let you talk. That's not what we're talking about here. People that are prisoners have already lost their right to vote. They, That's it. If you're if you're talking about the whole shoe debacle here, you you would still have the option to one move, or you could probably you know go buy shoes. So that's my point. And you okay. know I I agree with the whole uh, just don't go to prison five heads and uh, reducing crime severity in a lot of cases. Just don't get in trouble. Hey, next is breakfast. You can't have any say over five heads. So we've already established that sixty five percent of prisoners. Uh, already have the right to vote and are being arbitrarily deprived of it for one reason or another. Um, so we have to frame that in our conversation, especially when we talk about how the right uh, to vote has been taken from, from people as a targeted attack against certain communities. On top of the fact that we've created an environment here where, you know, the right to vote can be used as a weapon, you know, and to kind of lighten the like the whole take of this i'm thinking to myself like if you had a million plus prisoners voting for instance uh the number i was looking at was six hundred thousand. so that's that's a lot but it's not too much if we had all prisoners voting as a hypothetical then uh maybe that would incentivize people to actually go out and vote because nobody wants to get outvoted by a prisoner i do also want to throw out there that uh People talk about panels not changing minds. I did a poll midway through the conversation, and 14% of the people who, you know, answered the poll said they had actually changed their mind on the topic, which, you know, is a decent percentage when you consider how entrenched people are on Twitch. Uh, next, I'm going to throw it to Pixie. Hi. So I had to leave for a second to get my audio shit together, but it's together now. Um, so basically, um, I just think that since we have had historical examples in the past and even in the present where um, jail or going to prison has been used as a way to target like minorities or to target political, um, yeah, I guess like political dissent, um, it becomes extremely pres uh, extremely dangerous when we allow this to happen, we allow when we allow people to lose the right to vote if they go to jail. Um, because it has been used that way. Hey, thank you for I the follow. I think when it comes to this whole idea of like, Kytos? oh, respecting the rule Kytos? of the law, um, yeah, we should Much say like, okay, yeah, people should respect law. To what extent though? Um, and when laws are unjust, yes, you can rebel against them, but part of being able to fight against unjust laws in this democracy is voting. And I don't think that weapon or should be taken away from it. Yeah. Okay, and last but definitely not least, Sledge. One, we don't live in a democracy. We live in a constitutional republic. Two, if you're a felon, you don't have the right to vote. If you're a prisoner, you do. If you don't exercise that right, that's on you, not on anybody else. Personal responsibility. End of subject. That's it. Amazing. Simple. Super great okay. arguments there. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Geek, you DM me. You wanted to say something? Or not. Never mind. Okay. We're going to go on to the next topic. I'm uh, muted. Okay, what did you want to say? Yeah, I wanted to say it's so freaking cool. Like, uh, when I see the other panel, I think this one is going so well. Like, uh, last uh, last Friday at the same time, I had my head between my hands. I was uh, cussing at the god, but uh, this panel is doing so freaking well. And also, whether you agree or not that uh, prisoners should vote, I think everyone here agree on one thing, is that prisoners should be allowed to subscribe to Dylan Burns TV. With the uh, Twitch Prime and everything, so you know. Anyway, counter shell. You could sub you know to what? me too. That if is anybody true. Has subs, I, might disagree primes, on whether bits, prisoners have the right to vote, way. but prisoners most certainly have the right to Twitch Prime. Okay, let's go on to the next topic. The next topic. It's quite a simple one. Should every eighteen-year-old citizen 
be required to provide at least one year of military or civil service? The question is pretty clear. It's concise. It's pretty specific. I'll say it one more time. Should every 18-year-old citizen be required to provide at least one year of military or civil service? This time, I'm going to start from the bottom. Uh, Sincos, what do you think? So I'll say I used to believe in that idea, and then I joined the military myself and saw it firsthand. Uh, now, just from a pure logistical standpoint and how much people gripe about the, the funds that we use in the military and I mean, 25% of our the DOD funds goes to personnel and 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 all the benefits and everything else that goes with that. So you're talking about adding probably at least somewhere in the vicinity of three to five million people when we already when the full active duty service right now is 1.4 million. Uh, so logistically, it's already a no. You would have two people, too many people up in an uproar about it. But also just the fact that I I saw many people that were apathetic and you know thought they were you know wanted to get in it for whatever reason they have whether it's an antiquated sense of patriotism or maybe they were more mercenary mindset of getting free college a good paycheck whatever uh, but yeah i saw way too many apathetic people who didn't really want to be there for the right reasons and if you make people go do it you're just going to have a whole lot more of that okay next i'm going to throw it over to the turk <clears throat> uh i think we're fortunate here in the united states that we don't have to uh do this because you know, we have enough people that voluntarily do it. So I don't think it's required for us to do the service. I think if you want to, you will. And I, like Cinco said, you know, I would hate to have twice as many people that don't want to be there and are just like really not liking it and disgruntled about it. That would not be uh, productive for a military force. So, uh, but I don't know if is selective service part of this discussion or uh, it's it's civil or or military so this, that is the well, selective the service is like yeah. a sign in thing but whatever uh i i don't think we need to uh, if, if you want to you should if you feel moved to you should okay next it's breakfast detective yeah so i don't really understand the premise of you know uh, a draft couldn't win a war i mean like literally most wars won throughout like the history of the human species have used a draft um, so, you know, that's an aside. I might, uh, I might drop a real hot spicy take here. Um, I'm not for mandatory, uh, military service, but for a long time, I have thought about mandatory civic service. I have history as an EMT and firefighter. Um, it really helped me out a lot and it helped provide a sense of mentorship and growth and leadership skills that enabled me to succeed later, later in life. Um, not only the fact that you, you, you assist and help out your community, but the skills that you learn often uh, improve your outcomes in life. So if you can do all of that while helping your community, um, I think we should do that. I think enough people don't give a shit about uh, like civic service, civil service, uh, participating in their country and the outcome of their country more than just voting. Um, so I actually am in favor of some sort of mandatory civic, civic service. This could also be a federal jobs pro program. Okay, uh, Sledge? Two years, military or civil. You don't have to go just military because forcing people in the military is a bad idea. A voluntary military, a voluntary military is much better, but there are tons of civil service jobs that people could do. And yes, they should be forced to do so. Okay, next I'm going to throw it over to Pixie and Mr. Geek. I need to get something to drink, so you pass it around after. So basically, my answer is, oh, God, no, um, <laughs> neither for civil nor for military. Um, I think, you know, forcing people to do something like at least speaking like bluntly military, right, where we can talk about like America's history with like imperialism and like starting wars and like killing innocent people. Um, just like from that standpoint, like maybe forcing people to participate or contribute to a war that they might be morally opposed against is like horrifying to me. Um, and then second of all, when it comes to civic, um, the only way I can see um, somebody like being forced to do something civically is either threat of like jail or, um, you know, the idea of like okay heavy fines or maybe oh yeah like you have to graduate uh if you want to graduate like high school or college you have to do this and i think there's um extreme policies as well that i'm not in favor for 
should we create a national civic program that gives you good benefits if you decide to like join in like absolutely yeah sure but i don't think um threat of force is something that we should have <laughs> so yeah and back uh pass it over to last username no your government should not be able to enslave you and uh use you as um uh, cannon fodder um, I mean, it, it's I, it's not even an exaggeration to say that conscription is slavery. How is it different? I don't I don't see how um, the state enslaving you to fight a war is about the same as a state enslaving you to build. A um, uh, so yeah, uh, I, I don't know how much more I could say about that. Um, I guess I'll just say like, if you think that's wrong. Why do you think the government can force you to pay taxes? How is that any better? Okay. Okay. Next, I'm going to throw it over to Bela and Sledge. I, I love you. Have a wonderful sense of humor, but if you're gonna laugh, do your best to mute your mic. <laughs> okay, Bela. Um, I agree with Breakfast on this one. I so I do not believe that a year of mandatory military service should be in the United States. We already have plenty of people who are willingly wanting to enlist, um, and adding like. We're, we're too big of a nation to go and pull like a South Korea and manage, like, be like, hey, all of you have to be enlisted in the military. Um, as far as for civil service, though, I think a year of mandatory civil service, like at the end of your year of like your senior year of high school or something like that, or first year of college, um, would be really useful because one, then you're getting people to know their community, like they're actually getting out and doing something local. Um, either whether it's helping with the community garden or helping repair something like they're actually out there and getting to know their people and understanding how their local politics works. And I feel like having that better understanding and connection to your area would be a positive improvement for American politics and also just help people feel a stronger sense of connection to their like community as well. Because like, as we've seen in the United States, there's a really big like deterioration of even knowing your neighbor or knowing like your local representative. So I feel like local work would be like a good idea. So. Okay. Um, next I'm going to throw it over to demon mama. No, no, no. First of all, the idea of the American government, which does not provide water, food, housing for anyone uh, would then demand mandatory service of either military or civic support is is nightmare like ni like nightmare fuel for me the idea that you could be pressed into or strongly strongly disincentivized from participating in a forced work environment without being provided any of your basic needs um, in our current system and I mean I'm, unless we're going to advocate that that all housing, food, and uh, education, et cetera, et cetera, be provided by the government, then maybe you could have a case. But as somebody who um, very, very strongly um, values um, the the medical, uh, mental well-being, and emotional rights of, of all people, I just really don't see a way that you can have a state enforce mandatory service to it without it becoming an incredibly easy um, to manipulate and wheel, uh, and negatively wield system. Um, I can say for myself that like a mandatory service, uh, program would have been really bad for me. I'm, you know, uh, neuroatypical. I have ADHD. A lot of people are in the same place and maybe there could be some, some considerations that would say, Hey, this would let you out, but why even make it mandatory? Have it be heavily incentivized. The government can have a, a jobs program that isn't mandatory. That isn't reinforced with, um, punitive measures, um, offer people something good for it. And people will often do it. We have this entire, we've, we've built our entire, um, nation on such punitive assumptions that um, we kind of tend, a lot of people tend to, to, to reach for these uh, stick solutions. And I'm all for some carrots once in a while. Hey, last username's internet went down, so he'll be back shortly uh, so he can continue to give his takes on this. But right now, um, it's open. Everybody can engage with each other. Yeah. I just want to say, Demon, like, I totally get where you're coming from. And, like, that's what I actually I was thinking, too. Like, I, I have ADHD. Like, I, I suffered, like, through depression and anxiety since, you know, since I was a like, kid. Um, And this made it incredibly hard for me to fulfill other, like, simple, like, responsibilities that other people had 
um, it was very hard for me to like go to school and even to classes like now sometimes. And that doesn't mean like that I'm any less capable of being a good citizen or contributing to my environment or community. It just means that it's a lot harder for me to reach like things that are normal for like a lot of people. So I think like absolutely like when we have punitive measures like this or possibly in place, what you are doing is holding back a lot of people. So my my only real sticking point here is like similar to the draft in the sense where um, the main issue that I see is not compelling able-bodied people to support the society that they benefit from. It's um, it's the fact that can wealthy people buy their way out of this? If we were to have a mandatory civil service, for instance, would we have a situation where wealthy people have the ability to go to a doctor and have them just write up a script or something that says, oh, this person has bone spurs, you know, and can enlist in this draft or, you know, something along these, these, these lines. I see that as the primary contention. I don't, there are all different types of civil service jobs, right? Like you could, you could do everything from like carrying a bag like from over here to over there, you could work as like a, uh, like a, uh, uh, what's it called? A uh, dispatcher, EMT, firefighter. I mean, these are, there's a, there's a multivariant of things that we could, we could put people to work doing. And at least personally, I, I think I would rather uh, use this as a jobs training program to help people get into the rest of their life for free. Exactly what Demon Mama was saying earlier, paying them well, giving them full government benefits, maybe giving them access to a pension even. Um, but, you know, I think I would rather those people do that than like compel, let's say, a prisoner to do that. Because if we're talking slavery to what last username was saying, it is certainly more akin to slavery, you know, to force prisoners to put out fires than it is to just like enlist a bunch of young people in the equivalent of a jobs training program. I mean, we already forced like people to go to like at like school. We already force people to do all different things that are for the betterment of society. So I think this isn't an instance where we have to be either be carrot or stick. It can be carrot and stick. I mean, I don't, I, I think that's a, like a false dichotomy. I mean, we already have seen in, in the news right now, there's a story about a 15 year old who's in jail for not doing her homework. Like um, we see how these stick measures go. I don't think our government needs any more sticks than it already has over all of us. And the idea of forcing like, the idea that I at like 18 would have been forced into some like, like a jobs program um, is like nightmarish when I already had done like, like for me, I was doing all kinds of things. I was involved in my community in many ways. I didn't like having a government be able to just come in and say, this is what you're doing now. Like I, why? Like literally if the government wants workers, they can just pay them. They can offer them benefits. In fact, those structures already exist. They just don't do them because our government loves to use sticks. We don't, we don't need to have the same stick system that we have now, which is a gigantic stick that pummels anybody who even steps slightly out of line. Um, but, uh, I, I think these structures that, um, compel people into essentially service, um, are not very good. I think there are cases to be made for very specific things. Like, for example, uh, I mean, I think you can make a pretty good case for vaccines. I think you can make a pretty good case for um, for certain health procedures that greatly endanger other people. But for a service program, I can't say any justification for that. Um, well, uh, I just, oh, yeah, Bailey, you can go. go for it. Oh, yeah, so I was going to say, like, um, talking with my chat a little bit here on my stream, like, shameless plug. Um, it, I don't think... Uh, mandatory civil service would work with the current system that we have now. It would have to be where like universal health care is a thing, like mental health, physical health. Like it, we would, this would only work if we had a completely dramatically overhauled system. And on that note, so you know, kind of like the idyllic scenario. But say like we actually do get the green new green new deal passed, and we have all these jobs, and we have a bunch of need in order to go and actually address the climate crisis. Like, say that one year mandatory civil service is an actual paid job and you are going and addressing environmental issues in your local community. Would that be acceptable? It could either be from doing stuff online, um, you know, taking into consideration people um, like the ableism um, discussion. Like, OK, well, if you can't go and actively do hard labor, what about talking to people? If you can't talk to people, how about working with some things online? Um, like there's so much work to be done to address environmental climate crisis issues. So I feel like it would really only work in like 
that scenario of we do have universal health care, it is paid and it's for something that is like good for everyone as well. Sledge, very I've, idyllic, I've, but... I've seen you uh, give a lot of very emotional reactions. Would you like to chip in at all? I just don't understand where the problem is. Civil service encompasses so many things. Civil service doesn't, I mean, you can't answer a phone. You can't work at the DMV. You can't sort mail in the mail room. I mean, come on. You have benefits. Do you know what federal jobs pay? What's the pay scale on a federal job? Anybody? It's really good. <laughs> what are the benefits on a federal job? I just got a federal job myself today. They are great pay and benefits. The okay. So what's the deal here? The military, you get a great benefits package from the military. If you choose to go that route in your choice. Is this real? Because you do have Is the choice real life? civil and military. You have that choice. The military gives great benefits. And so, you're for Medicare for all. You're for free college. You're for all these things. Well, I'm giving you something. We already have the infrastructure in place to start that. But no, we're not having that. No, 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 no. Can't have that. Can't force people that you act to teach them that you have to actually work for a fucking living in this world. And that's where I have the problem. It's forcing people to do this. We got to pay for that. And there's a lot of people that would be going through this. So it's the money's there. How much are if every 18 year old potentially on, much more money, if every 18 year old has to go to work, how many people are going to come off of all welfare benefits and things like that? Because they're going to have a job. They're going um, to have a skill. They're going to be employable. And to Sledge's point, if we're paying people to do this, and this is not the military, right? We're like, we're not building people barracks, right? Let's just say that we'll pay them, let's say, I don't know, $40,000 a year just to throw it through. Like, throw I can't believe I'm hearing That's this good from money. other lefties. That's enough money to live on. That's enough money for people to save, start to be able to like put towards their own goals down the line if they want to buy a house, they want to do these other things. Like this, like a civil, a, like a civil draft per se. Let's, I know it's scary. Like, you know, I'm using the worst. Yeah, this is so here. bad. But let's say we were to do that. That would be a massive transfer of wealth from like entrenched bureaucratic people directly to the bottom people in our society. Is this, this not only would be good for the no, economy, no, this would no, be good no, for no, their no, out, no, like, no, outcomes no, no, of life. I mean, for the people who are able, this would be almost like, uh, like a complete net positive. So just how would that be despite the fact wealth? that... Yeah, how would that be a transfer of wealth? That makes no sense. Uh, so if the majority of our tax dollars come from very wealthy people and we reorient this money to then be as part of this federal jobs program that specifically pays young people to learn these skills. I'm so, I'm actually getting Then what getting we're essentially right doing now. is we're paying people to get life experience and education while they're also helping their community. Mandatorily. I'm, I'm having a hard forcing time them to take these civil jobs, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. You're talking why about would forcing. you do that instead of just, just to hiring them on the open labor market? Because they might not be willing to do those jobs. Okay. But that's, should should right, somebody so not have that right? Them, no, it's not whether or job, not they should have that right or not. So here's but a question. Make sense. Yeah, so, so, okay, okay, one at a time. Last username, you want to say something? Yeah, so, so forcing people into that job, even if you pay them, uh, is taking more value away from them than if you hire them on an open market, right? Because their ability to choose what job they hire gives them an advantage in that negotiation. So this is a transfer of wealth away from those people to, um, to everybody else. Yeah, I was actually about to make that point, but in more words, um, but I'll try to keep it like brief. Basically, um, one of the cool things about having free labor or like a labor market to begin with is that people can choose to walk away from a job and go to another one um, if they have the ability to do so. And in the cases that they might not necessarily have the ability to do so, um, ideally, we, they would be able to form a union and be able to say, hey, you know what, like, you know what, if you're not giving us like these benefits that we're asking for, we're all going to stop working, um, raise my salary, raise my benefits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you have a forced mandatory service, how, what, what are you going to do? Okay, I'm not going to work anymore. Okay, you, you go to fucking jail, you don't graduate, you know, you have all these other incentives that basically tell you that you can't really unionize. Um, so you don't really have any like bargaining power with with your federal employer no there are plenty of public sector unions actually there are more public sector unions than there are private well, unions yeah but nobody but they couldn't go on strike if that's, you if that's they were true. forced to 
That's so a good point. It kind it's, of destroys it, unions' ability to do it, anything you if you're forced your job, into you, it. You've lost most of your yeah, that's a good point. So you mean you like, can't tell the boss that you're not going to work because you're not happy and he doesn't have the right to fire you? Oh, no, no, oh, oh, if we're going to talk about the immorality for... of the current job system, we can go into that. I don't know if that's the... Wait, that's well, he has the right to fire you, but, but you don't have the right to quit. That's gonna, no, that means have, you're you ever tried to fire, have you ever tried to fire a union employee? I have. Well, yeah, no, no that's surprising for some reason. Unions are good. We're, we're, well, wait, 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 wait. I really, I really want to. Okay, I, I will go from Sledge and straight to Pixie, but I want to hear this story. I ran a construction company and I had, I went to Pennsylvania, which is not a right to work state, and I had to have union employees. One of them came to work and did absolutely nothing. I tried to fire him. I could not. I had to pay his wages. Okay. A six yes. month shutdown. Okay. That's a totally separate issue. Okay. Yeah, so what we're trying to describe here is that, you know, that, I that know, up to a certain extent, like, unions can be good. If you have, like, a boss, like, you, maybe you don't think they're paying you fairly, or maybe you think that they're putting you in dangerous conditions. Yeah, because um, police unions are great, right? Huh? I'm saying unions well, have the ability to be good. But well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's let Pixie finish. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that, like, at least what? as a general worker, what yeah, being part of the union usually benefits you, just like it benefited your employee. Maybe it didn't benefit the boss, but usually it benefits employees. But when it comes to mandatory civil service, um, you basically, like, destroy people's ability to union. Um, you're basically giving, like, the government um, power over you to, like, jail you if you don't if you don't want to do your job anymore, um, even if you don't want to do it for completely valid reasons. Like, it's hey, you years. know what? It's two years. We're arguing no. for one year in this one, I think. Okay, well, it's one year. Doesn't matter how long. Year. Person should be forced to do something that they don't want to do for an entire year, even okay, if it's one day. I want to interject here. It sounds like we're talking about civ like civil service, as in there's like a very limited amount of like the type of job, there's and not. that like you don't have the right to choose. Like in my argument, like if there are so many different types of jobs in civil service for your community. And if you have to do a year, like you'd get the right to choose. So it's like, oh, I don't want to, like, they're you not going to go not through, like, to do it. Yeah, right. why can't that's the, that's a big problem for me. Like, I don't care how many options for jobs there are. If if we live in a society where, um, I mean, again, you openly admitted that this won't work in this society at all. Um, and I think I know, it would I'm actually talking, be like, genuinely it, nightmarish. <laughs> but if we had a society where we have um, housing provided, food, water, healthcare provided for people. I see no reason why any sort of mandated work program would be necessary. If we're able to agree upon those things, why not allow people to freely choose what they wish to pursue and if they wish to pursue not working for the government that's perfectly fine if you want that if you want a free house you want free medicare or free health care you want all these things free join the military it's already there they're going to give you a house they're going to give you all hey fun fact i about. literally yeah, legally yeah. can't join the military because of the current guy in i want to <laughs> yeah i want to use my voice to ask Cinco's what he, what he thinks on this just Kind of like I mentioned at the beginning, this is I tanky don't think shit. you're going to get good results from forcing people to do something. I mean, and I mean, I was in the Marine Corps, a lot of yelling, a lot of, you know, just F you and do shut up in color, right? Yeah, this is hilariously. Um, and I had a sergeant at one point tell me, he goes, if I have to scream at you to do something that I want you to do, I've already lost you. And, I mean, as far as dealing with the person respectfully, obviously in a battlefield, it's a complete different scenario, but like I said, I think if you're going to get it, we do, we are in a free country and people will have better results if they want to actually do something. If it's, if it's there, if they feel like it's theirs, right? If you force someone to do something, you're not going to get the good results from them that you would of somebody that has like, Hey, I want to do a specific thing. I want to go do this. Now, I, I, I mean, I think we should promote a culture of competitiveness, of hardworking. The problem is I don't think we do that inside the United States. I think we pamper a lot of people and we're just like, oh, we'll just give you everything and everything will be lined up perfectly. I think, like a I said, lot? set up a system, like 1%, give, up, give people opportunities and I mean, let them advance that way. But yeah, I don't think forcing people is going to get you good results. I will be honest. So the way that I look at it, I, I don't know a single person um, who goes to work because they love working. Uh, every single person I know who works is compelled to work. They they have to to live to eat. So, you know, I mean, they still do pretty good jobs because they want to keep their job and, you know, they want to make that money. They want to make that bread. 
So, I mean, we can we can set a million different qualifications to this to make it more egalitarian and not ableist and not targeting certain groups of people, not excluding others. Um, but we compel people to do shit in society all the time. So we compel people to go to school in most states. We compel people bad. to follow traffic laws. We compel people to follow all different sorts of directives that make for a healthy so society. You know, one of which we don't have. That's that's at least my take. So I think in the span of that, in the span of creating a healthy society, I don't see what's so yeah, outrageous woke, woke about expecting people to help out. I mean, how about this, right? You don't pay any taxes. You get to keep all your money for that year. I mean, like this is the, the, like that's the thing. This is this is a gift. And like the only thing that I, wow. that I essentially see are how do we make sure that people aren't left out? How do we make sure that people who are not able to serve are not being excluded from this privilege? And, you know, how I'm do we ensure here. that, you know, by the same token, uh, you know, people aren't able to also just buy their way out of it, that this has to be like an egalitarian thing. Today, I learned but, that replacing can... bosses with with red bosses is 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 good i mean damn like i don't know i don't think that like uh i don't think that just putting the word state in front of boss makes makes having a boss and having compelled labor be a good thing at least for me i fight against every day against the system that we currently live in and having compelled labor i don't think that people should be be compelled to labor i think people are naturally inclined to pursue their interests and they should be allowed to do so um and of course i think um there is always going to be certain like social contracts and whatnot that are that are made but none of them have to be um mandatory service under the state um that goes very strongly against my beliefs um and I, especially i would like make the argument that that such a claim is is inherently um ableist and and arguably in a society that has for very very long time um been uh been steeped in homophobia, racism, and and other forms of prejudice, that those structures would take on those characteristics as well. So, 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 I mean, uh, could you argue that if everyone had to volunteer, it could help? <sighs> I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. Properly. I'm jittery off of like caffeine. I'm, I'm drinking like a, a Coke right now. I'm just like, oh, like brain buzzing from Thanks caffeine for now. Um, so like if everyone had mandatory civil service and they all worked in the neighborhood and they got to know everyone in the neighborhood couldn't that help like um abolish i think is the word i'm looking for right now correct me like but like abolish like racism in communities because like what? a lot of the time you hear from racists like before that were like i was super racist because i was raised this way and i didn't really get what? to interact with others and then when they started actually talking with others like with black Americans or Latinos, like they're like, oh, they're actually not what I was raised to believe. And everything I know is wrong. I mean, and it's just the lack of interaction with people who are different. You're like, you're putting that help mitigate racism by interacting with your community and the people in your community. That's what I'm asking. Like, could that be- Are you, are you asking me or? Um, Big, Wait, big thing? Yeah. yeah, you're, you're you basically, you're, you're kind of playing a betting game though. Cause even though it's true that we see at least like in school environments when um kids like interact with people who are outside of like their race or ethnic group they tend to be less biased against them um we can also say that like people can still hold their biases like during adulthood or in the positions of power they might hold which is like very you know i guess it's it's certainly like reasonable to a certain extent even if it's like small bureaucracy right so like hey let's say i work in this is a really random example i work in the dmv and i don't like black people i'm gonna do um you know small actions maybe even not consciously like even like subconsciously like um to make it a little bit harder for them to get their license or you know just whatever civil position you can think of like you can make an argument that like oh yeah some of this might be interacting with the community my biases are going to go away and some of it might as I can't well believe be I'm like totally okay now i actually have like inside. a certain level of like power in like this bureaucratic structure to to put my biases in place and hurt others so really you're playing like a probability game that i don't think we have like even like enough data or a case study to say like where this would go yeah, and I personally would advocate that yes, going out and meeting people and having your um your ideas challenged is really good, but I would never mandate that. I would never mandate someone else's behavior from a state level, especially with regard with the I mean, this isn't also this also isn't just a um 
a manner of mandating like behavior like hey everybody you know needs to go to a school school and be educated it's you need to go perform labor on behalf of the state or else i mean that's been the entire discussion here and i i find that a uh a a very very troubling um look come on come on we're not talking about gulagging people because they don't show up for their shift as an emt Ah. i mean like what are we talking about penalty for so how do you enforce it how do you enforce a, a service of any kind without the the threat of a gun basically at the end of it Here's here here's the one thing I don't I don't understand. So we live in a country that has crazy high unemployment in certain suburban in certain urban areas rather. You have un- unemployment of 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 above thirty percent. Uh, sorry. Um, so we have we have unemployment okay, that's above thirty percent in some parts of the uh, country. You know, like I don't okay. think. What does I mean, I that? think the, the the point of it being mandatory is to get more shit done. If people don't want to do it, then like, I don't see the 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 utility in compelling them. I think that there should be some sort of incentive to do this. But I'm also saying that like, if people don't want like a year of free taxes, the ability to potentially get a pension, make a m- more money than they could have in the private sector at an entry level job. I mean, like they're shooting themselves in the foot and it wholly it's selfish. You know, I think about selfish on the behalf of the state responsibility. And I think a lot of these things are a social responsibility. So if people have a way to give back, then I don't understand why there's such a resistance to people giving back. Because what you're saying is you're saying the state should have the right to determine when someone has the right to get back on a mandatory service level. And you still haven't answered the question as to why or how you would enforce these things. So like, I'm what not, you, like, so I'm not particularly you're saying, interested in enforcement. Well, but, but that's the answer. You, that's the I, question. I do, I do so. need to, I do need to stop everybody for a second. Thank you VGG for hosting the channel. Uh, we're currently sitting at 180 viewers. I really appreciate that. Okay. So there's already a mechanism right now for the government to get as much labor as they need. What they have to do to get that labor is pay for it on the open market, pay people a market wage. The only difference with the system you're proposing is that you would force people to take these government jobs and thus lower their wages. So all you're proposing is people uh, requiring that people accept government jobs for less money. No, 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 not at all. Absolutely a transfer of wealth. Not at all. No, that's not what I was saying at all. You may not be saying it, but that's that's what you're saying. That is what you're, that is, that is actually no, what you're proposing. No, not at all. So most federal federal em- employees, number one, make good money. Second of all, the point being is we're not setting we're not setting a pay scale for this. All we're saying is that we can set a competitive pay scale. It's not ne- it's not necessitating that it's going to be less. Nothing necessitates that it's going to be less. The if second you have a competitive point pay is, scale, you here's the real reason why that. Out. Personally, I would say that this needs to be mandatory is we have 20 years. We have 20 years before the world starts to collapse due, ah, due to climate change. We here don't have it comes. enough time to sit around and, you know, kind of pontificate at large about, like, what sort of voluntary system we want to this see is if just, people This just justifies eco-fascism, dude. Yeah, no, pay for the, not at all. Pay Wait, more to, we only have 20 pay, years. We need, so to, get, we need to just start, impl- oh. like, imposing... Wait you know, population controls to save the planet. You can't just what? use that as an open what? Just, what? justification. Okay, okay, everybody come down, everybody come down. One at a time. I can't believe I'm listening. I can't believe I'm hearing this. If anybody wants to talk and say a smart big brain thing, raise your hand. Okay, okay. So we're going to go, we're going to go. Bela, Turk, did you put your hand up for a second? Okay. it's kind of secondary. Okay, okay, we're going to go. Okay, so if it's secondary, then we're going to go. Just Bela, Demon Mama, Pixie. There you go. Right in the little turn. All right. I was talking to my chat, and then my ears perked up because I heard someone say ecofascism. Uh, no, fuck no. We will not yes, tolerate fuck that yes. here. And if anyone believes that we overpopulated, go fuck yourself. That's a very dangerous idea. We have more than Woo, enough here we go. to take care of everyone. Yeah. It's our fucking broken capitalistic system that makes it so people are hungry and have bad water. Like, we overproduce on food. You want me to get spicy? It's it getting spicy, waste. baby. Like, it's... No, okay? If any of you here think we're overpopulated, seriously, go fuck yourself. I do not, like, deal with that idea at all. <laughs> like, it's... Okay? There we go. That's my hot take for tonight. Thank you. 
Hell yeah, I'm glad we got it out we got it out of the way that we will not do that. Instead, let's move to gulagging people in name of the climate, and that's just slightly better. Stop oh straw God, manning, no. you're posting cringe. Um, no, no, come on. You literally avoided three times. I, I love you, Breakfast Breakfast Detective, but three times you've ignored explaining what you mean when you say mandatory system and how you enforce that. Do you want to know how that's usually that sort of thing is usually enforced in uh, most societies? And if not, can you propose how you actually enforce your mandatory service? Because otherwise... Would you like to put more words in my mouth and tell me? I am literally no, asking you and I've asked you three times. Okay, so I answered your question twice and I said, I'm not Did particularly not lie. interested Watch in the, the enforcement of it. Uh, I don't think it should be a significant issue of anything. Um, so, like, I think the point for me is more that we should have a civil service and we Holy should heavily shit. incentivize people to do this. So I think we should we have some right sort of now. disincentive in the same way that we have a disincentive for people to not pay their taxes, the same way that we have a disincentive to not participate in any the, of the things that keep a society running. The, the disincentive uh, for not paying taxes now. is jail. No, it isn't. The incentive for doing civil service is a paycheck. We already have that system. What's wrong with that incentive? Yeah, um, what last username was describing and like what we were what I was trying to say to you Holy about shit. Um, like what you end up doing is an effect is the whole reason why federal jobs pay very well right now is because they have to compete against the private market, right? They have to like say, oh no, instead of working at, yeah, I don't know, Google or whatever, you should come work for us because we have all these benefits. Mm -hmm. benefits. When you put a mandatory civil service there, when you say, oh no, like for 40K or whatever, or mm -hmm. for, you know, this amount of money, you have to like work here. Um, you basically give all the leverage to your employer because you do not have the opportunity to, to leave and negotiate your paycheck and he left. Okay, cool. I need to reconnect. He, uh, he, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. No problem. Uh, can I go? Can I go? You go, go, sir. Yeah, go. So we actually do have a mechanism for handling people that are contractually obligated to work for the the uh, government through the military, and that's uh, you know if you go AWOL, you uh, get in a lot of trouble. You can go to court and you can get uh, heavily punished. It's not fun, uh, and Cinco's probably knows more about that process. But once you're like contractually obligated to do a service with the government not doing it is uh bad heavily yeah i don't know what this could mean besides like, like you already have an incentive to work for the government they pay you the question is whether you have the choice about whether or not to take that job or not and to can make I, it can manage, I ask and the, uh, and the, pixie to make her well, last well, again well um oh you want well, me to well let's let's let last username finish this point yet i didn't really get to hear it to make that to make it different from today, the only as far as I can tell, all you're proposing is that they have, they're required to take that job at least for some period of time, and the only effect that has is a, it's going to lower their wage, allow the government to pay them less, and b, it's going to you, you will have to enforce that with ultimately violence if they don't decide I'm just not going to do this. You'll ultimately have to go and put them in jail or something. I don't understand the point of putting them in jail. We don't put people in jail for violating. Well, but, but then why are you arguing for a mandatory position? Someone doesn't do it. Like, what do you what do you propose should happen if someone doesn't take this job? It doesn't go I to this job. I don't see why like we can't just like give people a fine in the same way that we fine people for. They don't pay the Holy! Fine. What happens? Well, then you know they like what 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 happens when people usually receive fines? Gulag. Yeah, they you know, get good luck. Thanks for the straw man, man demon mama. Yeah. What do you mean? A That's not a straw on man. Their, on their uh, payment. You... It's not a straw man. Come on, let's be honest. Well, 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 let's, let's, okay, I want to hear. I want to hear from some people who um who haven't been. By the way, breakfast. Are you gonna be in uh, again soon? I'm trying. I'm on a hot spot. I'm I'm loading in now. I got you. I got you. That's not a straw man. What, what do you think should happen if someone's like, I don't want to serve in the military. I don't want to do the civic service stuff. Uh, fuck you. What would you if you were the, said government? What would your response Weasley be? Weasley here, response? my friend. You're not entitled to benefits from the government. Period. Work, starve, problem solved. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I love that shit. Sorry. I mean, if you want the benefits, if you want, if you want these things, you work for them. That's called life. That's called real life. That's what people do. Yep. You do this. It's too. It's a year of your life. It's it's so nothing. You're better than doing that. No, it's a year of the state's life. Why not no, take some benefits life. away and use it to pay mili people in the military more so that they want to to join the military voluntarily, right? Damn. Much simpler, because economically this, equivalent, this but doesn't involve... eliminate so many people because it gives you skills. It gives you a job. No, no, no but it answer gives my you... question. Why, 
rather than saying we'll deprive you of your, of your benefits if you don't man, do mandatory military service, why not just lower this the benefits? Is, uh, for everyone? I didn't say military. You're talking civil as well, so you're going just strictly to military. I guess. I guess I. Uh... It, it, okay, is civil, anyone here uh, other than breakfast detective ever had a federal job? Ever had to deal with a federal job? Yes. Okay, so you know the benefits are outstanding, the pay is outstanding. It's well overpaid for the position. Number one, All well right. overpaid. I don't know about position. that. I wouldn't go that far. It is well overpaid. Wouldn't go that position. far, buddy. I'm not your buddy. Number one, but number two, it is overpaid. But the, the because, whole reason why it has to be that way in the first place is because they're no, competing it doesn't. against... Well, yeah, because they're competing against... No, because against I can go get a market. framer for $8 an hour. But if I hire a union framer, I've got to pay him 17 which would be mandated by... Wait, I, I'm confused. Oh, I thought you are talking about military or civil service and like, oh, these government jobs are overpaid. Yeah, they're overpaid. This is one of the dumbest. Or if you think they're overpaid for the think, reason because they have to compete against... Who do you think makes more? Market. A mail carrier or somebody that works for... A delivery driver for UPS? Who makes more? Um, I'm not sure. UPS I'm because sure. mail carriers are barely hired at at at, at uh, full time insane. anymore. You but it doesn't insane. matter. It doesn't. Matter. If you only get eight hours a week, one okay, you one at a, one at a time. But that, that's this is the that's dumbest awesome. thing. This is so bad. And then I talked. I, I talked. And when I talk, everybody does not talk except for me. Okay, and so me. we're gonna go from. That sled, yeah, okay. Yeah, I know I know. you're rowdy. You've been in a cave for 20 years. You've just woken up to modern America and you're ready to bash it over the head with a stick. I got it. But we got it. We got it. We have a few rules in the, in the thing. Uh, that's for everybody. Uh, first, we're going to go to oh Pixie. God. We're going to go to Sledge. And then we'll throw it over to Demon Mama. We're going boom, boom, boom. Okay? Okay, so I think, like, the point that is going a lot, like, over... The point that's being hard to understand here is why... Um, do these jobs pay well or give benefits that are good to begin with? And then the answer when you like find out, like when you trace Milan, it back, is because I have just as many as Sledge does. The free market because they have competitors, and if they want their people to go and work for them, they have to provide like a certain level of benefit. That's not true. I mean, what? Do, wait, wait, who said that? Uh, Mister, my internet sucks ass, and I'm trying to get back in. I apologize. Oh, so okay. in many cases, no. So I got to push push back on you there. the The majority of the role of federal oh, and state, okay. state no governments in many in many cases is to do things that are not profitable. Um, so the government is not necessarily competing against the private market because a lot of what the government does is assume loss. So it's not the case that they're competing against the private market in many, many different areas of operation. It's just a function Except they are. Of, of the fact that, you know, we need things to get done that are not profitable and uh, we have to incentivize people to do them some way or another. Well, Wait, but that doesn't affect workers. Like, yeah, there's tons yeah. of tech jobs. There's tons of programming jobs that are op that open by the government that pay really good, really, really good benefits and still struggle to get applicants because you can make so much money working in the private sector doing essentially the same work. The profitability doesn't affect any of the most or most of the workers there. Um, also, regardless... Um, yeah, I mean, that's 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 the point. The point is, like, like we're talking about competition, but but at the end of the day... Why would you why would you substitute a system that's already um, forces people in many cases to do work they don't want to do and make it literally mandatory as enforced by an, a, by a state that has a monopoly on violence? Like that's that's what we keep returning to here. And the answer has not yet been answered as to um, how you avoid that being an authoritarian, uh, inherently ableist structure. I'm just like I'm not I don't I'm not an ideologue. I just believe in good ideas. Like I'm not like against systems of authority. Good we argument. Need systems of authority. That okay. We don't need a system of authority here. When you were talking about climate change, at least like from what I remember, I believe it's like over seventy or eighty percent of the world's like pollution is caused by like ten percent of people. I, I would like Chad to know I am actually for the bad idea lobby. I'm only for bad <laughs> ideas. Yeah, but I guess like the point that I was like trying to get across is that we like, yes, it would be awesome if more people did civil service, it would be more awesome, like if people, um, maybe we can have like a federal jobs guarantee in that way so that hey, you know what, like people do have this clear opportunity to work. But essentially, like, as we stated before, when you decide to make it punitive, when you decide to force it onto people, you basically take away um, the employees ability to unionize to negotiate. Um, and you potentially put them in a really bad position in the future, um, especially when it comes to like negotiating with the government.
Yeah, I don't see what um, any any of the things that have been suggested um, by the pro mandatory side here could. I don't see anything that couldn't be accomplished by simply better directing funds um, and saying, "Hey, we're going to incentivize these jobs." If people like, if I mean, people have lots of incentives to get work. Not, I mean, many many incentives, uh, but especially in our system where you know, if you if you don't uh, work a wage job. Um, then you don't have access to living. Um, but in you know in a sort of ideal system, why not just have it be incentivized? If the pay is good, if the pay is fair, if the coverage is fair, people will come. Of yeah, course. I mean the only difference the only difference is if if you're going to physically like violently punish people, throw them in jail for not taking the government jobs. If you're not willing to do that, if you're only going to find them and nothing more, then it's just equivalent to adjusting the wages of government employees and tax and the tax code. Yeah, at that point, why not have a get fine the exact anyway? Same thing by just changing those and and leaving the system the way it is. Also, if it's a fine, won't that just go back to the whole idea that people can pay their way out if they have enough money? Yes, of course, they can pay their way out, but it's not paying their way out. It's just not taking the job that pays them. This is why right? you should use a, a carrot the instead of a the stick. Government taxes you anyway. The the best incentive is to not starve. So I'm a libertarian. You have the freedom to go do what you want, but you also have the freedom to fail. I don't think the government should be bailing people out and then have the actual incentive to be like, oh, I got to get up and do something instead of just depending on the government. So I, I would say create have a system of opportunity, but at the same time, don't have a safety net for them. We should be, we should be pushing a system for people to work hard and actually go make something of themselves. Like I said, if they, they want, they have that freedom if they want to sit around and not eat. That's perfectly fine with me. I but mean, I, yeah, I don't know how many people know this, but many countries that have incredibly robust social safety nets also have really high productivity, um, innovation. Like, like, in fact, I would argue that having no safety net um, poisons the well from the first place. It means that people enter into workplaces begrudgingly and hatefully. Um, and uh, I think that we can, we have way more than enough wealth to go around we should build a system that incentivizes people to do the best that they can do as opposed to threatening them with death or starvation i don't think that there's any evidence and i don't i would challenge anyone to find evidence that this actually produces a functional society like you might feel that way but i don't think there's any evidence that exists and i have certainly never seen any evidence that exists that threatening people with starvation is actually an effective way to get them to do their best um and why should we why should we threaten people with starvation in a world where we, where no one sh where we have more than enough materials to not starve that makes no That's sense pretty to hard me. to threaten uh, I, I, I do want to i do want to throw this over to sledge because he's been a big proponent of uh the starvation incentive for a long time i know him to be one so what's your response thanks to for the, the follows idea appreciate starvation it deeply. isn't actually a decent incentive it's a pretty really damn good guys thing. if you're gonna if you're good argument buddy death, you're gonna find a way to get food right or you'll die or you'll suffer trauma or you'll there you go if you die that is like literally one of the weakest argument like players. i thought that last week i heard the weakest argument ever but i might have heard the weakest argument this week ever uh, okay, so just, die, not, five head. Really, just die five head just die fucking simple hear from. If you're not willing to work you starve you die sorry i hate it for you everybody dies i'm so, not look i awesome it is not my job to great, take care of anyone, information. my children and my wife that's it it's not my job to take care of you. It's not my job to pay your bills. That's your job. I've never um, asked you so to. There, there's, there's, I, I'm Thanks going to me. ask you to have an open mind and try to shift your perspective for a second. Because, um, okay, let me, let me try to put it this way. Um, when we do not have a safety net into place, what we basically allow is for people to be exploited more easily, right? Um, if, you know, maybe if we lived all in an equal society where we were actually all born with like the same opportunities and advantages, you may maybe can make an argument like that. But the truth is, there's people born in poverty. There's people who, you know, don't get to choose um, what school that they go to. If they have when a poor, you turn wait, 18 wait, years old, you are given the same opportunity. Sledge, as sledge, 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 we got to let her finish. Screaming yeah. boomer. Over the road. <laughs> So, so, you know, you don't, you don't get to choose like the neighborhood you live in. You don't get to choose like your parents. You don't really, you don't get to choose like a lot of things. 
So this idea of like, oh, you know, you're 18, you have the same opportunities as everybody else. That's not necessarily true, depending on what your zip code is, what your neighborhood is, what your it's education is. So here's the idea. Levels the playing field because everybody has to do it. But we we already explained everybody. Why, we already explained why mandatory service ends up backfiring on the general worker because they have no opportunity to negotiate there. Um, so it's you're very winning, easy son? for them to get exploited <laughs> in that scenario. In the background. Now, in a scenario without mandatory civil service, you're winning, it's the same Dad? thing if we have no safety net. You basically let people get like the shittiest like possible jobs that might not even not not won't be, be able to break them out of poverty or won't be able to give them enough time so that they can then get an education so that they can then work them way, their way up or whatever. When you have a safety net available, you basically say, okay, you know what? You don't well, have to take like, the shittiest possible job. Right away, they have plenty of time to earn plenty of money. How about that? There we go. Problem solved. Why do we have an issue where people won't go back to work right now because they're getting extra money from unemployment? Because Whoa, the bank gave them hold on a second. Don't run wild with that one there. That's a totally different conversation. And also, uh, that's, I'm just yeah, saying that's uh, a safety net. That's, that's a safety net. Okay, and my, okay. I, are we gonna are we gonna do the coronavirus unemployment numbers talk? Because holy shit, I don't think that's the one we want to get into on this one. I don't, I don't accept that as as like even a, even without coronavirus, if we look like between I don't know holy between like shit, Obama these people. and Trump or what like hey, if, thanks if, for if all your the follows. argument was Deeply true, appreciated. then nobody would ever get off um welfare ever, and we don't see that. We see like whenever the economy is doing good, whenever um there's more job opportunities available, people want to leave welfare. Of course, because welfare. it's really limited. There's a whole bunch of shit you have to do. Anybody who's ever been on welfare knows so, that. So knows it's, that. it's not a good time. You don't have a lot of money and you want to advance yourself. That's like that. Is that the, not what we're talking about? Not having a lot and going, hey, I want a little bit more. I'm, I'm going to work a little harder. I'm going to go for this. I'm going to make myself a little bit more marketable. I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can inspire those exact same things more healthily than threatening people, than threatening people with starvation or or the or d to like d die from disease. There's to, way to way better ways to someone, do that. To threaten someone, you usually have to add. Hey, like, thank an you actual, so much for I'm sub. going to do the certain things. Hey, you. thanks, well, Kevin. Life is life, you know. No yeah, one. I hang out in Vosh's history. Room a lot. Everybody hasn't had a safety net, and it was the idea that you worked hard, that you were smart, you used your brain, you planted crops right, you did whatever you had to do to survive. And so why do we not still have that 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 type of playing field where, hey, you, you don't have to do these things, but you're not going to live as well or you're possibly going to die if you don't if you don't do these certain things. Why is that such an awful idea? Well, because we see that it doesn't actually produce the most efficiency. We see that it actually doesn't add to productivity, um, even in it a harms workforce it. now. Yeah, like it, it actually hey. does the opposite. And there's, there's a couple of reasons Thank you so much, Anne Pearl. Here. Appreciate um, it. The first one is, honestly, like we're learning more about mental health. We're learning more about like how our mind affects our yeah, body. Yeah, tell me, GG, like I say that. hi. If you have that constant threat of like starvation, I can't believe I'm hearing it's these going arguments to be really right hard for you to think like, how can I improve my resume more like, okay, like maybe I have to like go and like fucking steal or whatever to eat for today but when you have a safety net you basically give people the time and like the ability to create more resources um that don't like completely like overwhelm them or like completely like shut them down even even in like normal workforces it, have you guys ever heard of the for-profit paradox it's really interesting it's like companies that focus on profit 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 first um actually do like worse than their social counterparts that do focus on profit but also focus agree, like on Sacha. employee wellness because our productivity whether we like it or not is completely like tied within how we think like how we feel if you are depressed because you cannot afford food and you think you're gonna have to take like a third fucking job chances are you're not gonna be really doing really well in any of your jobs when you have like so much fucking pressure on you like most humans don't actually respond that good to pressure yeah all Do you have a job all of the data, I have, all I of do. the data that we have so far um, accumulate uh, accumulated over time has pointed us further and further to the idea that humans actually really like doing stuff. Um, we, re we just don't like being forced to do things that we don't like to do at all. And in fact, humans will often do things that we don't like to do when we see a benefit from it. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to beat people or threaten people into it. And, you know, to back this up, again, I, I will remind you, if anybody has data that can, that, or, or anything they can provide that would indicate that, um, that, that pressuring people and threatening people into doing stuff is an effective way to actually get them to do it in a, in a, in a productive and good manner, um, I would love to see it because I've never seen anything like that. And I can speak from personal experience, the 
most productive period of my life was when I was when I was able to go to college and uh and I was I did so much I was working like two jobs while studying just because and I didn't have any like I had some bills I needed to make but my bills at that point were the lowest and at that time I was able to throw myself into making movies I was working literally two jobs working on my fucking films because I went to film school like uh that's that's the anecdote side of it but also as far as we know, all, all of the known science about productivity points that happy people actually work more. And when you're pressuring them, when you're threatening them, when you're starving them, when they're, um, humans develop trauma responses when they're on the edge of starvation. They develop really, really bad habits that are meant to design survival, not productivity. So if you want to encourage a productivity, if you want to encourage um, a, 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 a progression of technology, the best thing that you could do would be to provide for people's needs and give them direction. You do not have to do that by beating them with a stick. You can do that by saying, hey, look at all this cool stuff here. And in fact, once you remove the pressure of starvation out of the equation, once you remove the pressure of dying of disease, of poverty out of the equation, all of a sudden you have a bunch of organizations that go, hey, come work with us. We do really cool shit. You get to work outside. You get to see lots of animals or another organization says, hey, come work with us. You get to put like put fucking cool shit together and build rockets like whatever you can actually encourage people to pursue those jobs, to find jobs that fit their skills and that allow them to fill a need without threatening them with starvation. What a barbaric I mean, worldview. There, there's, um, there's a reason why four week, four, four day, pod, uh, four day, uh, four, fuck, words are hard to speak right now. Four day work week. Um, yes, four day work weeks are yielding a higher percentage of productivity than five day work weeks. Um, there's a reason like in addition to technology, um, but why people are like, increasing in productivity and that's because like hey you know what yeah like as we stated before when you don't have these increasing pressures when you don't have to think about how am i going to pay my water bill how am i going to pay my electricity bill do i have to take like another job do i have to actually like work this many hours oh my god they're cutting my hours now i have to go find like this other thing um you can focus more on the job at hand instead of having to focus on all these other things surrounding it do you know when you grow the most and you develop the most skills is during suffering and I mean, you, you can argue against that, but I mean, that's, you learn to deal with stress. You learn to deal with problems. If you have everything handed to you, how many rich kids are out there that have every opportunity available to them and wind up in the gutter, like overdose on heroin or something? I mean, I know that's a complete hypothetical, but it's, it happens fairly often. Why childhood stars usually end up that way or usually end up screwed up. Success and having all the stuff handed to you at the beginning doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be ending up successful. I think there is a lot of, like I said, growth within struggle. And I think people, pro I mean, I think it's better for them to start out struggling a little bit. I so I lived in the poverty zone. I made under $18,000 from the time I was 18 till I was 24 until I enlisted in the Marine Corps. And then I, I bumped up a little bit. I'm not, and I'm just saying like, it's, it is possible. And I, I my question is, I know we're threatening with the idea of starvation, but in all honesty, how many people are starving inside the United States? None of them we should live, be. Why would you support the, that? None of them should be starving. Food? How many of because, them do you give food? What was that, Sledge? I said, how many of them do you, do you give food? How many times do you go and donate your time since you care about them so much and nobody should? How much money do you give? How much food do you take to homeless people? How many homeless people have you taken to Subway to buy them a fucking sandwich? This is fall? literally a massive whataboutism. And for this the record... This is literally about putting your money where your mouth is. No, Shut this, up this is... and put your money where your mouth is. Wait, what? If this, if, I literally if, spend every single day advocating for a more just system, but that doesn't really matter because this has nothing... You're not willing yeah, to no, put your money actually, you don't know anything about me, and I would I would, I would, uh, I would hey, so, love so it so if you stop this with this like really, really silly and emotional um, mm -hmm. whataboutism. Even if even mama did all of that, like, do you have a Which I do, by the way. Yeah, like, I do. Actually, I do have a counter, counter argument. I put my money where my mouth is. I give a whole lot of money to charity every year. Good boy. I spend a lot of time. I take my kids twice a week. This is not an argument. Kids. This is called, Anytime. you're just literally, this is literal virtue signaling. Let's, 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 sledge finish though. We got a little bit of roll to the road. This is called, I put my money where my mouth is. I do care about people, but if you are not willing to work, I'm sorry, you are not willing to eat. It's that simple. Huh. I don't well, I mean, again, I'm glad you feel that way. I, like, what happens when we automate so much of our economy? Well, 
we gotta we what? gotta let Pixie finish and then we'll go back over. Oh, Bella had a good point. But anyways, like why why should I just care about work? Why not? Like I think like a better measure is productivity, don't you? Like what's the point of being in a field for an hour? if you're actually not growing anything, like the, the, just saying, oh no, work by work is good. It doesn't really mean much. But when you say work by productivity, look at the results you have, look at what you're actually like growing. That seems to be like much more efficient than just saying work by work. I, I don't understand what you're saying. Productivity has nothing to do with it. If you have a job, you get a paycheck, you can eat, period. That's it. So, so wait, so wait, just to clarify. So are you saying that the, the thing of value is the work itself? So like if somebody was to just say, I don't know, be put in a box with a lever and the lever that they pull up and down every single day, there's no purpose. It's not actually attached to anything. And then they got a, um, and they got a pay paycheck for that. As long as they kept pulling that lever, that would be a good system in your mind. Cause that's the argument you're making right now. If you're, if somebody is willing you to have you stand there and pull a lever for no reason whatsoever, good for you for finding a job that is completely worthless. Okay, but don't you think good that like, you. you know, on a bigger, on a bigger perspective that we can agree that like actual productivity, actual contributions are a good thing and not just like the idea that we should lock people in a box so that they do this vague idea of like virtuous Look, work? How many damn evangelists are on the damn that make millions and millions of dollars and they're selling nothing. Yeah, so, so I have a question. So like, I we're all aware that automation is becoming for the follows. bigger Deeply and bigger and that eventually it. a lot of jobs are gonna become automated. So as, a, as more jobs become automated and yeah, more this people is are put out of bias. work, do those people deserve to starve and die because their jobs no longer exist? There are more than enough jobs that cannot be automated. Music there can be always, automated, journalism can be automated, always. IT can be automated, there military can be automated, always. food service can be automated. Military cannot be automated. How do you secure land if you don't have boots on the ground? Oh, you're asking military? We already have drones. How many How people do does it take to go and work with a drone? How do you secure if you don't put troops Wait, on wait, the wait. I mean, this is like, this is like... I'm just asking. How do you, you can't automate... The are military. you not aware that there are like literally multiple firms right now that are looking to build robotic soldiers that could literally hold a ground without any you actual... Yeah, we already have like... Yeah, so I, I think that like what you're appealing... One, one at a time, one at a time. We're going to go with Demon Mama back to Sledge. Yeah, you're appealing to like this idea that like technology is never going to, going to advance, but we know for a fact that it is. I mean, barring a, a true, true apocalypse, which maybe we are in a true apocalypse, this technology is going to advance. More and more things are automated, and we've seen many jobs already disappear to automation. Work alone is not a good metric by which you build a society. Um, in fact, um, I would argue that we should build a society ab around, build about, ab around improving human well-being, and not just around this vague idea of work, or suffering for that matter, which was something I wanted to address with Cinco's argument, which is like, I mean, we it isn't suffering that causes people to grow because otherwise somebody could be locked in a pain box and they would just come out as some sort of like superhuman on the other end. It's not suffering. It's very like people can learn from suffering for sure, but they can learn from all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be suffering that teaches people and it doesn't have to be abject murderous suffering. For example, um, an exercise routine can be a form of suffering that isn't necessarily going to kill you. Um, so we don't have to have starvation as as any form of threat or imprisonment or anything like that. Like um, I said, in the United States, no one is hardly. Our, in fact, the poverty has an incredibly high obese rate. So uh, starvation, I believe that if you don't work, you should starve, right? But we don't really have that big of an issue with it. My thing is, I think that you should have the freedom to fulfill or succeed. And I mean are the chances better that if someone is born and they're they have a genius mind before anything else even happens this kid's going to be a genius could he probably do more if he had more opportunities sure but until we figure out a way to actually do that and, and grow children which i don't think anybody wants to go down that road road or not many people but i'm just i'm for the idea of of, of the freedom you know, don't force anybody to do anything, to do a job they don't want to. But at the same time, don't force me to to fund them doing whatever else. Everybody's in it. Everybody is in it all on their own. 
you know, like I, cause when it comes down to it, I don't care about you. Like if, if you disappear from the earth, like it's not going to affect me. All I care about is my, my family, my kids, my wife, that that's my goal. And when it comes to a dog eat dog world, you would do the same. You know, I mean, I, I would I, argue we don't really live in that type of world anymore. But if that's the type of world you want to live in, I will reiterate, I think that's a barbaric world, a world where people don't give a shit about any other human on the planet and just are like, yeah, I don't care. Fuck you. I got mine. Like, is that a real, is that a coherent worldview? All right. If that's the type I of mean, world you want to live in, then I, I, that's where I, we live in right now. I mean, but shouldn't we change yeah. it to make it so it's not like that? Like, okay. don't, wouldn't you want and, the and, world? And, well, that, to, and that's the thing. If you want to make it where everyone's helped, everyone yeah, has a totally. fair, 100%, equal Kevin chance, or Louis. do what Sledge said. 100%. Put your money where your mouth is. Instead of virtue signaling, trying to force everyone else to pay the, the to pay the tab for you to make yourself feel better, you take make yourself marketable. Go and make yourself insanely rich where you can give 90% of your money to your local community or to whatever charity you feel is is worthy of just that become money. rich five head so so there, no, there no, no. But there, there's a couple no. things to say here this there, is there's silly couple, wait i i want to break this down actually so here's a couple of things i'm actually like focusing on social responsibility like my main goal in life is all about that like i could go into details more if you ever want about like you know, creating a social global innovation hub about like- the Just have money, just live in a good like, place. Friendly, like non-toxic nail polish and all of that. But regardless of that, like the reason why like saying like, oh no, like more money. And this is actually something that I complain and I talk about lefties sometimes with. The idea of like, oh no, like just getting more money is gonna fix these problems. It, it's not just like necessarily that. It's also systematic changes. It's also cha having a change in laws and not just like a change of, and not just a change of like your individual pocket, but like where is the government investing its resources into? Um. So I, yeah, I don't really know. So don't, don't trust the government with your money trust yourself with your money to do whatever you need to do with it. I wouldn't what? trust the government. The, the idea that the, the government should take more money and then you believe that the government's gonna do something great with it. I would rather you trust yourself with your own money to go take care of social things that you think are worthy of that money. Wait a second, I just have a quick I question. Have I have a quick question. Did you build your house? No, I did not. Okay, all right, cool. I just wanted wait, to know wait. because I mean, you know, like a house that's built by other people that you paid for with money, that is uh, the money which has a value that's determined by a society, by a government. Those are all things that can only arise from a society that does not subscribe to your worldview. Your worldview of uh, it's a dog eat dog world. I am the only person that matters and everyone else can get fucked. That does not produce a society that can, can uphold money that can uphold social systems you need to recognize that society does exist um and that that people work together all the time and have social interactions for that sort of world to exist so and when you say put your money where your mouth is i like, would turn that right I mean, back around on you i i give I got, the idea for you to to do it yourself to, if you're invested in your community you don't know anything society, about me and you've never asked so i'm saying if we, you gotta, care, we gotta wrap it up we've got only an hour and 15 minutes left everybody but don't worry if you didn't dumb. get to finish your statement you will you all got a one minute outro we're getting a replacement for breakfast sure detective. let's do it he actually hit like his like his uh like limit for like internet and stuff so um because these ideas are just so big brained right <laughs> that they can't fit through the wires so they they had to shut them down so uh, we're going to be getting a replacement. It's going to be AU Grimace. Uh, AU Grimace. So we're going to start uh, off the bottom this time. Uh, say it one more time for me. Uh, cinco. Like uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Cinco. Spanish, cinco. Look, I, I can't learn other languages, okay? I'm not good at it. Cinco. So I, like I said, it came down. I mean, we went all over the place. But yeah, I mean, don't. I, I believe in ultimate. I'm a libertarian. Freedom. You can either. Go and succeed as much as you want, or you can sit there and do nothing as much as you want. But I don't believe I or anyone else should have to pay for people to do that. And if you are really invested in your community and you believe in society and everyone having a free chance, then do your absolute best to do whatever. I mean, you, money helps, but you don't have to be rich. You can go outside and ask your neighbor, hey, you need help doing anything today? And go to the next neighbor, hey, you need help doing this? Anything. Help your community out. I'm all for it. But like I said, don't shirk the responsibility off onto everyone else and then make yourself feel good about it. Next is going to be Turk. Uh, so as I'm still on the same plane as I was, uh, you know, we sh the government should not be mandating service either through the military or through civic service 
Uh, I think the free market is a better place for people to go and uh, achieve things, uh, be it whatever job they want to do, but forcing people to do work, it's not a good thing. Uh, I actually like Bella's idea of uh, getting like 18 year olds, high school students more involved to give them more of an active training regimen. But I think paying people to do a lot of government work that's going to get eventually automated anyway is uh, really wasteful and there's probably better ideas out there. Okay, next I'm going to throw it over to last username. So, um, the thing about conscription is um, there's absolutely no need for it. We have a system for the government to hire as many workers as they need. It's called uh, a job, employment, right? The hi government hires people on the open market. Um, the only effect that this can have is, well, it depends how you enforce it. If you're enforcing the conscription, and this goes for military conscription, for community service, whatever. If you're enforcing it with by imprisoning people um, with violence, then the effect of what you're doing is just lowering their wages. You're just lowering the amount that you'd have, the government would have to pay them to get a, any given amount of workers. So that's the only effect it has. You're basically just using force to take money from these people who are presumably going to be you know, um, so among the poorest people or not particularly rich people. So this is a regressive, effectively a regressive tax. Um, if you're not enforcing it with violence, if you're just going to fine people for not working for the government, then it is exactly equivalent to, let's say you're going to fine people uh, $10,000 for not working for the government. Okay. Instead of doing that, raise everyone's taxes by $10,000 and raise the government wages by $10,000. Literally exactly equivalent but now you can see that what this amounts to is an extremely regressive tax on everyone of $10,000, which I don't think any of you want. So there's, this is like, this idea is completely harebrained and easily um, provable that it has no other purpose but to rip, rip off the, you know, less fortunate people in society. Very straightforward. There you go. Next is going to be Bela. I'm kind of torn on all of it. Um, I'm just kind of realizing that... I have more of a collectivist mentality in terms of society. Um, like, you know, I look at countries like South Korea and Singapore who do have like mandatory enlistment or civil service. And I'm here like, yeah, like it works. And that sounds good. Um, but like talking with my chat and just like going over like the culture of the States, like it wouldn't work here unless we actually did have like universal coverage and, a lot of better services that these nations do have. So I'm kind of like on the fence now at this point, like lots of stuff to just kind of go over because American culture is drastically different from these nations where this does work, you know? So that's where I am right now. Got you. Okay, next we're gonna throw it over to Demon Mama. Yeah, um, I find um, the idea of mandatory service um, to be almost always um, targeted at uh, some form of consolidation of power by the state. Um, I, I, I believe that, of course, we all participate in society, and that means that there are going to be certain inevitable exchanges and social contracts that are made, but I don't believe that a central state authority should be able to force you into labor um, at any point. Um, and I actually... Uh, yeah, I think that it's it should be resisted. Um, I think it's an inherently ableist process um, that doesn't make a whole lot of room, um, either functionally or even ideally, um, for people to live their own lives. And um, I very much believe that the goal of society is to mutually liberate one another. We should uh, be able to work together so that all of us can live the most free and the most well. Um, and I don't believe that that vision um of a society that is like mutually liberatory it can can fall in line with mandatory state imposed service personally okay next i'm gonna throw it over to pixie um so basically i think matt as i say before i think like mandatory services are not very ethical um when it comes to our earlier topic talking about work um, I don't value just work, right? To me, it's meaningless if it's yep. not actually producing anything, right? If Correct. I'm just like jumping up and down and nothing Pixie changes, based. nothing good is being produced, then why, why is there value in that? 
However, if I'm jumping up and down, you know, exercise is produced because of that. Or if I'm doing a job and I'm helping people or, you know, helping out the economy, you can make a million justifications. Then I would say, hey, that's more valuable than what Damien Mama said before, just pulling a lever up and down. So with that being said, I think we should focus on, yes, giving people the opportunity and the ability to work, but also increasing our ability to create the most productive societies. And from all those data, from all the studies I've read so far, the way that you achieve that the most is by, you know, giving people safety net and giving people the opportunities that, that they need to be able to take that. So yeah, thank you. Okay, and last and most definitely not least, Sledge. Number one, you're gonna give up a year of your life, maybe two. Damn. Because it's forced by the government. Yet we let the government force kids go to school for twelve plus years. We make you know make kids. Which go I don't to agree with. No arguments there though. That's cool. Wait, I literally did argue against you know, that. Pretty simple. You get somebody that can pay you to do something that's completely worthless. Good <laughs> on you. I'm not gonna knock you. Welcome to the free market. It's one hundred percent boomer argument. I mean, I'm sorry if you can get somebody that will pay you to sit at home on your computer. Good. Good for you. You did well for yourself. Speaking of that, remember, you can actually pay me and help me do my job by, you know, Twitch Priming out there. Okay, we're going to go on to the next topic now. Uh, the last topic is quite simple. Should the United States have left the Paris Climate Agreement? One more time. Should the United States of America have left the Paris Climate Agreement? Take the question however you want. Uh, you yeah, have one did. minute intros, Dylan and it will also show. be your last time to comment on the last topic. After that, you got to shut that down. We're going to start with, uh, we're going to go from the bottom up, and I'm going to start this time with Turk. Oh, well, uh, okay. Uh, so I, I, I think that getting out of the Paris ag Agreement, it could have been a good thing. It could have been a bad thing. I don't know, but I don't think that climate change, I've I'm I'm really curious how this conversation is going to go. I you know I think uh -oh. we should have gotten out. I think the entire world needs to do more than maybe just us. Uh, it was heavy heavily handed towards the U.S. to do a lot of work. Granted, the numbers do support that we provide a lot of carbon. So it's like I, I I'm not really on the fence on the statistics of climate change, but I am kind of on the okay, fence on if we should have gotten out or stayed in or that. Mm -hmm. I, it's kind of wishy washy to this topic mm -hmm. of climate change. I'm I'm against. Okay, Cinco's. Oh, I definitely think we should have got out of it. I mean, as as what little I know of it, we were involved in it, paying money for people to sit there and make regulations on us, telling us we need to lower our carbon emissions, right? That's ridiculous. And yet we did leave it, and we still were lowering our carbon emissions while other countries like China have continued to to push out as much as they want. So to me, it seemed like an incredible waste of time, money, and yeah, so I mean, I, that seems like a good enough reason to leave it. AU Grimace, and also AU Grimace, he is the lovely replacement for Breakfast Detective. You can find him at twitch.tv slash AU Grimace. Yeah, <clears throat> sure, I, I saw somebody who was anti-climate change before. I am pro-climate uh, change. No, no, like, um, I think the, the climate change, although is like a good, um, good starting point, I, from what I remember, um, it doesn't really do much. It's just like a kind of a, a nod and a wink to each other. I like something much more strict to guarantee that we're all like working on the same level. So everybody has people inspecting each other's countries and, and, and any kind of agreement when it comes to climate change has to involve China since they're number one at this point. So, um, yeah, that's what, that's what I would like. Like as, as far as I remember looking, like it would have been nice to, 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 to stay in just to show that we, are all about it that we're fully um dedicating to reversing climate change just the fact that it didn't have china in it at all or or like or, or china wasn't isn't being held accountable in, in any kind of way just wasn't isn't enough at this point so yeah okay next i'm gonna throw it over to pixie so from what i know about the climate change as from what i read it was like some sort of like general agreement it didn't seem to like really um you know, have any things like mandatory, which I guess makes sense. You like doing so would probably like, um, you know, violate country sovereignty. Um, however, like I, I don't really know if it was necessarily like a good or bad thing to pull out of it. I think like 
I, from what I've read, it seems to be like a bad thing just because it seemed to um, take away our power um, or a level of power from the world stage when it came to like talking about climate change or like negotiating about climate change, right? It seemed as a move of like, oh, you see, like we don't really care because like we're pulling out or like we don't really want to like work with you guys anymore. Um, so I think like in that perspective, in that view of like global power and like our um, ability to work with like other nations, it seemed to impact us more negatively than positively. Okay, next I'm going to throw it over to Sledge. Should we have pulled out of a non-enforceable agreement that unfairly penalizes one country? Sure. Sounds good to me. Okay, next I'm going to throw it over to the last username. Um, yeah, so as everyone pointed out, it was unenforceable and wasn't really working. So what is the effect of it? I guess it's a sort of diplomatic, um, diplomatic uh, you know, bargaining chip. Um, it would, would have been better to stay in and try to use it for, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a bargaining chip or to pull out to sort of signal that, um, that it isn't working. Right? True if, you, capitalism. If, if it gives people a sort of false sense of security and it's not actually working, then uh, I don't know. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I really have a, my intuition that probably doesn't matter that much. Um, but, uh, I, I think I'm open to having my mind uh, shifted on this issue. So let's see what happens in the discussion. Okay, next is Bela. I'm trying to be kind. <laughs> my, my chat's just here, like, destroy them all, Bela. And I'm like, no, no, no. Um, my, we should not have pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. And yes, it is a paper tiger. But the purpose of the Paris Climate Agreement, it was a profound document we got 195 nations to unanimously agree that climate change needs to be addressed and that greenhouse gas emissions and pollution needs to be addressed the fact that we had 195 nations come together and then the united states decided no fuck you when we are the biggest polluter per capita and I heard China get mentioned, we also have to consider how much our, our production and consumption comes from China. A lot of China's pollution is owned by the United States. And I will just start with that. And next we're going to throw it over to, uh, what was that? I was just going to make a request if you're going to, if we're going to be citing mm -hmm. facts and we use the Discord. Yeah, yeah. To... Use the Discord to drop any data or information you want to do it. And uh, if also, if you can, drop it in chat so other people can, like, you know, click it and view it uh, for, like, posterity's sake. Uh, and finally, Demon Mama. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a, an expert on climate law, but as I understand it, um, the Paris Climate Accord was largely a diplomatic, cultural, and social um, move that was sort of aligning um, many countries onto the same sort of frame of mind with regard to a an issue that threatens the entire planet. Uh, climate change is um, arguably the um, great challenge of our time, perhaps maybe the last challenge of our time. Um, and I think therefore it is important that we keep as many channels open as possible. Um, I don't believe, as far as I understand, the P Paris Climate Accord, and I may be slightly wrong on certain uh, certain details, but it wasn't really about uh, penalizing or sanctioning anybody, but rather about uh, paving the way for scientists in various nations, for climate organizations in various nations, and for the leadership of various nations to openly and regularly communicate about an, a, a genuinely existential threat to the entire planet and therefore every nation on the planet. Now... We can criticize everyone's behavior, but what we're talking about here is whether the U.S. should have pulled out of it or not. And I think that pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord um, has no motivation other than to ideologically signal um, that uh, the current administration does not take climate change seriously. I think that is uh, has made us look foolish on the, uh, on the global stage. It's made us look um, very... Uh, fickle and untrustworthy um, and also it it has indicated um, though nothing is for sure can't read the minds of the leadership but it has indicated that they don't take the problem as seriously as they should and I think all of those things would lead me to answer no we should not have pulled out of it okay uh, I'm gonna throw it now to open debate you are free to engage with other people as much as you want 
Okay, uh -huh. I'll um, just start off here since I'm like the, the climate political streamer. Um, so the Paris Climate Glad Agreement, as I said earlier, it, it is a paper tiger. Like the whole point of it is to just show that there is a consensus and that it needs to be addressed. Now, in terms of the economic argument of like, well, it unfairly punishes the United States. We have to consider that the United States emits more per capita and consumes a shit ton of things. I just went ahead and linked in the Discord um, CO2 emissions linked to trade. You can see the United States is way up there. China is significantly less. Um, and also, in terms of addressing the climate crisis with our current administration, we know that the Trump administration has rolled back. I think we're reaching like 100. Now it was 95 last I checked. Anyway, I'm digressing there. Um, okay. So, I, I, I take issue when you said that we own China's emissions. Like, how could you possibly say that when China is their own sovereign nation who emits what they want and what they regulate against? Well, do you know that a lot of Walmart's factories are in China and Walmart's one of the biggest stores in the United States that people purchase from? Sure. I also know that those um, those um, facilities inside China are underneath Chinese um Regulation, right? regulation. Yeah, but if we're still buying from them and is there a problem in the world country? that can't be linked back to the United States? Don't don't you find this a little um impractical to make the sense like, oh, it actually just goes all the way back to, to, to the United States and their consumption and their capitalism? I mean, okay, hang on. Give me one so, second. I, I like my belt because I am a little heated here. So the United States consumes the most per capita in the world. That's a fact. And so if you're looking there at how much we consume and then, yeah, we are a part, like we are the biggest problem. And we have a lot of nations that want to be just like us. We're setting a very, very poor example on how to be good stewards of the environment. And now that we have but, to address the climate crisis, like now we can't just go and be like, oh, hey, like, fuck you guys. Um, so I'll have to go back to the Kyoto Protocol on this one to address that. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol was signed on December 12th, 1997. Um, and it made the distinction between developing nations and their obligations to addressing the climate crisis and the nations that were already developed. Um, that's where in the Kyoto Protocol that we ended up with the issue with China, because at that point, China was listed as a developing nation. And the argument during the Kyoto Protocol was that developing nations shouldn't be hindered from economic growth just because now we have nations like the United States. Sure, and that's what we're getting it, at. Isn't it unhelpful to like dismiss China's responsibility towards our, our, our climate change issues by blaming it all on United States consumption? Like, oh, no, I'm not dismissing them at all. I'm just saying that when people try to bring up and be like, China's the biggest emitter, I'm like, we have to consider how much of our trade and like purchases we make from China. And therefore, our consumption has a higher CO2. Like, Mark, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that China needs to do whatever the fuck they want. I'm saying that going and trying to scapegoat China in order for the United States to do jack shit is wrong. And that's a lot of the time where the argument of China is brought up. They're like, well, if they're not doing anything, then we don't have to do but, anything. And it's like, no, that's not how this works. But if they're producing more for us to consume and they're, they should be held accountable for how they're producing products, right? Because they're the other end of the business agreement. We provide funds or trade or whatever. You produce a service under a multicultural multi-country agreement shouldn't the countries be accountable for how much they emit regardless of what the trade is that they're producing i think that in a perfect world that that sort of um that that, that sort of calculus can be done a lot easier but what we have to but it is actually incredibly important for us to acknowledge like historical context and also economic context for example um the u.s being predominant consumers in the world um means that uh because we and because we have an enormous amount of historical wealth um that means that we do get to set the table for a lot of the world um, for example, if China was to say, well, we're not producing your stuff anymore, well, they're not going to get our money anymore. And um, that's a big problem, which we have to recognize that when it comes to um, saving a, the planet that we all live on, that it requires everyone to try to do their best to take the, the higher road. Um, and that includes the United States saying, oh, my God, we really need to like, like, do something that's that, that that puts us away from consuming so much in such um like bad conditions like there's no doubt that chinese like like that 
that that uh, that Chinese factories and Chinese corporations contribute um, to climate change or things that are located in in China, but they're also um, as a nation would be very limited in just how much they can actually do because otherwise um, any 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 um, any restrictions that they put on American corporations that cause American corporations to seek work um, and production elsewhere will directly damage their economy and therefore their people. Um, so it does have to be something that's acknowledged from a a like a larger than economic lens. The uh, America is going to have to confront the fact that oh, like this style of consumptivism is probably not um, sustainable, or at least this manner of it. Um, we ship like an incredible amount of stuff overseas um simply because it's the cheapest to buy from china um and like that Why is, is something the cheapest to buy from china I, i'll be right back i gotta use the bathroom i mean there's a uh, number of that that to i'll moderate don't where's worry your microphone made? where's that uh arm for your microphone made what the wait what where's are you talking what are you talking about like again this is this is literally You're propagating it that's what i'm talking about start with you Show me this is way. literally, oh, this you. is literally, does everybody know that comic that's like, hmm, you, live in, you live in a society. Yeah, it's it's literally, ah, yeah, 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 you participate in the society you live in, obviously. Like, I think that Yeah, every... I mean, we could literally turn it around and be like, take a look at the uh, production label on your shirt. Where is it from? Don't know. The don't deals, but we're not oh, Okay, okay, great, great, great. No, care. no, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, don't know, don't care. Okay, so now are you gonna sit out the rest of the argument then? Because like that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty major like hand wave of like oh I don't give a shit. Like obviously I give a shit about I give a shit about things being produced. I know a lot of the things that I use and that all of us use. Literally, it is impossible I, to not. Hey, 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 hey. I know. I know. I know. You're real excited to say that you don't care again for the third topic no. in a row. Did you not find it somewhere else? No, actually. It's like, these arguments are kind of empty, though, because then that's like, okay. yeah, no, uh, because, be, what, no what because you're all wait, wait, wait. You're let me say finish. What if, what if I get all my clothes from thrift shopping and I I don't know I actually you know this is not imported from China or anything like that then then what like we yeah we live in a society and like sadly and like there are in that they yeah. make clothes in countries that don't pollute as much as China does. Yeah, so it's up say, to you. So right, gonna, right. Yeah, Wait, hold on. So, what we're saying. yeah, this you're literally making my argument for me, which is the idea that we can't address this from an individual consumptive basis. It has to be done. It has to start somewhere, right? Right, and it has. Keep in mind you. that there have been thousands and thousands of movements of individuals who participate. I mean, like for a personal <laughs> example, I you gonna let me finish or not, dude? No, you already said really. you don't care about this. Uh, no, sledge, really. sledge, well, Dan, if if you do care about my shot, I'd appreciate if you do let her finish it. Sledge. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, I don't give a shit about anything. Uh, why are you wearing a? Th why are you live in a house that had a piece of wood that was from built in China or some shit? Yes, we recognize that these that this system is the problem an individual person no matter how many cans i recycle no matter how many uh american made shirts i buy that is not going to fix the problem we need to address it on a systemic level and that's beyond the in beyond any individual consumer's place yes we can always make better decisions like for example i mean i do my best to do that um what's within my power um but i think it's a really silly argument to claim that like oh if you have a problem with the fact that um this giant system that involves billions of people nearly every person on the planet is 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 uh is like unfolding in dangerous ways that all of a sudden you need to become like a like an individually become a monk that lives in like a cave in the woods that's just foolish like that's not how these things go what we can do is we can say hey wait a second as a, as a society there are probably things that we can do to incentivize us not being so goddamn wasteful um and that is going to involve sometimes saying like our country having to say all right. What is the problem? What is going on in China that 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 is uh, that is making it such that um, you know there's a poverty or whatever? Like there's like a hundred things you could say. Like hey, there's no other jobs available except for these Walmart factory jobs, and therefore China can't address the economic thing because they rely entirely on Walmart to to employ their population. Then maybe we can all come together in a in a uh as as a world and say hey if we don't fix this somehow we need then if we don't fix this together somehow then there's going to be a lot of people who die or we're all gonna die so we need to recognize that this is a global challenge that the when 
I do want to throw this back over to Sledge because you have been talking for a little bit. Sure, yeah. I mean, I want to make my point clear, but yeah. Well, it, it starts right here. You have, what, how many people watching this right now? Uh, 171 people right now watching. If you stop using Chinese products, maybe you can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm not using them. You shouldn't either because China's, we're propagating the pollution and the climate change. But instead of that, you're just like, ah, I just use it because I live in a society. That sounds like a cop out to me. Instead of putting your money where your mouth is, like I said earlier. What if you can only afford products from Walmart and you live in a food desert and you can literally only afford food thing, afford what things a food from desert? You don't have you a backyard? Have you can't grow things? Oh boy, here we go. Okay. You don't have a plot. Look, look like, I just feel like Sledge is not seriously you engaging with this topic. You that we can't consume so much, and Sledge is highlighting, well, what if we don't consume anything? Grimace! Grimace. Did you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Okay, when I when I talk, everyone shuts up. Everyone. Okay. I do want to say that Bela does have a lot of pots, though. She do, really does love her plants. Okay. We're going to do it like children. Hold on, Grimace, your plants kind of suck. Okay, everybody, raise your hand if you want to talk. Okay, so basically everyone wants to talk. And so I'm going to throw it, and this might be unfair, but I'm just going to throw it to the person who has talked the least so far in this discussion, I think. Uh, Ciceros, did you want to talk? I didn't hear a lot from you. Cinco. Cinco's. So I, I do want to remember that. <laughs> okay, well, so... It I kind of compare in with our last argument, right? Like we, we care about people so much. We want to do so much to help everybody else. And at the same time, we care about the environment and we want to destroy or at least incredibly hinder our economy, which hinders our ability to do things, especially to support people in the lower end of things. And so we want to hinder our economy so we can be better globally and, and save the earth. My question is, okay, sure. Save the earth. That's, that's really great. That's that's good stuff. I'm behind you on that. Save the earth. Don't let it die. When is it going to die? Because so far, I mean, like we, you know, like using science and all this stuff, they don't know a damn thing. Back in the '70s, it was saying, "Oh, we're going, to, we're coming up on an ice age." Okay, I mean, that was back in the oh, '70s. Articles all about on. it. Now it's now it's okay. The Earth's heating up. All right. Uh, according to most people that study this the Earth's painful. history, we've been through several ice ages. We go through several warming periods. We've been through many of them. And from all accounts that I've heard from the scientists that study this stuff, this is fairly natural. How much, my question is when, you know, how much, because someone said 20 years earlier, AOC, Al Gore said 10 years back in what, 2000, some early 2000s. And in AOC's 12 year, we, we can't come up with an idea. We act like the earth's going to end tomorrow. And Stinkos, have you actually looked at any of the, the recent data on this? Have you actually looked at the uh, trends and the way it's accelerated in the past decade? Like, have you looked at that at all? No, so, I, I'm asking, when, we, when is it going to end? How much how much of a risk are we it's, at? It, it's, it's a slow burn. Like the 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 the, the deserts are going to expand. The the heat's going to go up. People yeah, are going to yeah. die from we a whole bunch of different shit. Yeah. Banners, so what happens when there's heat? What, what at the time, Bela? <laughs> like climate change is literally happening as we speak. Like, I live on the coast. The sea level rise has already been happening. I had a full civil engineering internship documenting this shit. We already have to have managed retreat, managed retreat processes for areas that are flooding and getting pushed out. We already have been seeing cyclones in areas where they shouldn't be. Like, we had two category fives. Hey, thank you for the, the follow. Much appreciated. The Arabian Sea that completely devastated Mozambique. We have locust infestation now because of that in West Africa. We also have like sea level rise in Bangladesh and it's pushing people more inland. Australia. Like, yeah, Australia's wildfires. And also like, I, I can keep going off on this. Like, it's not about like, oh, like when is it gonna happen? It's already happening. Like legit, right. it is already I, I, happening. I believe the earth it's goes just gonna get changes. worse. I believe the earth goes through changes. My thing is how much are we affecting it? And you know, like what are we really contributing to it? And how many years until we die? Okay, I but mean, that, that part is settled I, science. Like we know yeah. objectively, we've so, known for a what, long, what hold on, I, I, isn't it my turn to talk? Yeah, you asked I'm a question, I'm responding. Okay, 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 Demon, it's your turn to talk, go. All right, so um, it's settled science that we do impact the environment. It is incredibly complicated to draw out exact timelines, but there is there is no doubt that right now we have seen the devastating effects of climate change and that we are not prepared for that. I lived in an area that has been affected by climate change. I don't know if, for most people who know this, but uh, Northern California, a huge portion of it has burned every single year for the last like five years, something that never happened before, something that is, disp that is put, uh, displacing an incredible amount of people. California and, and hype. 
Yeah, yeah. Cali. I used to live in Cali. I don't live there anymore. I, I moved north, which uh, was very lucky for me, but many people can't do that. Um, and uh, that's something we need to take seriously. I think it's really silly um, to try and like hand wave these sort of things um, because the scientific community can't give you a literal um, exact date. We already know, though, by far, that all of our predictions have been not as, as aggressive as they've needed to be, and we've accelerated further, and things have occurred faster than we than we would have ever wanted. Now, this is a big topic. Climate change is an enormous topic that requires an incredible amount of expertise working on it, and that's why there is an, import, there is an important... Um, it's actually important that we take the mass scientific consensus that these people sp devote their entire lives to getting this information out, um, to verifying it, um, take that seriously. And every single bell has been ringing from every single scientific, uh, every single scientific field on the planet for decades now. And we've done next to nothing against it. Um, okay. so uh, yeah, you, you have been talking for a little bit. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Cinco. Cinco's. <laughs> You're Thank gone. you for the follow. Okay. So I mean, that's what I'm saying. But we're we're causing mass hysteria. And my thing is, like I said, I believe the Earth changes. The Earth changes. The the Sahara Desert, the biggest desert in the Earth, used to be a rainforest. And I mean, like, okay. what happens when the Earth heats up? You get more. I live in Northern California. I actually, live really close to where Vashi still lives. We're species. If you ever looked at why we don't, why there's not a whole lot of habitation up in you know Greenland or the Antarctica. We actually do better in hot weather, in tropical climates. That's why you have a lot of people living on the coast and in near the equator. So even if, like I'm saying, worst case scenario that like, I mean, water is raising inches every single, every single year. Like I think with the advancement of technology and with everything that we're doing, which this I mean, we so are we're moving to lowering emissions. I mean, aside from stalling our economy completely, I don't know what you're really calling for. And just like Sledge pointed out, Look at all the stuff that y'all are buying. It, it, we can see inside your room. You're not living up to what you're preaching. I, I, I'm not trying to say what you really mean or what you don't, but actions speak louder than words. But, I don't <laughs> mind more. I would like to ba buy a good American-made uh, camera, but like, what can I say? We don't make good cameras for shit, right? Like, ev everything gets gets manufactured in um, China, and if it's um not manufactured in china i can't afford it anyways right let's change it but that's the thing though the people the... no object what money is no object when it comes to saving the planet wait that's Dreams. literally this is like Very these true. arguments are so unbelievable okay I, i'll take the reins here so Cinco's, do you know what happens to all of our wheat and corn that the most of the united states relies on once the earth gets a little bit more hot What's up? I also, I also want to say that I thought you said it wrong, and I got really excited, and then I was like, no, she said it right, and I just thought it was wrong again. So it's just an unending cycle. Okay, throwing it over to you. Like, wheat and barley that most of our diet relies on in corn, it stops growing. Oh, and we've already been seeing a lot of problems in the agriculture sector. One, because of really poor agricultural practices, but also because it's getting hotter in those areas. So food security is a massive concern in terms of anthropogenic climate change. And yes, I will go and address here. I'm not saying, oh, humans are the sole cause of climate changing. The Earth does go through natural cycles, yes. However, we are accelerating this cycle. And the whole point of addressing the climate crisis is that we can mitigate damages so we're all not rapidly fucked. That's all the goal is here. It's like, hey, you know, maybe we should actually slow this down so we have better time to maybe GMO our foods or find better agricultural land so we can actually feed people. How about we slow down the rate of ocean, um, like what, blah, blah, blah. brain going too fast, I apologize. How about we slow down the rate of uh, seawater level rise so that we can actually get people out of those areas so that way they're not ending up homeless because their houses are collapsing. like. The whole we're at the point of mitigation. We're not trying to be here, be like, well, prevention. Like, so this is something that I, I, I mean, I, I will bring out my whiteboard if I have to. I always bring out my whiteboard on this whenever I'm like streaming and we talk about it. We're no longer asking for prevention. Prevention would have been like, we just didn't do the industrial revolution, right? Mitigation, um, the example I use is, all right, we can go build solar panels in the desert. 
It kills half the population of the California desert tortoise, which is endangered. But then the population can recover because we slow down the rate of heating and they can better adapt. Or we can choose to do jack shit and they just all die and they go extinct. Like, that's tried like the more simplest example that I try to bring about when talking about mitigation. And that's all we're trying to do. Like, and also if we're talking about the costs, like a study, I can go and link it to you. I have it pulled up is that we will be losing in the United States 10.52% of our GDP because of the cost of not addressing the climate crisis. So you got solar panels in your house, right? We'll save more money and it. You know how expensive it is to go and keep like paying insurance companies to rebuild homes that have been destroyed by cyclones or flooding. Like people go you, bankrupt because of this shit. Oh, hold on, hold on. Why, why I just want to keep... address. I just want to address something because I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding that's going on here. An individual can only ever do so much. And even if nearly every individual was not buying their headphones from China, what we have recognized is that there is an enormous system in place. This takes cooperation. This takes communication. This takes change. Also, something like, oh, just put solar, solar panels on your house. Most people do not have the money to put solar panels on their house. In fact, and some people live in climates where they can't. So that's the, that's the, this is exactly what we're getting at, which is that these are literally things that have to be addressed on a systemic level. They have to be addressed by those who have the power or people need to be put into power who can actually address those things. That's how you change these things. We've had people um, doing their part for a long time. I mean, fuck, I know, like I myself, uh, am, am moving towards a, a, a vegetarian diet because I know that how bad meat is to the environment. But I recognize that one person, myself, not eating meat is actually not very much of an impact. And instead, the value that comes from such a behavior is in encouraging many others to adopt the same thing and to encourage the leadership to say, hey, maybe we should address this in a meaningful way. Individual sure, consumptive sure. approach cannot, cannot fix these problems. These problems have to be addressed on a systemic and on a societal level. They have to. Yeah. Okay, well, systemic and societal levels like involve like a group of individuals, but how, how would of course, you stop? Of course, but how how would you stop China from emitting so much? How how would you go about that? I mean, I literally do not have the capability to do that. <laughs> but if no, like no, if you're no, asking if I did, like for, from a policy standpoint, what would you do to stop China from emitting so much uh, carbon dioxide? I would increase trade. I would hopefully, right, ideally, try to increase this trade with other uh, with other countries. Um, try to focus more on like incentives so like for India, companies. for instance. We're, we're, that, that, that's what we're doing right now. Wait, wait, right? I, I'm not done. Um, yeah. So I would I would focus on increasing trade with other um, countries and focus on providing like incentives for companies that do um, work with the sustainable com uh, with other sustainable companies or with the sustainable production whether that be in the form of tax breaks, whether that be in the form of, you know, just giving them like some sort of like market leverage by whatever reason. What I'm trying to say here is that like, hey, you know what, we can like try to focus um, on incentivizing said countries and maybe even on punishing, punishing um, companies that don't do said actions by like raising taxes on them or things like that. So yeah, so it's like a combination of those things. But so so when our ownership in that case is, is is transferred out of China, like what we were talking about er earlier, like, do you think China would stop emitting as much as they're doing right now? Or would, would they keep these factories open and these people employed and they would give these products to other countries? So basically, since the United States is the largest um, importer of Chinese goods, chances are yes that would hurt china's economy that would hurt china's production now ideally you don't want to just do the united states you'd also want to focus on other european countries as well and you wouldn't necessarily like just pull out over one day right or you just like oh you know what like we're just gonna do it like overnight and this would obviously be like um a slow process or you would put you know po like policies or i guess goals in place that's like okay if you don't want us to do this then you know by this point in time try to do this or you know you have to change your thing to this you know what i mean like you can negotiate around here as well i think but another option too is to say hey let's get a whole bunch of nations together and make a mutual fund that can that can uh say all right look we can all admit that this is that there's a huge economic roadblock in the way of us fixing these factories let's Let's all come together and say, let's put in some money and we will up go to whatever country is having particular issues with their factories being too polluting. There you go. Let's go in and put in modern technology here. Let's take this step 
invest in it, and in the end of the day, it will cause less, less economic harm and considerably less environmental harm. These are the sorts of actions that you can take. You can also say- And when the authoritarian Chinese government says no, then what do you do? I mean, if they say no, I don't think there's, I mean, then, then we cross that bridge when you get to it. That's, that's this whole- You don't have a solution. Wait, no, what do you, wait, what do you mean? Can y'all not hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Keep going, the Turk. Yeah, yeah, just keep, yeah, everyone keeps talking over. The Paris Climate Agreement doesn't have any, like, uh, bite in it. Uh, people were talking about that in chat. You know, if we were to give China more money, what's, what's the repercussions if they don't reduce their emissions? I mean, what I was talking about before was focusing on, like, pulling out trade from them um, as well. Right. And if we look at European countries. And if we look at the data Bela showed earlier about CO2 emissions and embedded in global trade, if we continue to remove our trade with China, they are going to continue to not produce more and they're going to eventually not have anyone buying their stuff, right? So uh, China is going to be in really bad shape. Yes. And that's not, not probably that's, not going to be good. And I'm not pro China by any stretch, but I mean, but we'll be in pretty I, bad shape too, right? Because we rely I, I, on them so heavily for manufacturing. Hey, well, no, I, I mean, we'll go to other companies to get good or other countries to get goods and I'm stuff. But I think the better thing here is to have uh, China be more accountable and saying, "Hey, we are going to produce better products at a lower emission cost, but I'm going to charge you more." Can I get it. a bit an economic and perspective here? Um, yeah. So economic theory does provide a fairly straightforward way to um, to analyze um, who is responsible, if you if you will, or who is who is benefiting from um, from carbon emissions, right? So imagine you have a factory that's using some manufacturing process that uh, releases carbon, and they're not uh, and they're not um, you know they're able to release that carbon without actually paying. So the carbon emissions are imposing a cost on the entire world. Uh, and that factory is not paying that cost. So that's what we call an externality. They're externalizing the cost of that of that manufacturing process, part of it. Um, now, the that uh, because they're getting they're externalizing that cost. That means their expenses are going to be less. So they're going to make more profit, but also their product will be cheaper. So the person buying it will also save some money. Um, also, anyone else who's involved in that company, workers, investors, suppliers, are also going to get uh, a better deal with their arrangements with the company. Um, so they're all benefiting. And if it, that product is part of a supply chain, uh, you know, through multiple companies, if it goes across borders, then everyone in that supply chain is going to benefit a little bit for, because of that externality. So, True. um, it's, it's not a simple matter to just True, say right. like, you know, the, the, uh, the carbon emissions for this shirt are China's fault or America's fault. It's the, the people benefiting from those carbon emissions are like all tons and tons of people all over, all the way down the supply chain, all around the world. Um, but we do have economic tools to analyze um, exactly what those dollar amounts are. Um, so the solution to this in principle is to get rid of the externality at the source, right? So the pers it's the manufacturing process that is able to um, impose that cost on the entire world by releasing carbon. Uh, that's what you have to fix. If you can, if you can make it so that they have to pay, to the somehow pay like the people who are uh, suffering as a result of that carbon emission in order for the permission to release the carbon, uh, then that will also sort of uh, propagate out to the entire supply chain, and everyone who is benefiting it will have to pay the actual the actual cost of manufacturing, which includes the the carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, so how do we so do the, that across borders? Um, interesting question. I mean, you can imagine doing that within a country by by having you know something like carbon credits, right? How do we do that across borders? I mean, I guess we have to somehow um, calculate how many carbon credits. Well, I don't know. Does anybody else um, like? I'm not an expert on this. Well, I mean, I think you can close. I think we can acknowledge that. Like, I mean, costs are are determined via uh, you know there, we have a number of ways that we can determine costs. I think that we like. The first step, I mean, the original question here is whether we should have pulled out of the, the Paris Climate Accord. And I think the first step is that we have to have a global acknowledgement or as close to a global acknowledgement of the problem of climate change that we can. And then after that, we have to make an actual effort to close loopholes, to stop letting basically enormous corporations utilize the fact that um, that they can operate across the borders of two countries to get out of paying their fair share. Now, um, well, we can do that if we have 
if we have legal jurisdiction over the corporations. But what about the businesses that we don't, um, like so, the ones that are in China? And China doesn't want to cooperate with this. They want to let the companies in China um, release carbon into the atmosphere, which imposes a cost on the entire world, um, but benefits those companies. Right. We China. can't necessarily decide that. That's going to have to be, I mean, obviously. Well, with, maybe we can. Well, maybe I mean, we, we can, can to a degree. I mean, we can on our the, side, which is that we can, we can, like we can actually say, okay, so if you're, if we determine that your company is is you is using dirty factories or dirty uh, manufacturing processes, then we can fine you for this. And then they could say, oh well, then we'll we'll raise the costs or whatever. But then you can say, no, actually, we're not going to let you do that. And these corporations are in a position because they rely on the people of America being able to buy those products, and they rely on the labor of China. So we have to actually. There comes a point where a, where governments and associations of people have to come together and say this is the problem and there's probably going to have to be certain things like okay maybe this this style of like big box shipping that we use is so damaging that we need to come up with a new solution i believe that we can come up with those solutions but we need to have uh we need to actually have the those who hold the power use this in a way or else we're just going to face the consequences and again i go point back to the point where we either need to put a lot of pressure on people who have the power to make the change or we need to put someone in power who can make the change so right. what is You're the talking. change exactly right i mean can we charge can we charge like let's say when you import a product from china you have to pay you have to uh, pay for the carbon that was released that china wasn't charging to manufacture that product so you have to if you want to sure. import from china and they're not paying the carbon you got to pay you got to pay it too. It's essentially like a tariff, mm -hmm. um, but that would make that would at later down the chain hold people accountable for the carbon cost, and that would put pressure on the comp so on the companies in China to pay for it instead, maybe, um, so that they can sell their stuff cheaper to the to the customers downstream. Maybe I mean I think it's possible to say, hey Walmart, you operate and and um and pay patronage. You either operate directly or pay patronage to these factories that we've determined um, through you know whatever there's and I'm not going to get into the specifics of how you actually determine that because I think I'd, that'd be better left to actual people who study this shit. Um, but if your factories are operating dirty, there is a cost for doing that. And all of the, and your entire business is going to be taxed this X amount. If you use these factories, if you don't operate to that level, I think that's how you do it on this side. If we're the primary importer, then you identify the companies that are contributing the most and you charge them for it. And you reinvest that money into fixing the, um, into, counteracting the damage that they're doing if you can or you outright ban it altogether we do have power in this like that's the thing um but that's not the thing so y'all are talking about article 10 and article 11 of the paris climate accord uh bela is there a document that says what china's committed to do in order to reduce their carbon emissions given that our consumption levels are increasing uh i mean j judging by this piece of paper it's doesn't have those things listed no 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 uh again uh just to make it clear I, I did say this before but the paris climate accord i think we've all like roundly said that this is like not the type of legislation that's needed however it lays the groundwork by creating a global consensus and by pulling out of that we're removing the most powerful country in the world from the global consensus that that climate change is a problem so they're two different issues yes i mean we've kind of moved beyond just the paris climate accord to bigger problems um following questions from various people um but the paris climate accord is obviously not enough um but w with regard to so what why should you stay in it what's that wait because it's the first it's the first it's it, it is a very major step in building what we need to actually com combat this that's like saying like why wouldn't you just not step on the first step of a stairway it's like you just can yeah we're, it's, we're it's great if you can skip three things, of it. but we took the speed to increase yeah we did so why do we pull yeah exactly our, our emissions you know there's all sorts of epa regulations that reduce the amount of carbon that our own factories produce i mean i mean a lot but uh, but this goes oh sorry go ahead uh, the EPA under the Trump administration has been gutted and deregulated. And at the start of COVID, the they were not doing their jobs in the toxic we have this ways. In another let's, talk. let's let Bela first finish first. Knows it. Uh, we have rolled back over 95 environmental regulations. The EPA has been gutted. The leader of the EPA, so if I remember correctly, is an avid climate denier. And at the start of COVID-19, the EPA was told to not do jack shit and to not even deal with addressing toxic waste. Literally stand by and do nothing. So uh, the EPA is not enforcing anything at the present moment. 
they haven't for a long time and the administration keeps rolling things back so i just wanted to address that they're like our epa is very very weak and deteriorating and trump has said multiple times in a lot of his speeches that he wants to completely abolish it um is that and that's that's why I made mention at the very beginning of this that I felt like the the pulling out of the climate accord had a lot less to do with any actual manner of enforcement, but instead about making a, an ideological statement about the current administration's position on climate change, which is that we don't give a shit about it. And I think that's pretty damaging. Yeah, well, I mean, that position of the administration comes from the roughly half of the country who voted for them who like guess also maybe don't give a shit about it um that seems to be like the root of the problem right uh, yeah kind of i mean i think it's a little more complicated than just like uh direct you know a direct thing i mean yes i i think that trump's core base uh, doesn't really care about um the mm -hmm. environment i think a lot of people don't but i don't necessarily uh i don't think that that's like one-to-one -one representation i mean donald trump i think has probably taken a lot of actions that in fact i know for a fact i know people who voted for donald trump who are very displeased with many of his actions that's something that can happen with a president and that's why we're here talking about what we believe on the issue because we're, we're sort of the, the, the court of people where we're judging these actions and whatnot right yeah i mean it, I, i'd also grant that it's quite likely the political process causes those people to not care about it because uh it sort of sells them on an ideology of not caring about it which is actually beneficial to uh to certain politicians oh absolutely um, i mean i think we probably have some um at least some in common ground to find in the idea of needing electoral reform but yeah what i would like to see um kind of mechanism of, it seems like first of all that the goodwill of individual people to voluntarily solve this problem i i think is actually stronger than any sort of political mechanism um, political mechanisms seem to be failing and, and possibly even exacerbating the problem. But it just seemed like individual people, once they've got enough, you know, enough disposable income, are willing to spend that income for just for the feeling of that they are somehow contributing to to help this problem. And I think we could do a much better job of harnessing that by, for example, um, having like a voluntary something something like a voluntary carbon credit system where when you buy a product, um, it has some uh, some certification on it um, that says, you know, this product is, is carbon neutral. This might even exist. I don't know. But some voluntary or uh, some, you know, there private organization. That Say that again. Sorry. Does it exist? There are, there are companies that are uh, working on creating production that's carbon neutral. We actually had a couple of people. So my job, I'll plug here. Um, I... I'm a partner for a professional live streaming platform and network, and we had um, like some startup people come in that were talking about um, their business certification to have like actual labeling on products. Like, yes, this is sustainable. It's carbon neutral. This is the process. Um, so that way, like retail or stuff like that, like actually has those labels. So there are uh, companies that are trying to get that going. So there's more transparency and also more accountability on companies. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, let's start. The way. And we don't need the government assistance for that. We can do that without the government. Like that's happened with sort of organic and uh, and other sort of certifications. Like some organization just starts up. It's like our job is, you know, we we certify things as organic. Um, you can believe our certification that you like. It's up to you. But but we'll use our trademark and uh, and you know give it to give the license to products to use it if we think that they are organic, and you can believe us or not. That seems to work pretty well. We could do the same thing with carbon credits have a sort of voluntary uh, carbon credit system. Um, and if uh, your product is, you know, trace the, the carbon credits, trace the cost all the way down the supply chain, you could even add international. And if you if your product is carbon neutral, if it pays for all its own carbon emissions, then, uh, then this organization will give you a license to put their logo on your product. And then people who buy that product can feel better about it. If you see that logo, you know that you are paying for the whole cost of this product and you're not imposing a cost on anybody else in the world through uh externalized you know carbon emissions i do i do want to i do want to put out there that it seems like a lot from last username the idea of it being voluntary like the government doesn't come in and tell them to do this so i'd like to ask people like sledge and Sinco, uh what do you think about the idea of the government like it being voluntary or do you think the government should actually be have, have a place in, in climate regulations I mean, I'll just point out that the election. government's voluntary anyway, right? We got to voluntarily vote for the government to get them to do something. I mean, I, I like the idea better. You know, I, I, I'm like I said, libertarian. So I any 
less involvement from the government to me is better. And if people want to pay exorbitant amount of money for, you know, say the same products and Hey, I'm all for it. And like I said, I will have more respect for you for actually putting your money where your mouth is. You believe in something, you're going to go buy that product that's made specially just for you. Um, like I said, it comes down to the, like, do I think this is a life threatening thing that's, that's going to be, you know, five years away, the whole world's going to end. No, I, I just, I don't buy it. I don't buy the hysteria factor of it. Um, if, if this is going to come, then I think human beings are incredibly adaptable and we'll figure it out. And I think we already are figuring out. Just like I said, we left the Paris Accord and we're still dropping carbon emissions. We're still doing good technically. Because of a scale, pandemic. Scale, we're in a pandemic. But it's just not enough. It's, it's, you got to give up. Yeah, I'll worry about it once I'm already dead. Rearrange our industry, our economy, and and make it work for this. And if you and if we don't, we're going to die in, in 20 years. And it's already too late. So I just... I don't buy the hysteria. I, I, I there. Wanna, like no one is saying we're going to die in 20 years. That's literally what a lot of people have said. No, like Look, no, 12. no actual scientist and people reporting on this. Like fun fact, I have my degree in environmental science. I'm studying this shit. Anyway, no one is saying we're going to die in 20 years. Again, the whole argument is we need to mitigate damages. And again, we already do have people that are dying right now from flooding. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Oh, and Japan. Like people well, are already dying. Yeah. So here's something else. If that is true, if no, no, it is true issue, though. It is true. Okay. Like this is this is consensus. Are, let's let's let, let's let him finish. You mentioned it, insurances are having a lot of issues because they're having to rebuild homes there. Why are they rebuilding homes there? Why are insurance companies going? Hey, this is a bad deal. We got climate change. It's coming on us. We got to get the hell away from the coast. Why are <laughs> insurance companies covering that? Why are builders building up on the coast? Why are rich people buying houses all on the coast? Why is Maybe that? Because they're Republican. Uh, I mean, maybe science. maybe it's because they're an insurance company and oh, not oh, a construction uh, company, and and, so and this goes to my point that we need a systemic approach because an insurance company has no motivation to do anything but raise the insurance rates on people's. That was, who that was literally Bela's example why I used the insurance companies. Wait, what? That managed retreat. You mean? What? So uh, the issue with managed retreat and the insurance companies continuously rebuilding uh, the properties, one, it's because we need to really address our governmental policy. And fun fact, uh, flood policy has a lot of bipartisan support. Even Republicans have acknowledged that flooding is really bad. Democrats also agree flooding is really bad. And people in the NRDC have been reporting on this, same as, as well as Earth Justice, to go and get policies that are better and we can properly manage retreat people and no longer have to keep rebuilding certain areas. Um, I can link you an episode. We had a, a lawyer from the NRDC come on to talk about this before. Um, and what was the other point that I, I'm blanking? There was something that was said earlier, but um, I, I'm blanking. What, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe quick. remember it. You, you, you mentioned corn and wheat and the fact that it's not going to grow because it's getting too hot, right? Yes. I, are there, is the temperature the same everywhere on Earth? Because to my knowledge, there's quite a bit of area that's cold, that's uninhabitable. You, I mean, the Russian tundra, for example. If you're just saying that we're going to lose all ability to grow any kind of plants for food, if the earth does get hotter, it's naturally going to warm up these other areas that we're not well, going to be. It's because you shouldn't, do in, you shouldn't go into this unless you've thought it all the way through. Like, are, are you cool if we lose our farming capability in the United States and have to rely on Russia to feed us? Or Canada? Is there, who not, is is there not more faster? space in the United States? Are we going to lose all farming? Much. Can you tell me for a fact we're going to lose all farming capability inside the United States? Eventually, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, 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 your your it's approach to this thing—it's not a sudden yeah. thing. Okay, it's okay, a okay, slow everybody. burn. It's extremely slow. You have to wrap your mind around that. Oh, okay, because it's a slow gonna, burn. So, like, okay, okay. Everybody, everybody wanted to talk. Okay, that 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 that. Okay, okay. Again, when I talk. The next time it'll just be a mute, but we don't have much time left. So, uh, it's going to be Balo, then uh, I said Balo. It's going to be Bela, then it's going to be uh, Cinco, then it's going to be Demon Mama. Okay, that's going to be the order. Let it, or did you already finish your point? I linked the IPCC and everything. Like, <laughs> to, in order to talk, like, literally, read the reports, y'all. The IPCC analyzes over thousands and thousands of paper to gather the scientific consensus and report on it. And the That's, IPCC has not. also shown fact that they've been editing data post 
post processing it, and they the models are changing and stuff. Happy so Tea is not immune from being not correct. Okay, right, but but being like, uh, like like scientific organizations having flaws is not the same thing as hand waving scientific consensus, which is what has been happening for a lot of this conversation um is this hand waving oh we'll just find a new place to grow your grain as if that's really something simple what happens if you're if if over the next 20 years um your area becomes a lit every single year catches on fire from wildfires and there's basically nothing that can be done about it or there's no government um rules in place like these are things this is why we have science we have science so that we can learn things about the world the reason why we have these organizations that come together and tell us stuff is so they can warn us about things that could be dangerous to us i mean we're talking about the desertification of large portions of the planet and the acidification of the ocean which could damage global oxygen levels like these are huge problems that we need to take very seriously and i think hand waving it because oh maybe we're not going to be dead in 20 years well maybe you won't be but you might be and there's going to be a whole lot of people who will be displaced who will be no longer able to work in their area no longer able to farm or 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 live in their area that's something that you need to consider like if you don't you're just closing your eyes and pretending it doesn't exist and saying fuck you i got mine but i mean to be fair that's kind of been what what the the uh, sort of outlook has been confessed to throughout this conversation is like oh yeah that is my you know that is seems to be Cinco's worldview which is all right that's throw, fine if that's I the way you want to go gotta throw the Cinco it was pretty barbed at him uh you have ability to respond i mean I, I don't know it's just it seems like virtue signaling you know like i i don't think a lot of us really yeah i mean the world is a barbaric place whether you whether you want to admit that or not and when it comes down to it i think you'll you may realize it one day but however when it comes to the climate change, there's been hysteria for the past five decades. Define hysteria. No, that the world's going to end. Define hysteria. What does that look like and what does that do? How does that, that, that impact if, anybody? If we don't fix this problem now, it's the world's going to end. Really? Is that what anybody's saying? Or are they saying that... Um, yes. Really? Al Gore can you, said can you... it back in 2000. He said 10 years. Al Gore said 10 years in early 2000s. And the AOC world was going to end. Last... I'd love to see a citation AOC, of that. AO... I mean, he has a movie... What was it though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inconvenient, inconvenient truth. truth. It seems it, it almost truth. almost seems to me like you might be embellishing what was actually claimed in that movie, and uh, for your own particular. Okay, so AOC. Goals. I do, I, I do, mean, I do want to have to say that Cinco does need the ability to finish his point. Okay, Cinco. I'm just saying the hysteria is out there, and until you can actually, I, like I said, I just I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing. It. I know y'all are saying that. Oh, we're losing inches and inches of beaches a year, but yet somehow we're still building out there. I just, I don't know. I don't believe in the hype hysteria that climate change is coming and we're all going to die real soon. I mean, again, nobody said that. Nobody said we're going to die real soon. Um, in fact, we've said it, it's pretty dire circumstance for a lot of people. And some people actually might. Not all of us. It might not be the whole world catches on fire in 20 years, but 20 years from now at this continued rate is going to do some damage to some p pretty huge regions of the world. And certain areas of it, like the area I've lived in, in Northern California, are literally struck with with wildfires that destroy the local economy every single year. We can't sustain that for very long. People are fleeing those areas. There has been a great, there's this thing called the, the Great Flight from California to Texas. People are moving to the eastern side of Texas because that's where the fucking jobs are. Um, and because it's cheaper and it's a lot more Yeah, but there's a whole state. bunch of things that there's a whole bunch of things that go into that. Like, I literally lived in this area. I, I can tell you firsthand how bad the wildfire season has gotten and what that's done to the local economy, what that's done to life like wildfires are bad here in texas too yeah of course and we should be addressing those things seriously not just pretending like and not just uh, like a ridiculously straw manning and say oh the world's gonna end in 10 20 years it must be hysteria i don't i don't accept this like claim of hysteria and i have seen no evidence produced so far that there's any form of hysteria in fact all that i've seen so, is people being taking uh, urging people to take it very clarity. seriously so, so, uh, um cinco so what what evidence would have to theoretically be produced for you um for you to change your mind or think that it's actually something like more serious that should be taken into account or anything like that really show how much more, like the, the theory is that we're affecting mm. the climate my belief 
and which a lot of science backs is the fact that climate has been changing long before we ah, ever came Ah, he's a climate denier. Yeah, if, if somebody sends you a study that shows like, okay, yes, climate has been changing throughout the years, but since this specific point of human history, not even before, this is like a X specific point in human history, it's gotten exponentially worse and like we can link it to this and that and this and that. Would you be open to changing your mind? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I'd be willing to look into, but I've listened to other scientists talk and they said, yeah, we're in a warming period. This is natural. This is what the earth does. The Pentagon has a climate change plan, right? Like even our own military acknowledges this. Our military is not always right. I mean, I just sadly so you enough. Our, our Pentagon for national security and defense is incorrect. I, I have no idea about this certain topic, but I don't think you seem like a person that would probably just go with the idea that, oh, military is great and good. And then use it for this one example to benefit your argument. I think the point that she's, she's trying, trying to, to appeal to you. Like, she's trying to appeal to you. That, like, yeah. that even our fucking military acknowledges that climate change is anthropogenic and happening, and it's a problem that needs to be addressed. That's all I'm saying. Do I think we need to defund the military? But, Absolutely. But that's a whole other topic. I'm literally uh, just saying no, that it, even our current administration. The, the is idea. Support. The idea that the military just says, oh, here's the thing. Here here it is. That's how it is. Like, no, I don't. I mean, no, okay. I don't buy it. I mean, you keep saying you don't buy it. You don't see it. But then when people ask you, like, have you actually looked into this? Like, it, it just seems like you say some random scientist. You will make an appeal to a random scientist when the consensus, there is an, there is literally global consensus. Even the, the fact that the Paris Climate Accord even happened, that 195, I think, was the number nations came together and agreed, yep, this is a big problem. That should indicate that there is an overwhelming tidal wave of information warning people that regardless of little changes in the details as far as how fa yes can you cite the 95 percent claim i want to make sure it's the one i'm looking at uh, wait what 95 percent claim the 95 percent of climate scientists agree that humans did i say 90 i didn't say that i said there, i didn't say that i said there was 195 um nations that signed on to the paris climate accord and that that should be an a a uh a, a a meaningful signifier that there are a lot of scientists working together right now and coming to the exact same conclusions warning people for very good reasons i never said i don't i don't think i made made any statement about 95 percent about russia's icebreakers they're literally making a fleet of icebreakers in preparation for was it the uh the tundra up there to start melting so they can start mining like they just in, let's see, we talked about this in my international environmental issues class last year. I think they said they created like 32, I think it was the number that they were throwing around, icebreakers yeah, in preparation for the melt to go and mine to boost their GDP. Like even Russia is like, yo, this is happening. So I don't understand what the fuck has happened here in America to go and deny scientific consensus and be like, well, I feel, well, my opinion, well, I think this, well, what? and it's like, no, the data is there. Like the consensus is 97 to 98 percent just go and read the fucking ipcc That's reports weird. fuck i've been reading documents on my stream if i need to sit down and read a 700 page document live on stream for everyone to be on the same page with this i will will like y'all can tune in and i will do that i'll lose my fucking voice to go so we're all on the same page on this I'm yeah, I was also that. just sent. Uh, someone in my chat sent me a um, a list of scientific of uh, scientific organizations that were that uh, have concluded um, that humans are contributing strongly to to climate change, which is just an interesting another point that we can talk to. Um, ignoring this is is akin to, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to draw exact uh, exact parallels, but it's like I don't know. It's like it's like it's like de like uh, denying evolution or denying gravity. Hey, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. Thank uh, you for the follow. This off right here. We're we're getting towards the end Thank of the show. Thank you so much for show. the follow. No comment. Check. Uh, oh, thanks. I'm really important. Uh, redeeming ask for subs. I'm sure somebody will do it for me. Uh, it's all good, ZRL. Don't worry about it. I just wanted to thank everybody again for coming on. And uh, I think we're just going to go straight into the outros. So uh, uh, before, mm -hmm. yeah, before we do, just wanted to say. Organizing a panel like this is super hard. Like you have like uh, guests who cancel last minute and everything. So if you want to see more of them, support Dylan Burns TV. Subscribe if you can. Twitch Prime uh, with the Twitch Prime it's free. And yeah, 
Follow if you haven't already and check the YouTube, Twitter and everything else. I think, I think he's making a decent point there. And I think, um, I th think that's the best take I've seen all night. And I think that's the bipartisan position, the truly bipartisan position. This is a port where Twitch Prime Tier 1s and some gifts, some gift subs. Anyway, I'm going to go straight into outros. I'm going to throw it around. You get the outro on this topic, and you also get to uh, outro and shout yourself out. Uh, so I'm going to start from the uh, bottom with the new guest, uh, Cinco. You get first outro. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, so just finishing up this topic, I mean, yeah, like, I'm open to seeing evidence, but with it just Are seems like though? if it's just a few inches or a few oh, extra take hurricanes, time, which Gina, I don't no think worries. we've documented that well enough to know. Hurricanes happen, storms happen, fires happen, crap happens. And yeah, like whatever, said, who changes, gives a shit? Whether we're here or not, Hand you know, I think Close it's going to continue ears. to change no matter how much regulation we try to put on it. Um, and then... You know, I, like I said, human beings are adaptable. I think we'll adapt and overcome. And if not, we'll die. And there, I mean, there it is. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, let's I, die. I'm, you on it. I'm not too worried about it. I won't lose any sleep. Uh, anyways, Cinco, I don't know how to do the outro necessarily, but Cinco's, plural. Come on, Dylan, I, you got to get it for me. Cinco's. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on almost every day. Just enjoy chatting, have her, having Honest conversations, mask off. talking politics, current events, all that fun stuff. So come hang out. Wonderful, wonderful. I hope everybody gives you a, uh, a listen and go check out your Twitch. Uh, the Turk, you're next. Is this total outros or just this topic? Uh, this topic and then outro. So all of it. So basically, uh, as far as the Paris Climate Agreement, I you know I think the U.S. could have stayed in. They could have taken. They could have ta gotten out if they wanted to. I think as a country, we can definitely improve how we manage our CO2 emissions. And I think from a economic standpoint, uh, there's definitely an economic benefit to reduce our that that stuff. And whenever the fusion starts getting really close, I'm going to invest in that shit. Anyways, uh, Don't worry, I'll bring I that stream up. science and tech. I love data and numbers. That's why I'm pressing a lot of these people for like facts and stuff. So. Oh, really? Uh, like Twitch. you only did that once and you already been listening. I got a listening. YouTube channel. I'm active on Twitter. So, yeah. Hey, next, I'm going to throw it to Grimace. Oh, sure. So I just, I was thinking about it during this panel. Like if the problem is CO2 emissions, why don't we just plant a bunch of trees? That would solve the problem, right? Like we just get the CO2 and we convert it to oxygen. That's a joke, by the way. That's a joke. I'm sorry. Everybody's like, they've got like the, the look on their faces. I promise that was a joke. Grimace, um, I, just I know like some, some people are so disappointed in me right there. <laughs> okay. Um, so the solution to like uh, bad science and bad data gathering is like to have good science and good uh data gathering. that doesn't mean that you can just say just uh tr just plant uh, trees five foot. trust your gut and like go go against the, the scientific consensus um for the most part i agree with the gentlewoman on this panel as far as like putting economic pressure on china that's probably the best way to go about this and to actually establish like a global coalition to maybe get inspectors in there and like measure levels and actually have goals um, as far as like the, the, the Paris uh, climate accord, I would like to sort, I, I mean, I definitely want to want to get back into it and we can treat it the same way um, uh, pr President Obama um, described the, the ACA as being like a, a starter house, like just somewhere where you start and you and you build upon it. And if we can get an actual like global uh, coalition to put to all come together and put economic pressure on China. To, to stop emitting so much CO2, I think we could all feel more comfortable moving towards a greener future and, and combating uh, climate change. I think that's the way to go. Um, but for all the, the the lefties on the panel, my my, my fellow lefties, like trying to to, to blame uh, China's output as, as on with CO2 on America, it's just, it's not helpful and it's just going to add to conflict and it'll make people like not listen to you. Like it made me reactionary, not want to just like, oh, why is it everything always America's fault? Um, but nobody but, said that. Um, nobody actually made that argument. Uh, yeah, I think we can use the market to combat this. It, it might be slow. It might be frustrating. Um, but yeah, um, as far as my outro goes, twitch.tv slash outgrimace. I'm not streaming so much anymore because I'm trying to gather a few more resources and put together a better stream that everybody can engage in. And Dylan, I'm really upset that you insulted my plans considering you made me like come in here at the last minute to, to fill in as your substitute. Like my plans aren't even in this room. They're in the bathroom getting light and getting humidity. Okay, so they're struggling. Like I just have this, I just have this rubber plant right here. That's all I got right now, okay? Yep, so yep. 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I'm a tr I'm sorry yeah. that I'm a truth teller and I don't take your bribes. <laughs> Listen, next time I'm I'm it's just gonna be all plans. You can't you won't be able to see the lights. Though. And uh Bela, if you ever want to talk about plans, like I actually don't have that much experience raising plans and I'd, I'd like to get some good advice. But thanks for shot TV slash Grimace, follow, like, yada yada yada. Pixie, you're next. Hi, I'm Pixie. Um, you guys already saw that. I usually stream politics. I haven't streamed in a while, but I want to get back into it. I'm also taking five classes right now. Um, <laughs> so it should be like that. Um, but thank you so much for having me on here. I, I always enjoy it when I'm on here. Um, if you are not donating to Dylan or subbing to him, what the fuck are you doing? He's providing A-plus fucking content here. Go, go and sub, please. Okay, and that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs> Decent take right there. Uh, Sledge. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Sledge. I appreciate your uh, caveman presence. It's great. I'm going to throw it over now to Demon Mama. Yeah, my name is Demon Mama. You can find me at twitch.tv forward slash Demon Mama Live. Um, as far as my closing statements on this one, um, the Paris Climate Accord is the first step uh, in my mind that we had towards uh, building a sort of consensus. The first thing you have to do is recognize there's a problem. Getting a whole bunch of nations to recognize that is really good. Um, I just I, I just wanted to make one small statement. I didn't hear anybody like explicit like or even implicitly defend China. I just think it's important that we recognize that there are um, multiple parties involved here. Um, and also, um, I, I do... I do think it's a little bit um, concerning to sort of constantly hand wave and downplay and say I'm not going to lose any sleep over something that is widely acknowledged as likely to be the biggest struggle um, of our future. I think we should take such problems seriously and we should try to um, uh, approach them without uh, a, a sense of callousness towards the lives of, of, of humans um, and our own lives, which will inevitably be affected by such change. So yeah, I, I guess if, uh, if your worldview is uh, you don't give a shit, then that's great. But if you do give a shit and you want to make the world a better place, you know, think about it. Because uh, stuff like pulling out of climate agreements because you have like a, a weird personal ideological issue with, uh, with like working together with other nations like Donald Trump does is a pretty bad idea. Thank you all for uh, for being here and uh, give me a follow. I'd appreciate it. Wonderful. I'm going to throw it over to Bela now. Yo. Yes, Grimace. Please send plant pics. You can slide in my DMs anytime hey, to share thanks, plant everybody. pics. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the follows. <laughs> really appreciate Anyone it. Anyone can slide in my DMs to send plant pics because I love plants. Um, anyway, my TLDR of all of it is... Um, well, I'll do my conclusion in my thoughts. So... I have graduated with East Asian Studies and Environmental Science and Policy. I'm planning on getting my master's in agrobioscience and international like environmental policy. Um, I was literally my job to read documents and talk to researchers. Like that's literally what I get paid to do. Hey, thank you for the follow. Um, Deeply appreciate it. So I'm constantly going through documents. So on my stream, we are constantly going through documents, keeping up with the news and the political situations around hey, all of it as thank well. you i appreciate that um lot. we should not have pulled out of the paris climate agreement even though it is a paper tiger the fact that 195 nations came together and agreed on it is important and the fact the united states decided to pull out of that is a big fuck you to the rest of the world it's more symbolic than anything and uh, again if you, you look at article 9 it does outline that. the responsibilities thanks for coming by i'm gonna talk after this so feel free um, to as hang far out. as for china's uh emission standards i honestly wasn't expecting i, I kind of had a little bit of higher hopes for the panel um, so I didn't go and like try to find their specific um, Paris Agreement details, but next time if I come on, um, I'll have that for you if I can find an English version of it. Um, but yeah, come visit me. I stream in the mornings because I'm I'm a crazy person. I'm more awake in the morning, so I'm live every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, 8:30 a.m. Pacific, so 11:30 a.m. Eastern. We talk environmental science, justice, activism, policy, everything in between, plants and reptiles. Um, also, East Asian news. So we talk about what's going on in Japan, China, uh, and the Korean Peninsula as well. Um, recently, because it's like you know hurricane season, we've been like uh, been following a lot of cyclones and that fun stuff too. So if you're interested in climate. And um, like weather reports, we've been going over those too. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Bela. Thanks so much for having me on, Dylan. I appreciate the invite. 
problem. Always happy to have you on to talk about climate policy. And last username. So one thing that's become fairly clear to me on this issue is that as that politics has has done a terrible uh, done terrible things for this issue for this this problem. Uh, politicians love to politicize the issue of climate change in in both directions, right? I've seen lots of politicians doing ab ab absurd denials of the problem, and also some politicians uh, doing absurd exaggerations uh, of it. And both of these things um, just absolutely, completely sabotage the effort to actually solve the problem. So I I would say for anyone who wants to help with this problem, be very, very conscious of how your efforts um, might be misappropriated by by politicians trying to use it to you know increase their power or achieve various ends um, and look for solutions that don't depend on people who who in, whose incentives you can't trust look for look to use look to for solutions that use incentives um, to the benefit of solving the problem um, that harness people's goodwill and their desire to solve this problem, which does, there does seem to be a large supply of, um, and doesn't let anyone with bad incentives hijack it and mis misappropriate it. Uh, that's pretty vague, but I don't know. I, I have some ideas about more specific plans that might fit that description, which I don't have time to talk about now. So, um, thanks a lot, Dylan, for having me. Um, great panel as usual. Thanks to everyone. Good talk. And, uh, I hope to do it again sometime. And my name's I'm last underscore username on Twitch. Come check out my channel where we talk about things like this and other stuff. And uh, yeah, take care, guys. Thank you to everybody who came on. Once again, I did one last poll on who was the best guest, and Sledge won with 92% of the vote. Uh, of course, it was inevitable. Uh, specifically, the option of which Sledge won was Sledge Smash. So we got that one. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you all again for coming on by. Is anybody going to be streaming for a significant amount of time? Uh, both, um, I will be. Both, both Bela and uh, Demon Mama. Do rock, paper, scissors quick. I wanna... Okay. Like best two out of five. One, two, three. Okay, <laughs> okay, 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 I should do it. Okay. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. Oh, that's one for Demon Mama. Uh, 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 Again? Two out of three. Yep. One, two, three, go. Oh, it's Demon Mama. Well, that's oh, I wanted to works. tell everyone before we all head off, um, I was able to confirm the arm meme is indeed from Predator. And even more yes. so, the character is named Dylan. Hey, best character. I, I agree. I noticed in chat like 30 seconds after I said it. I, I apologize. You're good. You're good. It's all in good fun truly disingenuous i can't believe it this is the worst crime the right has yet to commit i'm i'm not allowed on this panel anymore am i yeah it, i mean my, that, that was a mean fact checks are getting yeah one have to be bridge the, too uh, far with grumple mind waves and the turk so it's going to be a long list of highly reputable people <laughs> okay thank you all for coming on one more time you guys can chat in here as long as you want i'm going to do a quick outro with the chat thank you all once again for coming on all right thanks bye Dylan. everyone thanks everybody thanks, bye, bye. Let's, let's, let's talk. Hello. Bella, are you still on? Oh, there we go. I'm out of here. All right. How was that? I had a good time. We have some stuff to do. I'm going to stream some more tonight, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. I'm going to stream. Not for too, too much longer, but for a little bit. I'm going to go for maybe another hour or so, I think. Thank you, Gina. I appreciate it. Um... I thought it was mostly, yeah, I think certain topics were a little bit like, I don't know, they got distracted and whatever. Um, Sledge, I don't think is a very serious political um, per, like person to talk to. Like basically all of his arguments boiled down to um, like too bad, which I don't find um, like a particularly convincing. Um, oh, hey, thank you, Puff. I appreciate that. Um, thank you. I, I do a lot of panels. Um or conducive. Yeah, maybe that's the right word. Um Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I'm 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 trying to get better at it and I like to be rhetorically consistent. Um I I like to think that that brings a lot of people my direction. Um which, you know, makes me feel pretty good. Um actually, let me just change the um post 
actually let's talk about that what do we want to talk about yeah literally just die yeah that was the one that really got me um let's see here we go post panel discussion then talking about trump we're gonna talk some more orange man bad i hope y'all are ready for that whoops trump bow, bow. Yeah, um, I really hate it. I really hate it when people's um, like argument basically boils down to, well, uh, if you don't work, you just die. It seems like a really like simplistic and like, um, yeah, there was, I mean, but that happens a lot though. Like I think people's um, sort of, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the Trump is, there's some big shit going on with Trump. I'm actually, I've decided that I'm going to do the content that I had prepared for today. So um, yeah, we'll settle in. If Especially if Dylan's gonna raid, we're gonna hang out. We're gonna talk a bit. I can do it, whatever. I might not be able to go as long as usual because I've just done a panel, but I'm gonna talk for a while. Um, Trump is, um, up to, to no good all across the country. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that sort of approach is, is like, anti-intellectual and it is based on ultimately feelings it's just oh well i don't i don't want you if if you don't work then you shouldn't eat okay well why because that's the way it is that's the way it was it's like okay so you just feel that way you don't actually have a reason for it like notice that they both got notice that both um what was his name sledge and the other guy Sinkos. oh my god i forgot Sinkos name um yeah Sinkos. um both of them had a situation where i asked them very directly like you say suffering is the way that you learn does that mean that if you get put in like a torture box that you're just going to come out the same well obviously the answer is no because it's not actually suffering that teaches people suffering can be a part of what teaches you something for sure um but suffering alone isn't what teaches you something and then the other one was like okay so then are, do you think that you're going to advocate for a system whereby um if you're just pulling a lever up and down repeatedly over and over and over again for all of time is that valuable work is that work that somebody should be forced to do um in order to pay their bills yeah, yeah, it is the it is the fuck you I got mine. We heard that like three times, like mask off. I feel like that hurts their case, right? Like it's not just me, right? Like that's not just stupid to me, right? Like I feel like that hurts their case with a lot of people. It's just a really bad argument. It doesn't it doesn't enlighten, it doesn't make a case. It just says, Well, that's what I like. That's the way it was for me. So it's just it doesn't require a whole lot of thought. Like, and that's the other thing. And the other thing that we kept running into with Cinco's was um he continually kept saying i just haven't seen it i just haven't seen it well but a lot of other people basically everyone whose opinion has any level of quality of qualification on it has seen this and disagreed with you and also i find it funny that he opened by like basically motioning that he wasn't a climate change denier but by the end he said that he was he said it's all natural it's all just normal and we just have to deal with it but that's just simply not true like this science has been developing for like damn near a hundred years and scientists have been warning us about the potential impact of climate change for as long as these fields have existed. Yeah, it, it is, it is, it does stem from American individualism. I agree. Um, but I don't know. What are you going to do about it, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's part of it. You got to kind of grapple with that. It's just, it's not so frequent that you hear people just fall back on just, yep, you're just going to have to die. Yeah, it's, it's a sad worldview. And that's why I bring it up. I'm like, I think that's a barbaric worldview. At the end of the day, I think that's a barbaric worldview. Like a world where, is that really the world you want to advocate for? A world where if you can't work, you just die? So apparently you want a world with um, like no old people, no young people, and no people who have disabilities? I don't know. That's not the type of world that I want to live in. Um, I see value in people who can't work. They provide value. Yeah, I don't know. These people are usually so deeply miserable that it's like, I'm just like, damn, like that really is your worldview, isn't it? It's kind of sad. Like not to be, not to sound like conde too condescending, but I mean, come on, right? Like if you advocate for a world, like, I mean, by those same logic, hey, 
Hey, whoa, thank you for the raid, Dylan. I was expecting the raid, but I wasn't expecting such a large raid. Hello, Status Sam, good to see you. And thank you for all the follows. To everyone coming in, we are um, discussing the panel. And hey, thank you, Pixie. I appreciate that a lot. You did really good too. Um, I really enjoyed um, the discussion of um, mandatory work. I thought that got really spicy. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Dylan, and thank you, Pixie. Glad to see you both here. Um, we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about the panel a little bit, and then I have some Trump stuff. We're gonna do some or we're gonna do an Orange Man Bad segment. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see. What were we talking about? We were talking about. Um, oh, 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 I was sort of addressing how I don't subscribe to a worldview where, like, I, like I don't subscribe to a world where you're the only human value that humans have is to is to work. Like old people can't work, babies can't work. People with certain disabilities can't work, but that doesn't mean they don't have value. That doesn't mean they don't bring things to a society and to people. Um, so yeah, hey, thank you for the uh, the uh, bits. Thank you so much. I saw a tweet today about an 84-year-old woman who had to go back to work because her SSI didn't cover her bills, and it was framed um, as a great thing. It's ridiculous that she would have to work just to survive. I agree. I hate those sorts of stories. I find those like sorts of like... Um, inspirational stories like not inspirational i find them insulting like an an 84 year old woman who's you know like just why can't she just live her life why don't we have a system in place that allows an 84 year old woman who's been a part of society for 84 years um to just live their life yeah it's kind of um it's kind of extreme um yeah, I mean, babies just have to yeah, babies just have to learn how to work. I mean, it's it's a very I understand where it comes from. It comes from like that Protestant work ethic that's kind of been ingrained into American society. But work alone isn't valuable. Like this is work. Me picking up and setting down this cup is work. I'm working right now. I'm doing work. Um, but that's not necessarily valuable. We determine what work is valued by a number of factors. So to just say, oh, you uh, you work or you or you die is like that's like not a meaningful argument. It's just a it's just a statement to your sort of dogmatic assertion that work is important. Work for work's sake. Um, and a lot of these sorts of things ultimately contribute to an environment that is. Um, like I said multiple times in the stream, um, sort of inherently a inherently ableist, inherently um, ageist, and, and often inherently queer phobic. Um, and that's because uh, the assumption that like work is the only thing that makes you valuable as a human whatsoever, or work, which again, define work. Um, that's where a lot of the sticking point lies. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I don't think it's ageist to say that like an 84 year old person might struggle a lot more at a job or might not do so well. Like a lot of jobs are very physically taxing and it's just fact that most people once they get older, um, yeah, work is fine food to survive. I mean, no, queer phobic. OK, well, here's the thing. Um, this is how I'm saying it, because um, traditionally employment is something that's been held over trans and queer people. Um, as a, as a means of social control, um, for example, I mean, uh, and housing as well, like for example, myself, I mean, I've told my own, my own story, um, about my own family, um, in, in how, um, you know, my family threatened to kick me out if I continued forward with transition. Um, and that actually did end up happening, which, of with which barring in most circumstances will also immediately affect your employment if you don't have a place to live you don't have a place to shower you can't work um in a society that demands work in 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 terms of everything if you are discriminated against by your workplace you're going to be severely disadvantaged so yeah it's really really important um that we address the fact that using work as the only meaningful like contribution to society or having the state mandate work as as like um, the only way or the most important way to participate um, in society is really problematic because those who are prevented from work, who are strategically prevented from work, are therefore also 
prevent it essentially from survival. The reason why um, like lots of queer people struggle so hard is because they're essentially pushed out of the economy. And that's really, really difficult to deal with. Um, uh, what? If the left gets their way, they will have to mandate work. I strongly disagree. Um, humans do work all the time. Humans like to do stuff. Humans really like to do stuff. So I, I disagree with that assertion. I think that all, all evidence that we have actually says that humans are pretty busy creatures. We like to go do things. We like to go, um, we come up with ways to play. We come up with ways to invent. I mean, hell, how many people do you know who just do hobbies for fun? Things that take a lot amount of work, like wood carving is both a trade and a hobby. Um, making videos online can be both a trade and a hobby. Like we do things that are considered work um, all the time. Humans love doing that kind of stuff. And that, but what, what I think is a problem is when you start having a central authority forcing people to do work for their benefit. I do think that's a big problem. Humans like to be productive. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Feminist critique pod. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I just don't, I just don't agree with the idea that like, um, work has to be done. I mean, it's not only depressed people. There's a lot of reasons why you won't, why you don't want to work, but depression does harm your ability to work. But keep in mind that depression is like depression can be caused by your work. Like lots of, do you know how many Americans, do you know how many Americans, um, do you know how many Americans like get depressed from having horrible work conditions and then they don't want to work anymore because they've been burned out? Also, most of those people might take time off and then later re-enter the workplace. And also, um, depressed people do a lot of work, sometimes very much against their will and, and like against their emotional well-being. People volunteer all the time. Um, yeah, there's a certain amount of work that has to be done, but the idea of, like, advancing technology is that we live better lives. People who make the arguments like, oh, you work or you starve, they're interested, it seems like they're interested in preserving a world that is forever a miserable cycle of toil. And I just don't get behind that type of vision of the world. I don't think that's a good vision of the world. I think that's a vision of the world that's harmful and limiting. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, my work depressed me, too. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what that means, Kinjakon. I really don't know what you mean by that. Um, the real world um, is full of all kinds of things. And what we've traditionally tried to do is reduce injustice. But by just hand-waving and saying, oh, whatever, uh, if you don't work, you just fucking starve, you're ignoring the fact that not only have we had massive technological leaps, but that the average person now, well, okay, not literally today in comparison to local, but throughout history, we live better lives of better leisure thanks to technology, t thanks to our brains. We get smarter, we come up with ways to have to do less involuntary work or no involuntary work. Ideally, the goal of, of any of like a society would be that no person would have to do things that they don't want to do. And I don't mean like don't want to like, oh shit, I gotta go do, gotta go clean up after the cats. That's a pretty minor level of don't want to do. I'm talking about things like um, how every single person in society needs to have a job usually for a corporation um, at this point in time. Nobody has starved in the U.S. unintentionally in decades. You are so, in, that is so impossibly wrong. Um, but yeah, citation needed. If you have a, um, if you have a citation for that, I'd love it. And also, um, that word unintentionally is doing a whole lot of work right now. That's a, that's a, that's a real operating one. Give me a name. Wait, are you for real, dude? Do you want to come on and talk with me? Do you want to do a debate stream? I've never had somebody come on. Hey, Kinja Khan, do you want to talk about this? Do you want to come on stream and talk about it? Hey, Kinja, Kinja, before we talk about this anymore, do you want to come debate me about it? Okay, all right, sure. Hey, the Turk, you can come on too. You want to talk some more? Open door. I'm in the mood for, I'm in the mood for discussion. I'll have you know, I very, I talked over basically no one this time. Excuse me. Kinja, if you're going to keep throwing bullshit in my chat, you better be ready to defend it. You came in with the claim that no one has starved unintentionally in the United States. I don't know. What do you want to talk about, the Turk? 
I was I was just being I was being spicy, but if you actually want to talk, I've been I've been uh, having this argument via chat with this Kinjakon person. Um, I was just being spicy with you. If you, if you want to talk, we can talk, but um, I don't know. I don't have a topic. I'm just I was about to go do some Trump stuff. So, but I was uh, talking about some questions that came up in chat. Um, well, hey Zeus, yeah, I think it's a very difficult. I think it's a very difficult question to how we get to a post scarcity world. But um, I think we can acknowledge that. Um, um, I think we can acknowledge that like our society has ext extremely gross um, wealth inequality. And I think we would be much closer to a post scarcity world um, if we addressed a wealth inequality and income inequality. Um, then we would then I think we'd be closer than we like to think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I starved for a couple years when I was homeless, maybe ate once every couple days if I was lucky. It happens to a lot of people. There are a lot of people going hungry, and there's also a lot of children who go hungry. Um, starvation is actually very common, and yes, although there's, and also there's another problem too. Um, there's also another problem, which is that while we have lots of, we have an abundance of food, we don't have an abundance of nutrition. Um, a lot of the food that we have in great abundance is nutritionally um, empty. If you were to consume that food, you wouldn't actually be getting the, um, the nutrients you need, the vitamins you need. So, yeah. Um... Yeah, so that's something that I think people also um, ignore. One of the things that really bothered me in this panel was somebody, um, somebody like downplayed um, food deserts. They were like, what the fuck is a food desert? That doesn't exist. Um, yes, they objectively exist. I have lived um, in a food desert. Uh, okay, Kinja Khan, this is your last warning. You're actually annoying me. So either you put up, either you put up or I, I time you out. Um, because you you keep asking questions, but you haven't provided a single piece of evidence for the claim that no person in the United States has starved. So, um, yeah, um, food deserts are a huge problem in the United States. Huge problem. That actually irritates me when people downplay that. And also when they downplay that and then someone, I think it was, um, Cinco's right after the food desert comment made a comment about obesity. I'm like, you do realize that like, Food deserts have been implicated in the onset of obesity because people grow up eating corn syrup for, in every single thing that they do, which is incredibly calorie dense. So they gain a lot of weight while not actually feeling, feeling satisfied, satisfied. It's something that, um, that, that bothers me because it's something that comes up a lot. And also, let's be real. We're on my stream now. I can say this. Uh, people bring this up, bring up stuff about being about obesity and, and food very frequently with me. You know... It's a little strange. I know I'm a chunky girl, but like, you know, it's it feels a little targeted sometimes. Let's just be real. But um then they also proceed to not know anything about it. And that annoys me. Um yeah. it, it it bothers me. Hey, well, hey, thanks for coming by, Iron Mage. I really appreciate you being here and thanks for the kind words. Um hope you have a great night. Get some rest. Um but yeah, uh, food deserts are a huge problem in the United States. Um, lack of access to nutrition is a huge problem. And interestingly, there's actually some things um, that that would have tied in really well. Um, we came off of it a little bit in the Pla pa Paris Climate Accord subject. But um, hey, oh, all right, oh, breakfast detective, are we gonna talk? You want to talk now? Because I will, I will talk to you about that. I will talk to you about it if you want to. I could bring you on. Like you can, we can, we can talk. I'll call you if you want. You want to do that? You want to do it? Um, I'm fat, but my fat comes from stress and growing up on a piss, piss poor, poor diet full of additives um, and preservatives that don't meet nutritional needs. Why poor people are often overweight or obese. Yes, I grew up eating very unhealthy food. Not not through the effort of my mom tried. My mom was a great cook, um, but we were just poor. We were just poor. And when you're poor, you eat unhealthy food. It's what it's what's cheap. That's how this works. So yeah, you might not be starving, but your life expectancy might be reduced because of something you had no control over. Um, and like, uh, yeah. And, and also something I noticed that happens a lot is that um, people like, um, like Cinco's, will um and and uh, and sledge will do stuff like say oh i don't believe in a in like a social safety net of any type and then they'll be like oh well why do you why do you buy food that's made in china well or or why do you buy products that are made in china but you realize that social safety nets actually make it possible for you to have more control over what you buy for example 
um, SNAP um, in many states, but especially in my state, in my state, SNAP, you get uh, you get more SNAP money if you use it to buy local goods. So if you buy local vegetables, you buy local foods, It you actually get a discount on those because the state said, hey, it's actually good for us to produce our food locally. Um, I want, I, I, it's actually good if we produce our food locally. So here we will subsidize snap a little further and it gets people to buy stuff. It incentivizes people who are on snap to buy uh, food that comes from locally. In fact, you get literally double your snap money. If you go to a farmer's market, which means not only do local farmers benefit, but it also feeds people who might not have money here in our country. Those things are based. That's based. And that helps address the climate problem because it localizes food production instead of having to ship food from overseas on giant tankers in that, that cough out carbon, you know. So yeah, there's some really amazingly cool stuff that can be done through public programs. But people say, oh, I don't, I don't want to pay for your shit. But it's like you're like, we all are paying for this stuff. We all pay for this stuff. Yeah, the, that argument makes me so mad. That was the one I was going to address. Before I do anything else, um, I just want to hit my head. I'm too tired to argue snap. Yeah, I mean, but, but yeah. Okay, the, 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 oh, did you donate all your money? That argument is really weak, really weak. It sounds like a got you, but it really isn't because what it basically says is they are also wearing clothes made in China. We, people, like, I, I think it was, um, um, Be Benla, Be Bella, Bella, Bela, 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 um, um, was like like turned uh turned it back around yeah Bela Bela turned it back around on him and was like hey like um wh where's your shirt made he's like I don't give a shit and it's like okay dude like all right um um yeah it was like oh I don't give a shit it's like okay so then you're just literally arguing in bad faith it's it's obvious that an individual person without becoming like a like a monk can't get can't extricate themselves from the system that they were born in i was i was born and raised in a capitalist system that doesn't mean i can't identify problems with it or that a bunch of us can't come together and go oh shit this system that we kind of inherited has some problems that we should probably address it's a it is a thought terminating argument it's made to make you go and just shut your brain off it's not actually meant to to come to a solution hey don't spam questions or you're going to get banned from chat all right what system has more of an abundance in, in food than capitalism in practice, in practice, not in theory? Oh, uh, easy. Communism. Real simple. Take a look at Vietnam. There you go. There's a hint for you. Um, done. Um, yeah. And also, abundance is not necessarily um, what you actually need because abundance isn't necessarily a good thing. For example, here in America, we have an incredible abundance of Captain Crunch. But we don't have an abundance of mm, healthcare, um, vegetables, nutritious foods, um, healthy meat. Yeah, people still starve. Abundance of food isn't isn't the metric that you need. But good try there, one commies, one two. Yeah, why is the sky blue? Um, if I remember correctly, um, oh, I, I, I've thought about it many times, one commies, one two, but for now, this is where I live, and I, um, being a good citizen, I'm doing my best to make this place better. Um, why is the sky blue? If I remember correctly, it's because, um, ozone reflects blue light, um, so when the sun hits ozone molecules, it reflects blue light. That's why the sky is blue. Yeah, it's the angle of reflection. And it changes because of angles, yeah, obviously. But yeah, it, it is incredibly expensive to move. It's incredibly expensive to move within the United States, as I just experienced at the beginning of this year. Um, one day we'll join American Johnson. Yeah, I mean, hey, Vietnam looks like a real good place right now. They've had zero COVID deaths. That sounds amazing. I'd love that shit. Um... Wait, what? If it was so great, then you would move there. Good argument, one commies one. You tried. You tried, my friend. You tried. It's not working very well. I disagree of populate. Uh, I disagreed on the population issue. I think capitalism is the root problem, but obviously more people consuming makes it worse. Um, yeah, I mean, could some, could, I mean, there's a lot of confounding factors that, um, that contribute to climate change. The thing is that the, the big, like, capitalism stands in the way of fixing the problems like 
um, for example, it is in it is it is undoubted that we would have had climate damage if we ever had an industrial revolution. But the problem that we are having now is we can't fix it because capitalism is getting in the way of it. So it's not so much that the problems ever existed. I mean, some of them are really bad, but it's the fact that this system is not elastic enough to actually allow us to address big problems within it. Yeah. Who's going to buy them, Ben? Fucking Aquaman? Yeah, exactly. I don't have Aquaman's number. Um, all right. So yeah, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, oh yeah, moving is one of the most stressful things that most people do. Like there has been psychological research into this. I don't have the the study on hand, um, but there's been extensive study that people list like moving as one of the most traumatic events of their life. Like we really underestimate how hard it is to move. Why does v Vietnam have sweatshops if they're so good? I mean, I don't know. Do you have any evidence of those sweatshops? Um, all right, let's have a talk. Come on, come on, breakfast detective, get in here. I'm gonna call you. We're going to have a talk. Let's talk. Call me or here. Uh, tell me when you're ready and we'll, we'll talk about this. Your t-shirts are made in Vietnam. Damn, dude. That sucks. All right, here we go. I'm calling you. Okay, I'm calling you right now. Hey, can you hear me? Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Hey, can you hear me now? Breakfast detective. I think you might be on push to talk. I'm going to put the, uh, here, let me, let me edit this real quick while we do this. Yeah, I hey. definitely was. That was it. Hold on. I'm just putting it, uh, putting this together, uh, putting together my little thing that I, that says who I'm talking to. So that you twitch.tv it's, it's just, you're just twitch.tv forward slash breakfast detective, right? That's me. All right, perfect. I just want to make sure that I that people can follow and talk to you when you um, own I, own me with Leninism or whatever. Oh, psh. I mean, I don't. See, that's the thing. I don't think I'm gonna own you. I think what it's probably gonna come down to is like just a maybe a difference in like how we feel the role of the state has in like influencing culture and society. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 much more on the anarchist side of things than the Leninist side of things, but um. There's a couple of reasons for that. I I, I don't uh, I, I don't get behind forced labor, um, and the reason being, I mean, I guess I guess it's hard to like broach this topic without going into like sort of more um, core, I guess yeah, core yeah. core assumptions, which is like I mean I I think they're uh, one of the one of the failings of of um, a lot of authoritarian or more authoritarian, um, top down approaches to building a communist state have, have, um, have run into the problem of ultimately, uh, failing to leave the transitionary state period or, or losing their desire to leave the transitionary state period. Once the original progenitors are dead. Um, I was just about to say that. Yeah. Or killing the people who wanted it to be a transitionary Yeah. In the case state. of, yeah. In the case of like Stalin. Yeah. Um, hey, by the way, how does how does this sound uh, sound? I'm on my phone. Oh, you sound fine. Um, it's like a little it's like a little bit degraded quality, but nothing too bad. Okay, cool. Yeah, the cool. volume's pretty good too. Is if anybody in chat, if the, if there's an issue with the volume, please let me know. But uh, as far as my levels are showing, it seems to be pretty good. Also, uh, I read something uh, about psycho psychology and podcasts where it uh, it sounds more interesting for people if like the host has like a nice crisp clear voice and then you have like a collar with like slightly lower quality <laughs> Wait, is that true that's that's actually cool um i didn't yeah, know yeah i could I, I could try to try to drum it up but it was an interesting article all right all right i'm going to mute this person hold on i got to mute this person they're driving me nuts i'm timing yep. you out because i'm ha i'm very clearly having a conversation with somebody um right now uh one commies one two and you're spamming my chat so you can have some time in timeout why don't you think about reading the room a little bit next time all right think about what you've done yeah think about what you've done um yeah you were <laughs> spamming random um factoids about vietnam in my chat um and yeah so there you go just just so everyone knows i love having conversations but if i have somebody on my show that's going to take precedent over some random person dropping factoids that they got grabbed from google in my chat sorry um just how I it works you, girl. yeah um yeah i mean uh, I, I i apologize if it came off like i was calling you an eco fash um i was being a little bit spicy because i mean people tend to appreciate the spice on those panels but i do think that the um the idea that like um that that like 
that like saying, oh, we have like like 20 years, we have to use mandatory service is the same basic logic that justifies like eco-fascists who say, yeah, well, we only have 20 years left. Um, we only have 20 years I... left and we need to press all non-white people into service. Like, I think that like, I think those Ooh. those are like dangerous. Like, I think those are like, that's a, that's an argument that I find um, to be really like not a good argument. So I came down on it a little hard, but I wasn't, uh, for the record, I wasn't advocating you were an eco-fash. Um, and I think in the I, I said- I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. No, I know you're not, obviously. I wouldn't go on your show if you were an eco-fash. I'm not going to platform- I was going to say, I was like, I was like, girl, like- my feelings, but unironically. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I was being a little spicy, but I mean, to be fair, like, I mean, I have, uh, I have a, a, a pretty strong stance against mandated labor. Um, yeah. In a lot of cases, because I feel like uh, it, it is a, it is like so deeply flawed a system that the moment you allow something like that, you've basically um, opened the door to uh, an incre like an incredible amount of state control over individual life um and there's and there's definitely a lot there that's like a totally fair criticism the one the one way i would just i would maybe push back is not the right word and neither is contextualization that's fine. the one thing i would say is that you know there there are certain overlaps in in like logic and it, it, it could be one of those two people using the same set of facts and coming to different con conclusions things sure. right yeah so like one 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 person could say press gang all of these people into service right mm. and another person like maybe me like i'm not saying throw throw people in jail but i'm saying like you know we should incentivize people to want to be neighborly and like as far as i'm concerned like some of the things i care about like um i see you know uh pushing people out of their comfort zones and let's say you're in like an all rural like white like uh, neighborhood maybe you don't understand what a lot of black Americans go through. Well, cool, your your new high paying job is right in the center of like an all black neighborhood. Is that, now that I say that out, out loud though, is that like state sanctioned gen gentrification? Um. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it kind <laughs> of is, right? Like, I mean, this is the thing that like concerns me about like, um, I don't know. Like it is, it does feel that way because like, here's the thing. Um, yeah, this is, this is, this it, is a complicated issue. When you, when you get into like, okay, there's always, I'm always, I guess I err on the side of like, we should have the government mandate individual actions to the least amount possible. Now, obviously there's always going to have to be a certain degree until maybe like, um, maybe if we exist in like, um, a complete like post scarcity society and, and stuff like that. Um, oh yeah. Hey, thank you for the subscription. Oh, uh, real quick. I just wanted to thank somebody. I think I missed a subscription earlier. I just realized that. Um, Hey, for anyone in the chat, if you're entertained, if you're here, if you like demon mama on Dylan Burns TV, drop some prime subs in the chat, consider subbing. She's got some great emotes. You know, hey, you want to be you. part of the community. Thank you. Hey, uh, yes, thank you, Matthew, Sean. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Sorry for missing them. I was like juggling a couple of things. It's my bad. Um, I appreciate Matthew, every Sean is cool. Yeah, yeah. So far, like I, I, I think this is Matthew. I think this is the first time you've been in my chat. But thanks for coming. And uh, 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 synth. Yes, indeed. Either Warzone or League. After I'm done, for sure. Um, uh, what, what else was I gonna say? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We so, were. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I, I uh, after panels, my brain tends to be really frazzled and probably very disorganized. Um, yeah, you sound fun to me. Uh, what was I saying? Um, we were talking about I, I, I said is you know relocating people for work, you know, for the purpose of ending like yeah. racial tensions. Is that like? some weird state sponsored gentrification. And then I was like, it's a complicated I, issue. I kind of feel like it is in a lot of ways. And, and the thing is like, I don't think the state is, is a good organization to do that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like, I think communities handle that a lot better. Um, like for example, like, um, for me, it wasn't like me being, uh, my, my parents were like, like, this is, this is an anecdote, obviously. So this is not data, but like, I'm just giving an example. I'm like, my parents were very, like, they had very authoritarian views. They believed in like pushing me to do a lot of things. My dad had me do like a crazy amount of sports when I was a kid, hated sports and, and like only recently have come to like have any appreciation for most sports. Um, besides the time, like a very brief time when I randomly worked in it. Um, and, but 
what did happen that was like, I grew up in, in like new England, like it's all white. You know what I mean? Basically everybody yep. is white up in new England and you know, the food is very, uh, you know, it's fish and, and bland stuff. That's, that's how it goes. Fish and mayonnaise. But when I came to, when I went to college, one of the first things that I was in- incredibly incentivized to do was like, I immediately joined uh, an international club that would that because it was so exciting because all this new stuff was inherently excited and it was provide it was presented to me as something I could choose to do. There were hundreds of different things I I could go after. So I tend to think that like um, enticing people with positive solutions works way better. Um, and even if you have to use like a bit of a stick, like I would never want that in the hands of the state. I would prefer that to be like, hey, like um, maybe like counselors can be like, hey, like we really really want you to go do this here we're going to encourage you and pressure you to do this a little bit or something like that on a case-by-case basis i think humans are usually like sort of inherently um curious um and i don't know like so i guess when it comes to like i i can see where people see the benefit in like um bringing people together but i just think the state is a is a terrible apparatus for doing that because that's never going to be their priority at the end of the day we know what the state wants the state wants the work they don't give a shit yeah. about all the other benefits. So you know what's so interesting about this though, and like when you were talking about your your parents, it kind of made me think of this. Like mm. my parents were <clears throat> exactly the opposite in the sense where they never forced me to do anything. Mm. They let me quit everything, and I like grew up into this like quitter kid who like couldn't stick through anything, and it like it took me a long time to be able to like learn out of that, and mm. as a result. I'm more of the philosophy that like, I do want to force my kids to like do shit. Like I'm not going to, you know, like a, like, like, you know, rub their nose in it. But if they're like, it's hard, then like, I'm not going to do what my parents did, which is like, all right, you can quit if you want. I'm going to be like, that's true. Life is hard. I love you and believe in you. I support you. Like if it's torturous, then like, okay, you can quit. But like, I really want you to stick it out. Yeah. And I mean, I think like parents have, um a lot more like uh i guess authoritative right than i would argue the state does um because like parents <laughs> true parents individually know like their kids they know like they can usually make not always there's bad parents i you know i i right, know right. firsthand but i mean parents in general at least have much more familiarity with their kids emotions they know what might just be like oh, i don't feel like going to football practice today versus i hate this like um yeah for my parents like no matter what like i hated most of the sports that I participated in. I mean, I'm trans, so there's a couple of reasons that go on there, but there was nothing I could do to tell, to like get them to let me stop until eventually I was so bad at the sports teams that like the coaches were like, um, you know, like Emily's really, really bad at, uh, at, uh, at, at these things. So it's like, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, um, that's honestly yeah. though, like that's that, that's the best psyop ever. Oh, all right. You're not going to let me quit. I'm going to be so fucking bad. Nobody's going to want me on their team. I mean, it was really (laughs) funny. Like my baseball, my baseball team, like my farm league baseball team that I was on when I was younger, um, like they actually gave, like that was the only sport that I like was like, I truly like really enjoyed, even though I was extremely distractible. Um, like my, my, my dad used to be like, why are you always standing out in the field shooting laser guns at stuff? Because I would get distracted and start thinking about stories and shit. Cause I was like, yes. that's where my brain was. Um, and, but the baseball team, it's really funny. I actually got a, um, a, a big trophy at the end because, uh, I kept trying to, I liked batting a lot but i kept getting hit by bat by baseballs so like it happened once that i got hit by a baseball on the head and it sucked and then while they were trying to teach me to not be scared of the baseball somebody accidentally hit me with a baseball again <laughs> and i oh think the coach God. i think the coach like felt so bad that it happened to me twice in a row after they like encouraged me to like go back out and bat again after i got hit in the head with a baseball like that they were like they were like oh here like you get to have a most effort trophy so i was a recipient at a young age of a um these gosh dang millennials and yeah. their trophies yeah but hey it <laughs> actually was one of the few sports things that ever happened that did indeed motivate me to keep trying was i was like oh damn like i guess there is some value to this but that's kind right? of like a random it's almost like one no that's totally fair it's almost like maybe like being encouraging to kids is cool and based yeah 
Um, I think that that but, is something that's like, I think that humans work a lot better um, on like incentive structures. And I do think that like some humans, uh, like some people I think work really well with like, um, you know, like having like punitive measures, but let that be up to the individual or like really, really, really intimate um, community, like, uh, like, like communities that actually know like what limits they're pushing. Like, I don't think that a state that already controls like a monopoly on violence that's, that's like, um, you know, responsible for high level, like organization is ever going to do a good job being able to pay attention to the individual needs of people. And it yes. does scare me because like, as somebody, like as somebody who is absolutely neuroatypical, like, um, I mean, I'm a streamer, like, like, I don't really, like, I, I don't know, like, I'm, I was very bad at a lot of things and very good at a few other things, but I have a very interest-based, um, approach, um, it's very hard for me to bully myself into doing things, my brain just will not do it, um, and, and it's like, it's not something that I can, like, I can force myself to do something if I have no other choice, but it's a miserable process, and I would not say that it makes me a stronger person, um, it, but yeah. I, I do naturally chase, uh, like my curiosities. So I guess, I guess that's, the, that's my main approach to like why I, I stand so strongly against like stuff like mandated service. Um, I don't think that the state needs any more help, uh, determining our, the individual portions of our lives and certainly not for stuff like, um, like where you're going to work. Um, and then there's, of course, I think there's, um, logistical issues with it, which is like, I mean, how do you have a, a state if you live someplace like super rural where there may only be like two jobs to do, you're functionally getting mandated into doing something you might actually hate. Um, or else maybe the government has something where they'll like take you away from your home. But what if you don't want to leave your home? What if you just want to like paint in the woods, but that's not useful to the government doesn't count as a job. Like, I don't know. You know what I kind of think about? So like, I, I, I agree with you on principle, but I kind of break down in the practicality. Mm -hmm. So like I'm in the pre-planning stages of, you know, building a commune in Washington state. It's Hell super yeah. exciting. It's super cool. That yeah, is I really cool. It. Really fucking great people. I'm grateful to be looped into it, but it necessitates that people work and work hard and put in a lot of labor to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Like physical hard labor. Like right. once we get this farm, you know, or rather once we get this property to turn it into a farm requires a lot of work from a lot of people. Right. So in many cases, in, in rather in a big capacity, we have to gatekeep by the, the amount of people who are willing to put in that work. And that in and of itself has like a baked in level of ableism. Right. Because um, like yeah, if there's. Yeah, like if if we're saying like even on a practical level, if we're saying we need someone who's capable of doing X or Y physical labor tasks, mm -hmm. like that's not something that everyone is capable of, despite the fact that they might have like a role in this, they might have a part to play. So like I've been really big on trying to orient things in such a way where we very quickly evolve to needing a more diverse skill set that's not all just like labor, 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 but one of the things I think of when I think of like great works projects like built in the past mm -hmm. is that the government has the ability to assume a shit ton of loss that uh, what's it called a private company does it. And let's say we are going to incentivize people to do it. Like I totally I totally fuck with the idea of incentivizing people first. And if that works, then we don't need to force people, whatever. But the one thing I'm thinking about is. I feel like we're going to get to a certain point where we're not going to be able to rely on people's goodwill yeah. to just sign up and help out. And like, I don't, you know, I don't mean to pick on certain people here, but like some of those libertarians we heard in that chat, what was the language that we heard from them? Right. Like, I don't care about other people. Yeah. They don't I give only a shit. care about myself. Yeah. So those people are never going to volunteer, but fuck them. Like, well, <laughs> why yeah, should but, they have but, the right but, to opt out? But that's like on an individual basis, right? Like you're not constructing a state. Um, and I would hope that like before you pressed anyone at like gunpoint onto work on your farm, that you'd be willing to provide them with everything that they needed first. <laughs> like that's the well, problem I mean, is like, like, there's yeah, no if you, gunpoint. Well, I, I should hope so. But, but I mean like on your, on your, in your farm, you're creating like, I mean, at most, at, at most, I think it's fair to say like, uh, like, uh, 
like a, a community, a community that's, yes, that exists yes. as a part of the United States. Like, um, we don't, we're not really at it. Like, it's really, really hard to actually create like a completely independent commune within the United States. Um, it's actually illegal. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and so like, there's a, there's a couple of things there. So there's a couple of like, like you're anybody who decides to go to your farm is analyzing the benefits and saying like, Hey, like, this is what's required if I go there and this is what I'll get in return. And I assume you're not going to keep anyone there against their will. Um, I should hope not, which, of you, course. you know, so I mean, then, it's not a, so that's it's not, not the cult. same thing. Like, yeah. So that's, the, that, then that's not the same thing as what we were talking about when you're talking about like, like, um, for example, if there was like a mandatory oh, yeah, work yeah, yeah. requirement imposed by the United States right now, I mean, it's a big deal to like leave the United States. Oh yeah. No, and, I just um, wanted to contextualize what I was saying before. Yeah. I mean, I think it's not that I'm saying that they're the same. I'm just saying that there's a level of practicality when it comes to like getting work done so like yeah. if we can do it by volunteer awesome but if we can't then like i'm totally cool with just being like well you know you got you gotta pitch in yeah i think that that's um i think there's like at least the way that i approach is that no state should ever be in a position where um it is imposing work on um on to everyone when it cannot provide for everyone um now people can sort of like i, I think there's a certain level of like vol voluntary motivation um but otherwise you're just getting into exploitation like for example if like i right um if i choose to go like if for example talk about the instead of a mandatory service let's just say we have some sort of like a, a giant jobs program right i might say okay yeah um Okay, this is kind of hard because there there is a possibility for a state to basically have a monopoly on jobs. Like I think like there's right. like our economy is collapsing. I don't want to rule out everything, but we don't really live in that ideal state. I don't think we should aim for a state that starts um, demanding work of people before it's able to provide even a reasonable amount of the basics. Our society does not um, does not. It would be it would be. Um, oh, I should move to just chatting, shouldn't I? Oh, you're, you're right. thank you so. Sabine. So like so that's my problem is like is like yeah. our society doesn't really provide um, anything necessarily for people, um, but it would. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really like a, valid valid point. Yeah. One of the one of the things that this makes me think of too is like, you know, I was kind of thinking about this earlier on the panel before my shit ass hot hot spot died out, yeah. but that like when we talk about these like individual issues, like, like should civil service be mandated or whatever, mm -hmm. like you bring up such like an important and critical point where it's like, in what context, like in the context of today, where we have like tens of millions of people like on the verge of bankruptcy at like any given time, they have no, no safety, social net, like just getting a temporary federal job is not, is not like in the purview for them. Like, especially like what we were exactly talking about with that first topic. Like if you're a felon, you can't work for the federal government. So yeah. <laughs> like that immediately gatekeeps out a huge portion of the population who've been over criminalized. Yeah. So when I think about like civil service and like I should have contextualized this more, I don't think in the current system we have today, I agree with you where it's like there need to be steps to get there. But I also think about the Soviet Union and how the Soviet Union was built was not voluntarily. And they managed to get, like, in 50 years, they managed to rival centuries that other industrialized countries had. And, you know, people talk about all, like, the propaganda. And there's, like, certainly, like, no country is perfect. There's a lot of skeletons in those closets that are worth unpacking. Yeah. But one of the things that I like to, like, really drill into, which is one of the, the, the systems of organization that Stalin destroyed that Lenin created was something called Soviet democracy. Mm -hmm. And like, this is a, this is like halfway between a, like a disorganized governments uh, at a very local level with like, you know, horizontal uh, uh, accountability, right? Yeah. But this isn't something that you could necessarily opt out of because they saw it as your responsibility. So like, no, 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 like, like we all have to work and like you have to vote. Like you, you have to support someone. You don't have the, the right to just opt out because that, that opting out hurts another person's like rights of like representation. And if we allow for people en masse to just opt out of these systems, we lose so much. So like, I mean, I think I just, that's true to a degree, but, but also like, I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge like, um, 
certain, I don't know, like, um, certain claims like like okay so for example um it it very well may be that we get to a level of like environmental catastrophe where it is either extinction or people get pressed into slavery to save the planet that is a horrible outcome i hope that is never the case but i think it is a Agreed. potential future scenario that could happen um in a situation like that i think that um what has to be done to save the human race is necessary but i don't think we should make that call before it is and i think that That's um fair. like uh the distribution of wealth in this country is such that i believe that i mean and i think there's enough math it is a hard one to pull but i think that we could at the very least um make a functional society with some re with some um you know redistributive policies that doesn't require people to um constantly um be jumping from abusive job to abusive job um True. or or to abusive job with the state to abusive job with the state um and instead give people a lot more um um a lot more like sort of personal agency in their future and i think we will actually see that a lot of people will seek out fulfilling labor themselves and we won't ha actually have that shortage i think a lot of the um i think a lot of the fear um, that motivates people to sort of like these these very very strong stick ones is like oh well what if it what if it doesn't well we're not there yet right let's not jump to like um, state mandated like forced labor if we don't need that yet and we shouldn't and hopefully yeah, we can hopefully fair, we can address fair. other things first is like my approach and the other problem I have is like um, like we can acknowledge that like the the Soviet Union for example made a huge um, like made huge leaps in industrialization and stuff like that. But they also collapsed into the current into current Russia, which is a oligarchical hellhole, um, and but that those, was directly those, those two things aren't aren't related. Well, I mean, we I mean, are we don't I don't think you can say that entirely. I think we can say that like I can definitely I, say that. I mean, I don't know, like the a lot of the people who are oligarchs in Russia were at one point members of the party, like and in fact, a, a, like some of the, in fact some of the most powerful people, including Putin, was a member of the party. He was an incredibly involved member of the party. I think it's hard to say that like oh like it's it's hard to to um separate the fact that like oh, okay so this party came in sold people um a a um you know a vision of a of a, of a just future um gra redistributed all this wealth into the hands of a bunch of elites who now still hold that power and i think that is something that's that's a big problem i think that um giving like redistributing all wealth into the hands of a of a um of a state of a single state that doesn't have incredibly powerful checks and balances is really, really dangerous. And I don't, I think that we've seen right. that happen again and again. Um, but my point in bringing up the Soviet democracy before is that there were checks and balances built into the system that Stalin destroyed to make his socialism in one country policy work. Right. So like a lot of that, like, like for instance, they used to have something called an imperative mandate versus an elective mandate. Right. So in the United States, we have an elective mandate. So okay. politician says, I'm for Medicare for all. OK, great. I vote for you. Well, they don't do Medicare for all while they're in office. What can we do about it? Nothing. Just wait until their term is over. Mm -hmm. Under a Soviet dem democratic system, there's an imperative mandate. So that representative has to either accomplish their stated goal or prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they are working to accomplish that goal. Mm -hmm. And if they don't or they can't, then they're allowed to be recalled by the people who they represent. They can they can vote them out and vote in somebody new, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, we have something similar to that in my destroyed. state, actually. But but here's the other thing, though. Like, um, with that in mind, like, um, the Soviet Union is dead, um, and we're now looking to build better countries going forward, right? So we should be able to acknowledge that. Oh, hey, this is a huge vulnerability. The fact that it was possible for stalin to consolidate power in the way that he did and break the system so severely is a is in and of itself an, a, a, a vulnerability to that model this is this so is the, like that's, an anarchist that's where i would i lot. would i would push push back on you quite a bit sure because i don't think that it's an endemic quality of the model i think it's an endemic quality of having a totally collapsed like government that mm -hmm. then came in to be reformed by essentially this adjunct group that didn't have the same like entrenched sort of institutional power. They didn't have all of these checks and balances pre-established. Everything was really new. 
So it's like it's like any other project. The easiest time to fuck something up is at the very beginning before things have really even like kicked off, mm-hmm. right? So I see that more as a function of it just being an incredibly chaotic political environment where they were the only real actors and the only reason why they had any sort of legitimacy was not, you know, necessarily because they had like this like a uh, uniform one party ideology, mm-hmm. but it's because they had militias, you know, they had militias that were able to like protect people like against the state when the state would come and like attack them, they would send the red army out to go chase the white army off. And like, they gained like the mandate of the people like, like that, like that way. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of tangenting here, yeah. but my point is just that, you know, I don't think this is a, a, a critique of the system so much as it is, of the environment that the system was operating in. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the most salient critiques, at least that has always rung home for me from the anarchist perspectives, as opposed to like, um, you know, Marxist Leninist perspectives is the idea that like, um, political upheaval and instability is inherent in a revolution. Um, it's going to be there in every single one, any sort of revolution that occurs. And so if your model can't, actually succeed in bringing about a communist revolution in unstable circumstances that might be you know that's worthy of critique um that's actually the whole point of lenin's bolshevik ideology though mm-hmm. is exactly the point that you just made i mean well maybe i just need maybe, maybe i'm not understanding i mean like the the, the if i if i i mean i've only read like 50 percent of state and revolution at this point so i still have some more theory sure, sure. To do. but um I, I think one of the problems that we have is like uh with with when 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 power is consolidated into into um like a central authority like you have this like seizing of the state and um and uh a a uh sort of implement using the the uh, i think it was the words that that uh, lenin used were like the ready-made apparatuses of the state like utilizing those to establish proletarian power i may be mis- misquoting i'm not a theory expert but um so one of the w- w- the only the only place i would contextualize oh, thanks. Have a good night. From what you're saying is that the communist party in the soviet union mm-hmm. grew out of the bolshevik party once i think uh once they had started to consolidate power across the country and the dust of the revolution had started set- settling down, they had a little bit of a reshuffling of organization mm-hmm. and renamed the Bolshevik Party to the All Union Communist Party. And like that's what Stalin was a general secretary over. And like he was able to steer the, the party platform away from its original intentions, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But Lenin's whole point when he talks about the vanguard and how we need to protect people. You know, what what he's essentially talking about is how to guarantee a revolution in the face of, you know, uncertain circumstances and leading up to the February revolution. Right. Right. There was this big split in the Soviet Congress between I'm sure you've heard the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Mm -hmm. Well, the Mensheviks were essentially uh, today's version of social Democrats. They were very similar on policy. Mm -hmm. The Mensheviks also did not have. Um, you know, an armed wing. They didn't have like uh, people who were training for this revolution. They were just kind of like academic, you know, petit bourgeoisie, like intellectuals, right? Mm. So they say to Lenin, you know, we don't need those things, you know, da da da. da. Like we don't need your like, you know, army. We don't need, you know, these sort of policies. We don't believe in these ideas like the dictatorship of the proletariat, it's it, etc. Right and. The way that the rules were set up allowed Lenin to do this like sneaky shit where he essentially, despite having the minority stake in the Congress, was able to essentially flip the seats of every single Menshevik except for like one or two, essentially eliminating them from the Soviet from the Soviet Congress. Mm -hmm. Really sneaky, underhanded shit. He exploited rules that were designed not to be abused by people. Lesson learned. But (laughs) like the point was is he saw the Mensheviks as being too weak to be able to defend the revolution from these kind of revolutionary forces, the white army, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Hmm. you know, reactionaries. So he did this, right? Good or bad, that's what he did. But, you know, in the process of doing those things, the Red Army was able to to destroy the whites. It was able to fend off international mercenaries. It was able to create a socialist economy at the very least for several years before it kind of descended into authoritarianism. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, and to tie this back to what we're originally talking about um, on the topic, because, again, uh, I still have a lot of theory and history to read on the exact history of the Soviet Union, um, at least in my approach. Um, I don't I, I don't I think the sort of existing um, structures in the United States and the geography of the United States do not uh, do not play well in the favor of um, of, of any of our leftist goals to sort of attempt to create a centralized um like like any sort of like centralized uh mandatory like we're gonna go take over a town and these people are gonna join us and we're gonna have them do this because we need to do i don't think that that's gonna go well um we don't have yeah. even close to i mean and so that's my problem at the end of the day and also the reason why i don't advocate and uh, the reason why i don't advocate for forced work and stuff like that is 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 more to do with uh like like philosophy even then theory i don't believe that people should be forced to do things um at the behest of a of a state that they have no choice essentially in associating with i um, will admit demon mama that sounds a lot like you know the non-aggression principle that we hear from libertarians a lot i mean to a degree but uh, like i'm a libertarian socialist like that's like that's where my tendency tends to go like i tend to believe that um people need freedom and i think that um not acknowledging a liberatory nature of like uh, like this is this gets you into like class reductionist territory right because if you so if you don't I acknowledge am, i like, am also a libertarian but i don't per prescribe to ideas like the non-aggression principle because for what you were talking about earlier it's not pragmatic enough it doesn't deal enough with the real and it ends up being these like essentialized philosophical arguments that don't actually really get us anywhere like we have to compel people to do shit past a certain point. It's not a question of right, but if we where do you where you draw that line is like exactly where yeah. we draw that line. So I when mean, we say we shouldn't compel people to do anything, if everyone no, was I specifically to just said we shouldn't com kids. compel people to do work. I mean, I actually had that exact conversation on um, on Dylan's podcast about public education. Yeah. Um, I think that education is something that can be actually incredibly detrimental um in certain forms but by and large is it is an enlightening process but it also right. but it also is not the same thing as work um work has a beneficiary uh, education is a is essentially with a few exceptions an altruistic pursuit when you go to school education is also work though well, in our cur yeah, when you consider homework and stuff like that, I mean, yes, no, to a degree. No, just the process of learning. It's work. You have to really work at. That's a stretch, I mean, though. You're talking the difference just... between. I mean, yeah, okay. So if we're gonna if we're gonna expand the definition of work to also mean um, study and also mean the creation of art or music, then yeah, we can. I can. That's agree. also work. Yeah. That's yeah, a totally. Lot of work. Then, then I agree. Um, if we can have a state that guarantees um that says that there's a, a mandatory civil service and civil service includes um tinkering on computers in your own home and that qualifies and you won't go to prison then great i agree with you but i think that's not what you that's what, a I, good not, idea i think that's not what anybody was advocating for i think we have a little no, bit more that's such a good idea though because like when you think about you know not to sound like too much of a theory five head but yeah. like when marx talked about like the whole point of communism the way that I read this, and maybe this is too charitable or generous of an interpretation, but I read it as the furthering of art. This is like eventually you get to a place, let's say, fully automated luxury gay space communism. Right. Everything is automated, any sort mm -hmm. of production model. That frees people up to spend their time on what they actually want to do, right? Not slave away at some fucking right. job. They can of create course. art, music, tinker on the computer, etc. So what if that those those were some of the bases for this program? I could see that being huge uh, i mean uh, that's especially from like an ada point of view right yeah but i mean at that point though why not just like if you're at that point where the where the definition of work is so broad why not just not have a mandate and let people pursue in general and if somebody is like obviously struggling like they're depressed and they're sitting in their home and not doing anything have a have a civil approach to that like oh hey maybe we should set them up with a doctor it's that just, they can talk to like do you see what i mean like it's a different I like do, i don't believe that like a down like a top-down to mandate like, is like, what it sounds like to me is like, and, and I know this isn't what you're saying, so please take this with a grain of salt. Mm, sure. But it sounds like to me is like when people are like, yeah, well, why should I vax? Like, why should I vaccinate my kids? Like, if my kid is never going to get polio, then like, why do I have to give a shit about it? And it's like, it's because it's like a net good. Like, like it would it would help more people than it would hurt. 
You right. know what I mean? But, like, I, like I do think. But of, you're like, talking about a vaccine is very different than working. It's right, very, right, it's right. very but different. I'm just and, and that's about like this is the 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 principle being that like there are some things that like we should all do because it's more good for all of us than it is a negative, right? Yeah, but like, but that's a hard thing to determine when it comes to mandating somebody do something that they have to do every day, like a work that you have to go constantly work at. That's a very big, yeah, it's a big it's like, step. It's like uh, a, a it's vaccine like saying is... that like, we're not, we're not going to just like let people be like homeless and jobless. Like yeah, but we're going to give people something to do. Yeah. But giving, but if somebody like, okay, like that's great. But like at the same time, it's just like, if, if that's the goal, if the goal is to not have people be homeless and not have people be despondent and unhealthy, then why wouldn't you just build a program that addresses that? I don't think I don't think that there's enough evidence to say that like a, a mandated job program is going to cure despondency. And to me, that sounds like there's, work. That sounds like work essentialism. For that. Oh, I there's mean, I think people have a lot of having... evidence for civil service having net positives. I mean, there are there are so many different countries that have these types of programs, and they're almost all resounding successes. They resounding, so yeah. But you say success, but to what end? Like, what are we talking? To the about? end that it improves society for all the reasons that Bela was talking about, right? Like, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, it gets you out into your community. It gets you caring. It gets you knowing your neighbors. You know, it gets you feeling connected. Like, you have a place where you belong. That's why people join the Peace Corps. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same sort of spiel. Wait, but doesn't the Peace Corps usually have you going to, like, another country? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the Peace Corps like, is So that doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't actually match your argument. You're arguing that it helps you get connect to your community. Uh, There's all kinds again, of... Again, I'm not, I'm not using, like, exact, I mean, I think you I'm could... I'm not going to, like, sit here and quote data sets to mm. you. You know what I mean? I'm just yeah. trying to have a conversation. I mean, yeah, but I mean, at the to, same like, time... make though, metaphors like, of things that operate along similar principles. I mean, churches also have lots of certain positive outcomes but i think they also have a lot of negative outcomes right. that are worthy to consider i mean i would argue that probably um there's probably like enough there's probably data you could find that says that like church uh communities with robust church communities are probably overall real good but there's probably some members in there who are really really miserable as a result and i think that but then we, you, you wouldn't think that we have like positive things to learn from the church in that area in the same regard that we have well, negative yeah. things that we don't want to replicate wait i mean no like like yes of course of course we should learn from the positive things and one of the positive things one of the things like good things that we can learn is that community is great but forcing people to 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 participate in a community that they're not happy in is not great and well, let's, and let's it's very like easy yeah, it's very easy for, for very, very powerful centralized authority figures like a state or a church to manipulate its members. So we should be very careful sure, about sure, building sure. such but structures. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be top down. That's number one. I didn't say that. I, I mean, that. maybe they uh, mandated, but mandated the job, is, mandated civil service is sure. That's a pretty top down argument. I mean, it could be from all of the all the different like, you know, uh, structures you just mentioned state county municipal federal all of those could be possible uh what's it called uh, like uh, locuses for these things to flow out of mm -hmm. but you know i also think the the i'm just i'm 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 having a little bit of issue because i'm thinking to my like to myself you know let's stick with the church example for like a second right yeah. so like I'm a person on the left who's a big believer in spirituality. I grew up extremely Christian. I was like a militant atheist forever. Now I'm a Buddhist. Um, I have a big space in my heart for spirituality, mm -hmm. but not in like a large institutionalized setting. Right? right. And the way that churches often compel people to do labor is not by saying, Hey, if you don't do this shit, you're not going to be a part of our church. It's a social pressure where they, where they say, Hey, we're all doing it. We're all chipping in. You should too. And we know that people are vulnerable to social pressure. But how do you socially pressure someone who has no fucking stake in what you're doing? Like these libertarians who are like, I'm not going to give a shit about you. I'm not going to care about anyone who's not my immediate family. How do we get those people to feel that same sort of pressure? And that's what I'm like, what I'm talking about. Eventually, we're going to have to go beyond kind of like the idea of just like appealing to everyone's good nature because not everyone has good nature and we still have to get good shit done. Do you, you know want to know I mean? what my argument to that would be? My argument would be you don't have to.
you can just art we would have in a in a society that's that's well enough and structured enough to mandate civil service and to be able to afford that sort of a thing we should be able to be a society that lets some people sit around sometimes if they want to and think about it and we shouldn't sure um put and 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 instead we should focus on enticing those people to come participate i mean i think um for example like if you're sitting like like if you're at home uh, and you're a libertarian type and you're like fuck you i don't care and then you sit at home and everybody else is is having a great time at the community garden you might be incentivized to go out but i think and i think they should be they should have the freedom to go do that if they want to um but that like those inspirational ones are way better than punitive or mandatory state measures and i do um have an incredible amount of um hesitancy um and uh, trepidation towards um towards like giving large central powers of any form um an incredible amount of sway over how some an individual's life is lived i think there's a lot of problems with that i mean obviously in our society so what, it's ridiculous what we were advocating for by the way was like a year not anytime someone like get, gets fired from a job they get swept up into like a work lot but a year is right? a long time like, we're not yeah but a that. year is a long time and like a year is a long time of somebody's life and we're talking about i mean yeah. in the context of the conversation is 18 it's a formative part of your life um yeah exactly I, I don't feel like the state should really be the one making that call i think that if they want to entice you into doing it um i mean i think there's problems that we need to consider with that because Has we there, so has there i gotta ask you a question mm -hmm. has there ever been a society that's based completely on enticing people and not compelling them to do anything uh, like has that ever existed i can't think of an example of one i mean the world's in a pretty shitty place so maybe we should try it <laughs> No, no, that's I kind mean, of what I'm advocating. Ever, right? I don't know. like, do we have like I think any that's proof really... that this would ever work at all? Yeah, I think that's a. I don't know. I don't know for sure. Um, I think that would be a really hard one to determine. I don't know that there's ever been any clean society that's been any one single system. I just think that we can. Um, I think that we can recognize. That's the point that I'm making, though, right? Well, I mean, but on the on the flip side. Every society in history that we know of, including all of the communist ones, have compelled people, and they are failed states. They're they're very like. What about Vietnam? Vietnam is not a failed state. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I think we can. I mean, I don't think we can claim that Vietnam is some kind of paradise. They have certainly very good. No, things. No, they're not a paradise. I'm responding to the point that you just made, where you said that all socialist communist countries are failed states no no and i stated not. that every society is essentially today. a failed state we have very few societies that function in humane manners our like our our line for what we consider whether a civil or not society, they're humane bad. is not is not whether or not they're a failed state right i mean like something can be humane in a failed state something can be inhumane in a failed state and vice versa they're not they're 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 not mutually exclusive concepts. I mean, to me. this is the same like type of argument that's like, oh well, um, this is like cap, this is like capitalist realism with tanky flavoring on it, isn't it? Because it's kind of just like, <laughs> because it's just like, it's just like, oh well, like, no. I mean, the only so the only societies we have is now. I mean, America is about as good as it's gonna get. It's never no, gonna that's get not even what I said. You gotta, Demon Mama, I love you, but you gotta get better at addressing the points that people are making and not. Wait, like, you just pivoted to Vietnam? What the fuck? Wait, what the fuck? You were talking. See, that's the thing. You said there are no successful communist countries. They're all ah, failed states. That's not what I said. We you said, can you... All right, hold on. I want to fucking rewind the VOD for a second here because we're going to track this okay. conversation back. I gotta, you said... Please don't yell. I have headphones in. All right, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, you said first, is there any uh, society in history that hasn't pressed people into action... Um, and I said, I don't know. That's a really tough question to ask. I don't feel like there's ever really been like a successful ideal society. And I said, but that's what we're advocating for, right? And then you responded by like, oh, well, like, uh, I, I'm trying to remember what the what the middle point was there. No, um, so you were you were right on in the beginning. And then you said all communists, even even the communist countries are all failed states. I and said, I I, oh, yeah, I said, I believe I part. said, I believe I so said every state point, in the world is is basically in a state of being a failure and that the, bo that right, the bottom which, line, which I think is such a broad brush to paint that we lose all meaning of what we're talking about. But to kind of back up a step to what you were that. talking about, I wasn't saying whether or not we should have an ideologically pure society. Mel, just I'm sorry. That kind of makes me cringe. Uh, uh, Mel, no, you do not get to come in here and just claim b b 
<laughs> Carte blanche that the DPRK Get is good. Mel in no, here. I will not. This is a stupid <laughs> argument. I've had this argument with her before, and it, it's not going to go anywhere good. I don't. So, I don't know what Mel is saying. I don't have chat open, but I love. No, Mel. this is this is stupid tanky shit. I don't do. I don't do that kind of shit. Um, okay, I, the so DPRK. Going, going I, I'm sorry. I will not saying. accept anybody who who. No, 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 Mel. You know what? We'll talk about this after. We'll talk about this after stream. I'm not gonna fucking do this stupid shit. You cannot you you cannot say with a straight face the DPRK is a good state. Come on, that's silly. Even yeah, you admitted that. DPRK, don't be yeah. dumb. Like that's that makes you sound so stupid. Sorry, no, I don't mean don't to be, be mad. mean. No, but it makes me mad because we've had this conversation like ten times, and to walk into a conversation and flatly with a straight face be like, "Oh, the DPRK is good." It's like, okay, good. America's good then too. Now you just sound like the fucking capitalist. Come on. Let's be real. Okay, okay. The, the okay. bottom, the so like, the going... line, the baseline for societies in our world is pretty shit, and I think we should strive for better things. Um, and I, with I that agree. in mind, so going, can we, can I reorient the conversation sure, around what we were it. talking about before? So we were talking about whether or not there should be ideologically pure societies. I don't think there are, but the reason I asked you that question mm -hmm. is not because I'm trying to like hold you to some unrealistic standard, but it's from what you were telling me. It sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like you were saying we should completely organize society on a voluntary basis. No, I just think that we should. I think that we should. Um, I think we should approach a voluntary basis more. Our entire world is built on sticks. All we get is sticks. There's very little incentives in our world, and we should True. give way, way more attention to using incentive structures. And I think that we might be surprised with what we find, seeing as how there's all kinds of incentive um, structures that work really, really great. We already know this. Like we know that, like I mean, for example, uh, uh, an offhand example is that we know how productive, like the Scan like Scandinavian societies are, and how high their quality of life is, and they use a lot more True. incentive structures than we do. So I think that like. Um, what I, when what I brought up on the panel as well is that there is a, a because our world is dominant dominated by um, violent reactionary hierarchical worldviews there is a an inherent bias towards the stick approach and we should be very careful when we decide to wield the stick of the state against individuals um, and that's why I don't I don't support um, mandatory um, mandatory like work especially so, not now but maybe someday i mean if you want to argue like someday in the future um if we have like a society where um healthcare, food water um basic needs are provided by the state and the state says all right well you want these things you got to do some work for it or something we can maybe talk about that but we're very far away from that and until then i don't think that there's any grounds by which a good case can be made for mandatory service um so i i agree with the premise that you're saying and here's an interesting thought experience experiment to this end so let's say it, we have like this hypothetical scenario where we can equally distribute out all the wealth that's been hoarded by like american billionaires etc etc et you mm. know a really like interesting takeaway from from that mm -hmm. is that most people would make over seventy thousand dollars a year at very basic level jobs and almost very very quickly the structure of the economy that we've built up would kind of like spiral out of control and explode so the real reason why it's been so hard to get these like wealth redistributive properties, uh, uh, what's it called, policies in action is because like in doing it, we would destroy this fucking like uh, like predatory version of capitalism that we've created. And they don't want to fucking do that. Well, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's right. their interest, of course. So if we were to actually do that, we would, you know, we would be left with a system where you know, people might not necessarily be willing to work on other things if they could make a shit ton of money doing almost nothing, even if we were to like not change much and just redistribute everything. So like for me, I see it being like an integral component in a post-scarcity future mm -hmm. where people are provided for in the exact same way that you're saying. So mm -hmm. people have their basic needs met, they have enough money to get luxuries, they're not at want for like food or water or housing or like mm. safety or any of that kind of shit. Right. Um, and and then it's like, OK, so we're at this place of like post scarcity. Right. Mm. Or however we want to say this. We're at this place where people are taken care of. Like, I think at least at that point, like we would have to assess whether or not people are voluntarily willing to like contribute meaningfully on a large scale. And if they are, then. But I mean, yeah, then Locke was right. But like, if not, then like we might have to react to that is really all the point that I'm trying to make. 
I mean, perhaps, but again, um, until then, I think we should stray away from um, from um, threatening and forcing people with state power into doing things um, that aren't yeah, like necessary. Like that's I think, totally I think you can make a case for. Um, I mean, I've even had this conversation with an ANCAP because I uh, they did they pulled the um, taxes thing on me and they're like, oh, taxes. Like, I'm like, yeah, but taxes are are functionally an exchange. You benefit from a lot of things, um, right. and you can actually uh, you can essentially you can functionally not pay taxes um, by not having an income or by living off the land. Um, it's complicated, but there are basically, there are a ton of people who don't actually pay like property taxes and the government doesn't really give a shit because it's not worth it to them to go after somebody who just farms. Um, and you know, I think, or that, somebody who just like lives in the middle of the woods in like Alaska. Right. Yeah. Like, like, so these sorts of things are possible, like, and our society doesn't collapse as a result of a few people choosing to like leave the system. So I don't think Well, that's the thing, like these conversations we're having are not like conditioned on like a few people either like not like having it work for them or a few people opting out the conversation is really centered around like like the masses of people that it would help and that's where i pushed back on the panel and i was like if we're talking about this then we have to contextualize it in a way that's not ableist and is going to like leave a shit ton of people out and also can't be exploited by wealthy people. And that's why I made that bone spurs joke. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I think, well, like people who have wealth are always going to be able to exploit things. They're always going to have the advantage of exploiting things. So, I mean, that, that is a different issue, but I mean, it's a different yeah. issue to a degree, but you, there is an enforcement problem and it inevitably, and, and that was why I kept asking that. And by the way, I still didn't get an answer um, about whether what's the punishment, you know? Oh, uh, Dylan, Dylan wants should... to come in. All right. Let's, let's, Dylan, you cool with Jill, yeah. Dylan joining us? All right, and Mel, yeah, Mel, you know what? I'll call Mel too here. Let's add Mel and we'll have a nice uh, chat. And Dylan, let me see here. Oh, here, uh, there, and Mel. I think that's totally fair. You know, yeah. I don't. Hello, 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 hello. Hola, hola. Hi, hi, hi. Everybody back in. Everybody in. I don't know if Mel's gonna answer. Mel, answer your phone. If you want to talk about tanky shit, this is your chance. This is one time. Your one chance. Your one chance. Yeah. This one is, chance. This is, your this is your opportunity to disprove the camps in Xinjiang. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh boy. Mel. Wait. Well, Wait. Where'd breakfast detective go? He got put in the gulag. Oh well. There we go. Okay. There we go. Well, Mel didn't. Mel didn't show up. If Mel shows up. Mel was in the last one. Here, I'll t I, I'm yelling at her. I know she's listening, so maybe she's still yeah, up to the bathroom. Whatever. Get her in here. We'll get her in here. All right. So, yeah, we're talking about um, forced labor, gulags. Um, you know, uh, yes. Breakfast Detective was just telling me how in his ideal society, you will be um, kidnapped everyone and beaten. Everyone would get the gulags. Yeah, yeah. Gets secret, the gulags. secret police for everyone. Yeah, secret police. We're yeah. equal opportunity secret police here. We're, get, right. we're getting right, there. Chat. We're getting there. I, I first, I want to say I think this week went so much better than last week, just all around. It did, yeah. Uh, oh, way better, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's because there wasn't four cancellations. I still had a cancellation that worried the shit out of me, but I think it still sorry went pretty good. Oh no, not you. It was North. You, you, you just had an internet issue. It's all good. It was completely outside of your control. I was so. I'll be honest. So like, I, I'm not gonna spend too long talking about this, but I was so fucking pissed off. Like, I had to, like, leave my apartment and, like, go for a walk and smoke a cigarette. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get that out. Oh, I feel it's that. okay. Grimace made a decent, you know, he made a decent replacement. Yeah. I've had a couple of brief conversations with Grimace. Uh, in fact, I was on synth, uh, the synth. Uh, I was on her panel the other day, and Grimace and Suspect Sushi made a live on air two to one bet. Um, so Grimace is going to have some nice money in his future if Biden manages to uh, catch the election. That'd be damn spicy. Oh shit. my gosh! Yeah. Oh yeah. That, oh, that's an easy W. Honestly. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say it's looking you like say him. catch catch the election as if the man's not like twenty points ahead among like yeah. Trump supporters. Yeah, he's stomping right now. It's looking. Let's just see. Let, let, Yo, you know, I, I don't want to get too confident, hate... but. I hate Biden with like a burning fiery passion, but even I would bet money on him winning. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a pretty good chance. Um, 
honestly, one of the things I was going to talk about um, on before I was invited to Hippy Dippy, I was planning and then canceled because I was feeling bad a uh, stream and then I felt better and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I was going to talk about you felt this. better when you got the DM. I mean, I <laughs> honestly, I felt better like two hours before I got the DM. And then but I was still like, I'm not going to fucking stream because it's already fucking almost five o'clock. And that's like really late for my usual stream time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but then that did it did inspire me to come back and actually do a stream today after all. So I'm glad I did that because it's been really fun so far. Um, but I was going to talk about Trump and the USPS and mail-in ballots, which I think is a really big concern. Um, I think that's like, I don't know. To be honest, like it's incredibly hard for me to gauge what likelihood of success anything that Trump is doing right now has. It just seems like he's in a desperate bid to do everything that he possibly can to fuck with the election because the moment that he's out of office, he's going to be in court for the rest of his life. But demon mama, right? Mm -hmm. what about the voter fraud? What about the mail-in voter, no voter fraud? Yeah. Millions of illegals voting. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Look, the the illegal mailboxes are gonna gonna fill up, gonna fill up with illegal ballots to well, steal. Look, look, illegals are going through people's trash. They're getting their names. They're hiring private investigators to follow them and learn their habits. They're getting their personal inf like information, and then they're buying each and every one of these voters a one-day cruise so they can vote without them knowing. Yeah, it's awesome. You're saying that like it's a joke. How dare you? <laughs> it's uh, it's really weird. Like, I mean, here's the latest thing. I mean, they're saying the USPS put out a thing that's saying that b the ballots might have like a 14-day turn turnaround in some places, which to me is just like, oh, this is like, that's that's like gonna, that would completely invalidate the, that would be, that would completely invalidate the election if like the entire election is done by mail-in, but anybody who voted after October 20th, their ballot's not going to arrive on time. Now that's the sort of thing. Cool. Yeah, that's the sort of thing where I feel like Trump might be able to pull some shit, um, which is really concerning to me. That's um, literally voter suppression. Fuck yeah. that shit. But I mean, they haven't exactly hesitated from engaging in these sort of things, right? Like, um... Oh, of course yeah, not. Like, yeah, I mean, this like, has we, been like the, we saw what happened in, what was it, Virginia or South Car like Carolina with, what's her name, Stacey Abrams? Abrams, yeah. Yeah, she got fucked in that fucking bullshit election. Was it, what was it, Kemp? Who was uh, the, the, the former former head of, like, uh, like, like, state polling and then also happened to be the one who ordered the destruction of like it was, tens he was of on the thousands board. of people's voting rolls. I think he was on the board of election. It, yeah, it's Brian Kemp. He was on. I think he was on the board of elections during the election. Yeah, it didn't. Um, wasn't there also some really weird shit that happened in um, Booker's? Uh, was it Booker um, in Kentucky? Yeah, I'm, Charles. Yeah, Charles Booker, I think, um, where it was like the poll, like there was just like a mass swath of 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 uh, closing of polling locations, um, right? And like the the judge ordered that like people who were there waiting in line weren't allowed to finish voting and stuff like that. Yeah, right. So they so they pulled they closed the polls early, and from what I saw, from this is one of the reasons why they were kind of like ringing the alarm about it mm -hmm. from their internal polling. They saw that the majority of these places closed were in these outlying areas that would have been Booker supporters and that like as a result from like their expected turnout to their actual turnout they got slightly more in mail-in ballots but significantly less in people turning up which you know probably has something to do with COVID but yeah. also definitely has something to do with them closing like I don't know what was it it was it was a ludicrous amount it was like, it's yeah, like it was 70 like percent of their yeah. polling stations or like something it was a yeah. huge huge plurality yeah, it's 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 incredible, and and like, I mean, this is the thing that this is what concerns me about this whole situation, um, which is that that um, by all by all accounts, Biden is absolutely killing it, um, but Donald Trump doesn't follow any rules ever. Um, he bumbles about, he makes huge messes, and that actually concerns me a little bit as far as how far he's willing to go to mess make when more or less his life is on the line. Like, I think he recognizes he doesn't want to spend the next however many lo years left of his life that he has in court for all of the things that he did wrong while he was in office and can't be indicted on. Doesn't he have, like, a stack of cases against him? In uh... Look, if you don't think our president is going to live forever, then you hate America. Yeah. It's, it's concerning to me because, I don't know, like, what does somebody, like... Uh, I mean, he's, he announced last night at, like midnight that there was going to be like a 75,000 quote unquote surge of federal agents to cities like mine, which they arrived. Yep. 
you know, they arrived here. They're you know Tequila. this because you're here. Yeah, they're in Tequila, exactly. Uh, which is like, yeah, spooky. Um, yeah, very that's, scary. That's at least 500 federal agents, including at least 100 border security agents, staged in Tequila, ready to black bag anyone who dares fucking look at a federal building the wrong way <laughs> yeah it's it's really weird now I, like to me now maybe dylan maybe you can weigh in on this a little more um like is seventy five thousand like federal agents even possible without basically like conscripting a ton of people is that even possible do we even have that like amount of federal agents available i mean i don't I believe we probably do. Okay. But the fact is um, he's mobilizing. Like, this is not, like, something that just happens, to right. be completely fucking honest. This is fucking wild. And you want, and I mean, like, I, I talk about, like, the need for direct action and, like, voting. Act. You know what I believe people should do? Stop these people from even entering your city. Yeah. Yo, speaking my language, Dylan. Yep. Yeah, uh, I think you guys want to hear if they want to take away our look. I mean, I support people hear me like talk about like protests all around the world. I apply those same same standards here. The same way the Hong Kongers should resist with everything they have against the Chinese Communist Party and their new laws, like the one they passed recently. This is fucking wild. surveillance law, right? Not only the surveillance law. There's another law they passed to basically if you insult the national anthem, you get three years in jail. Yep. And hey, yeah, that sounds really real similar being... to Trump and his uh, deface the flag, get 10 years in prison. Thankfully, thankfully, right. the Supreme Court has upheld that that's a dumb fuck thing, thanks right. to people like Antonin Scalia, crazily enough. But when we talk about that, I do believe you should block these people from coming into your cities. Do everything you can. Like, don't enact, don't be violent, right? But do everything you possibly can to stop these people from going into your cities, black bagging people, because... To be completely fucking fair and can be completely honest, that's the type of shit dictatorships do. Unmarked oh, yeah, fucking Fuck, yeah. agents coming in, taking people off the street, no warrant, nothing, throwing in the back of a van. I'm positive if Obama did this shit, there'd be people with AR-15 fucking rising yep. up and shit. Yeah, um, there's yeah, a lot 100%. of... Yeah, basically every single like connection I have into local organizing is screaming right now. So in Portland, yeah, Portland's been a hot spot, but I think Seattle's about to get spicy again. Um, you guys want to hear something crazy? So at least maybe to me this is crazy. Maybe it won't sound crazy to you mm -hmm. guys. So I heard from two federal employees today. I'm not going to talk about the branch. Right, um, but I heard from two separate federal em employees today mm -hmm. that if – uh, what's it called? The, the the Fed sends troops to Seattle that they are planning to go out and protest to have them re removed directly. And like one of these like guys was even telling me like, oh, yeah, like I have a like I have a gas mask ready in case they like try to gas us again. And I was like, this fucking man, like I I'm filled with a strange sense of pride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, that's where it's like, it feels like I'm like uh, staring into the dark and just vaguely trying to make out shapes when I'm thinking about like, okay, uh, desperate, um, like incredibly unstable me old man in the White House who has a, a ton of yes men around him with various levels of power, but ultimately a pretty small base who doesn't really have the majority control, but he's making huge motions, like huge authoritative motions. It's like, what is actually like, is anything going to happen? Is it just going to end up being a giant dud and like nobody ends up moving? Like, is it all bluster? Like, I mean, I tend to agree with, uh, I know this is not going to be a, like a particularly original take since fucking Vosh beat me to the coverage of it. But, uh, you know, I tend to agree that Donald Trump doesn't have a hope in, in, in fucking hell, a snowball's chance in hell to like actually do and like any, any sort of like, uh, physical uh, like uh, election resistance on his part, but Three I do degree ramp defeated him. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but I I do fear the the uh, stochastic effect that he is absolutely hammering on like like yes. a fucking anvil. Um. Oh yeah, so, they gas tear gas Ted. Oh well, what a stunt. Yeah, I saw that Ted uh, Wheeler, the mayor of uh, Portland. Oh, hey, tear gas so Ted. I. I hate to be this guy, but mm. I have to contextualize this in that a lot of these spying powers that like Trump is now abusing and using against all these like left wing activists in the street and these protesters, etc. Right. Um, people like pro progressives were screaming their heads about like years ago, all leading up to this, you know, with the Patriot Act, 
with the founding of the Department of Homeland Security, with the founding of ICE. You know, like for years and years and years, we've been saying, hey, don't do this. Like, you don't like you may not be abusing this as bad, you know, like whatever, you know, but like there's no telling that these executive powers you've now created aren't going to be abused by someone in the future. And Obama was like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Everything will be all right. And like now we have concentration camps on the borders. They're sending secret police to the cities. Like, I think we have to acknowledge at a certain point, like a lot of the reason why Trump even has this power is because like Democrats have been complicit in giving it to him for like almost a decade. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, the like failure, like failed opposition party is like, I have so much scathing critique for Democrats. Uh, I, I just, it's like, Oh God. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to check in to say hi quick and comment a little bit, but I got to head out. All right. Uh, hey, thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. Adios. No muchacho. problem. No problem. And, uh, I hope you enjoyed the raid and hope you enjoyed the stream. You have a nice yeah, really did. Thank you so much. Really, and bud. thank you for the raid and thanks for having me on. No problem. See you later. Bye. All right. Um, let me see here. I so, don't know if Mel's going to join us, but we can keep talking for a little bit. I'm probably going to go for a little yeah, longer. No, my, no, my let me not. see if she messaged me. Let's see. Maybe she will. Maybe she won't. She said she's getting food right now, so we'll see. Okay. Well, I got a little bit more more time if you want to finish up. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, no, I, I guess, like, I was just going to – we basically touched on all the stuff I was going to – Um. oh, yeah. sick. Thank you, Gina. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I basically talked about the stuff that – Um. The uh, the stuff I was going to talk about with with you and Dylan, so that's pretty cool. Um, I was going to talk about the uh, the the the, the uh, CPB deployment shit, but we we touched on that. We touched on CPB. We touched on the seven seventy five hundred surge that Trump is pushing for. Um, I don't know. It's really spooky. Um, but at the same time, you also look at Trump and you go, Does this guy actually know what he's doing, or is he just kind of like throwing pins at a wall and seeing what sticks? And if he's just doing that, does he really have the coordination necessary to pull off, like, the type of, like, authoritarian shit that we usually worry about? I don't know. I don't know if he does. Uh, really hey, either either way, I don't think I would factor it into my decision-making process. Like, we yeah. shouldn't underestimate this guy. He's definitely capable of doing a lot of harm. Yeah, I agree. Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean... Um... Yeah, no, no doubt. Like, I mean, I think that's been like a t sort of the testament, but it's also like I also want to have like realistic expectations. Like with what he's saying, like I feel like uh, that's pretty apocalyptic. Like sending seventy five thousand like a s federal troops to various cities is, is pretty concerning. But at the same time, yeah. I'm also like, um, do we? Do we really should we really start like bugging out over that? Because I don't think he's got seventy five thousand on hand. And like, is can he actually get them to do what he wants, or are they just gonna kind of like show up and do photo ops? Like, I don't know. It's really hard to say. Um, here's here's one of the things that's fucked up about this though. When they say seventy five thousand, I mean, first yeah. of all, how do we know that number is any real? He exaggerates everything. Right, right. Um, but like, one of the things that we've seen, especially in Seattle. Um, is that they've been mobilizing like uh, prison guards from federal prisons mm -hmm. uh, just to like, you know, uh, take up a shift. But like now you're at like, you know, 25th and Pine or like whatever. Yeah. And like they've they're, been they're able to tap the, uh, federal agents from officers. all over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, um, my, I don't know, like it, it, some of these things, it's like I'm still trying to think myself on like uh, what what I think the best uh, response is. Um, I mean, Seattle's uh, been about as uh, Seattle and Portland have been about as resilient as you can possibly be in the face of this stuff. Um, right. In this whole uh, this whole last few months of escalation. Um, but it's hard to see how much more escalation there can be before like all legitimacy of the federal government at least for now it disappears like especially if they start tampering directly with the election it's just like okay so just uh, it's it's challenging my ability to like analyze it and come to like a meaningful conclusion besides hey if you can get out there get the fuck out there right now because it's, right. The it's now now or ne like it feels a lot in a lot of ways like it's like now or never but uh then it's also like wall? what's that did you see the wall that they're building around the West Precinct? Yeah, I heard about that. Um, I saw that. Um, I I heard that 
and now I don't know. I know that in Portland, the Department of Transport um, ended up uh, citing them and, and is going to be taking down the wall. <laughs> um, I, and I heard whispers of that happening here in Seattle, but I don't know if that actually happened today since I've been on stream. So That would be great. I need to look into that. Because, like, it's, you know, it obviously takes an ADA-compliant, like, sidewalk and just obliterates it. Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, th I mean, and also, yeah, not only does it, like, make it immo immobile, it's, like, permanently damaged. Like, it costs the state, right. it costs our state money for these fuckers to come in here and do this. Like, I don't know. Exactly. I also feel like, I don't know. fix all this shit. Inslee's got to fucking step up his game. Like, he's not even, like, I don't know. Sleep at the wheel. Yeah, big time. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, COVID I'm out for, oh, like protests in the streets. I sleep. Yeah, I was, I'm really surprised that there hasn't been at least like, I mean, especially because like of how much antagonism Trump has done at Jay Inslee for like a long time. Like, come on, dude, fucking put, put up some fighting against him. Like, just tell him, no, fuck off. Get out of here. What's he going to do? Like, I don't know. Like, I do feel, you, do you follow him on uh, Twitter? Yeah, I don't see many so, of his posts though. Yeah, he almost never posts. And what he does, like this like meme that I've had with him, is he just like says something along the lines of like, President Trump may insult me, but like Washington's doing great. Yeah. And that's like Let's see what James, he posts. Like, see what his classic, last post like, was. The greatest hits. Let's see what he is. I'm go I'm checking his yeah, thing right now. Let's see. Let's see what his latest post is. Um, Washington's are doing great. Happy, happy, <laughs> this was seven hours ago. Happy opening day, Mariners. It's been a while, but put me in, coach. P true to the blue. Masks on. Cool. Cool. Um, it's critical that the administration only provide what is needed by state and local officials and do not engage unless asked. Now we are hearing a different story where, like, this is like, Hold on. I'm concerned that anything could aggravate the situation in their rush. They are not listening to Mayor Jenny and Chief Carmen Best. Like, this is literally, like, the most... It's literally just meaningless. There's no nothing being Mayonnaise. said. It's like, uh-oh, maybe something bad will happen. I don't know. Not going to do anything about it. You know, the biggest city in right. in my state has been has has had a residential neighborhood bathed in, in tear gas for, like, uh, half a month. And yeah, seriously. Yeah. You know oh, yeah, Abbott like sucks. This this sounds like the Dakota Access Pipeline shit. Remember that? Yeah, yes, I do remember that. The uh... When Dakota Access Pipeline was kicking off and there's all those protesters there, they were like appealing to the state and the county and the president. And like literally everyone had the classic Jay Inslee there. It was like, well, you know, we're just going to see how it plays out. Yeah, they they have the luxury of just like trying to sit back. I mean, but I get, but then also M Mayor Durkin thought that too. You know, like I think Mayor That's Durkin's true. And then initial... they found her house. Yeah, which hey, <laughs> hey, huge, huge shout out to past me. Um, uh, before that even happened on my stream, uh, uh, there was a debate where somebody was saying, "Well, what do you think people should do?" And I specifically said, "Um, I specifically said, why aren't people protesting at her house? She is like no. the main cause of this. Go fucking annoy the shit out of her." And then people were like, "Well, that seems a bit uncivil, don't you?" I'm like, "No." Oh, come on, that's how you do effective protest. Yeah, you go annoy people because it's actually, as it turns out, um, you can actually get people who have political power to listen to you if you fucking annoy them and you annoy them in a place where like they try to get oh, away mind from waves, shit. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah like if if this person is gonna retreat into their fucking like mountain layer to like hide from criticism no well, fuck that go and visit them in the mountain layer <laughs> and be like no 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 we're not letting you get away from this shit that easily like you have to listen to us yeah i mean also it hurts their case real bad like i mean um I, I will say it's been a little bit funny for me to see um, Jenny Durkin just fail again and again and again and again with every single t attempt at negotiation um, that doesn't involve literal tear gas. Like she's like, yep. oh, uh, like invoking the uh, invoking the leash that was put on the SPD to prevent them from implementing a, a tear gas ban is got to be the most like embarrassing and pathetic and infuriating thing I've seen any local politician do do in a long time like holy shit for anyone who doesn't understand a few years ago uh, i don't know i don't know the exact time this was implemented but basically the um seattle city council put a limitation 
on um on the Seattle P police department that said that they have to have federal oversight because they are so bad. It was such an atrociously bad police department that they demanded that before they make any um, institutional changes to the police, there will be federal oversight to make sure that they aren't putting in something that's disgustingly inhumane. Um, they and were under that decree for over a decade, over a decade. Like it was one of the longest federal de decrees for any major city in the country. Mm -hmm. It's really bad. And now the uh, mayor of Seattle, Jenny Durkin is trying to use that restriction to prevent a tear gas ban because technically a tear gas ban from the city is an institutional change to the police, but it's like literally got slapped down by a judge instantaneously because it's like a bad faith, an obviously bad faith interpretation of the law. But it's like, that's how pathetic, that's how pathetic these like mayors and shit are like, who are capitulating to the, to their like extremely bloated police forces are right now. What a, sh what a shame. What a fucking it's embarrassment. Honestly, like it's a fucking embarrassment. That's the best way to like put it. And the fact that like she keeps trying to hide from it and she keeps trying to dodge it. Like, did you see that that video where like after they came out with this press statement saying like, oh, we've spoken to black leaders. Like mm -hmm. so many people were like, who the fuck did you speak to? Like, yeah. What are you talking about? They brought and, like, in they, a random person yes. that nobody knew in the community. And then uh, yes. and it caused a huge outrage. That was like on like the first time that happened was like on day three of the pro day three of peaceful protests getting tear gassed in Capitol Hill. It's like, holy shit. And like there was this video. Going oh, around. hey, do we have a Mel hey, here? Hey, what up, Mel? What was I? What was I supposed to be here for? It's getting McDonald's. I'm really fucked up. So what's happening? Oh, nothing. You were just saying tanky shit in my chat, and so I, and then you said you wanted to talk, and then I said, "All right, then come in." Oh, you always want to talk about this stuff. All right. Well, whatever. You can be high. We're at the. We're at the. I'm. I'm like at the end of my stream, so we're gonna talk a little more. We were. We were. Breakfast detective and I were talking about uh the hell the the dark grim hilarity of the situation in seattle um that has just dude, been dude well portland's crazy too Wait, yeah am I, on this? am I actually on this yeah you're on this right now i like i have a question mark next to my fucking well name. oh yeah i can get rid of the question mark now we <laughs> no, officially leave it there. it's funny it's funny because okay. i'm like all i'm, I'm a little blood so it's like yeah what? that's gonna be me after this i need to like go smoke really bad my head is like killing me and uh I, so, I slept so why, is, why was the hippy dippy podcast like 20 fucking hours long holy it was, wait dude. what it was only four hours that's it's so usual long. length no it's always that's that so long, long. It's holy like... fuck what dude it felt so long i like i only watched like half of it and it was like two hours and i was like holy shit wait like there's i ah oh, the cat again mel oh my god mel sorry. pet that cat you gotta silence the cat this time somehow you got so loud i don't know how oh my god love it that's how you do it it's very easy but she never wants kitty to come here me. mel pick it up and bring so it i will leave you with this thought because i know you're trying to go to bed and wrap up um god i need to mute. but uh this the seattle first of all love that cat and second of all the seattle police are an absolute fucking joke especially after all these videos joke. that we've seen uh like posted around of them like like you know like kidnapping people out of their house and then like releasing them without like charging them with a crime you know, like uh, shooting rubber bullets at uh, like, what's it called? Like fucking uh, like pregnant people and like autoimmune compromised people. The fact that they blew out someone's eye. I mean, like, I, I think there's probably even more than one incident of that. I just know that one of them was a journalist. Yep. They hit a, um, there's like a, a video, um, Spec the Lawless. I don't know if you follow um, speculation. Spec is great. Yeah, yeah Spec's great. Um, but Spec did a video um that has like a collection of the footage that like happened before like even Chaz and Chop stuff started. And like, there's literally like the, like Kiro five, I think is the one of the local, I think I always get the acronym yeah, yeah. mixed up. Is that the, um, is that the right wing one? Um, I don't know. They're a local station. I always assume basically every local station is slightly right wing because half of them are run by like, <laughs> like, I mean, you know, like even like local ABC stations and stuff like that tend to be uh, kind of right wing. Ever thought about why protesters are bad and simping yeah. for your boss is good?
Yeah. Uh, well, they had they had her like out on Cal, like Cal Anderson like before again before Chaz Chop came up and got hit in the chest with an incendiary round while Jesus holding a microphone Christ. and like it was just like boom and there's like a huge burn mark on her chest and like a bunch of pieces of her clothing get blown apart and I'm just like holy fucking shit that's a somebody who's literally got a press shirt on holding a microphone with their camera person right over there crazy. Oh yeah. The- so somebody caught a conversation either yesterday yeah. or the day before or the shadow police or joking around on public comms saying, Oh, you know, we got somebody in black on a bicycle riding downtown and somebody else is like, should we arrest him? And he's like, no, but uh, you know, if, you know, um, he's in front of our, our bus and like, we have somewhere to go, like, don't stop. And they said something along those lines, which is like, they were joking around about running this this person over with a fucking police vehicle, like a big bus. It's like, cool, that's the kind of fucking police we have. They joke around about running us over. Yeah, one of the first experiences when I moved here to Washington that I ever had with uh, fucking Seattle PD was I was driving on the highway and there was a huge traffic jam. And uh, I saw a guy on a motorcycle and he was like weaving in between all the cars in the ca- traffic jam, which, you know. It's a great way to get yourself fucking pulled over. And sure enough, the guy goes and gets pulled over. But I'm not kidding you. Like the police like flag him over and he goes and go- goes over to the side. The cop bl- throws open his door and comes out with his fucking gun drawn for a fucking traffic oh violation. God. I was like, when we were, when we went by, I was like, holy shit. Because it was like, you know, what, by the time we pulled up and saw this, like, of course, like the traffic is starting to open up. And so you could see like where this guy was. You see the cop like open the door and go out with a gun. I'm like, holy fucking shit. This is insane. That is the most unbelievable, um, instantaneous escalation I've ever seen. That was my first experience I ever had with Seattle police. And I was like, oh, now I understand why people say Seattle police are some of the worst in the fucking, yeah, massive A cab to that for sure. I, yeah, let's get a Baskin Robbins logo in the chat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I so, love that Baskin shit. Robbins. Yeah, it's good shit. That um, was behind the East Precinct. Oh, was it? That's amazing. Yeah, that's the best place for it, too. I was doing a little bit of spelunking in a video. Sick. Game. Oh, nice. <laughs> Hell yeah. But, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, I, so New Jersey is like the preeminent police state, like in the country, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have the heaviest, densest police, like uh, presence of, I think any state, at least as, as far as I know of, Mm -hmm. I haven't researched this extensively, but I've I've been to a lot of places, but that aside. So I came to Seattle thinking anything has to be less than this. And the first time I ever see Seattle cops are two bike cops. Who, who like stop and they pull up to some lady who's like drunk and like trashed on the on the on the sidewalk she's like all fucked up and she's like falling all, all over the place and like her dress is all like out of place and you know she's just like trashed and they go up to her and they're like are you all right and she's like yeah i'm just you know i'll meet my friends in my ho- hotel and they're like where are your friends and she's like oh they're waiting for me like do you know where you need to go and like you know long story short this woman was like really confused and like like trashed and like had had no idea what to do. And these cops actually like got off their bikes and sat down, like called her an Uber on her phone, waited until they got there, gave the guy instructions. And like, I lived around the corner. So I saw this shit happening out of my mm-hmm. window, but I was like, what the fuck? These people are so chill. And then like, I immediately, every other experience that I've had from that has been the complete opposite. <laughs> that, was your, like that, was your, that was your that was your that was your you got you got psyop you got that's your that's your welcome to seattle one time cops being kind of okay pass <clears throat> one time like yeah. hey like one time on a good day with two of the best people before they got fucking blacklisted <laughs> like, yeah i mean our our the what's the guy the fucking police commissioner guy um mike sloan mike fuck sloan that shit. fucker yeah mike sloan literally was just found Having committed voter fraud. Yep, fucking not just it's him, a but he, but it's but not just him, but multiple members of the of the police union um, were using the address of the police union building so they could vote and influence Seattle city elections. From l- despite the fact that they all live outside of Seattle, so there was literally a a notable. I don't know the exact numbers because it hasn't been released yet because it's still a developing story. But a a a enough for news to be reporting on it number of police officers 
um, were using the the address of the police union building as their home address so that they could vote um, on, in Seattle city in Seattle, uh, politics. Yeah. yeah. That is so which, fucking corrupt. Which is a fucking felony. Felony. So yep. like this guy, so Mike Sloan, he also went on a right wing radio talk show. I forget like a week oh, or two yeah, ago. Oh yeah, I remember this. Yes. And he made specific comments to this guy saying, Hey, you know, Donald Trump, if you're listening, like after seeing like how effective the, the federal, you know, law law enforcement presence was in Portland, we think we really need something like that in Seattle to quell these violent protesters. It's like violent. Violent, Where's what the, the fuck violence? are you talking about? Like show me an evidence show me evidence of one violence. <laughs> like yeah, the, and and the example of violence they have is always like a fucking like that one that was uh uh the fucking where they were like someone set a fire inside the uh inside the the police building and then it was literally a firework went in and immediately fizzled out in the official footage that was uh yep. that was reported by Carmen Best and given to the to the news you can see it go out and not catch on fire in right. the video it's just like holy saying, shit like, don't believe your don't believe your lying eyes yeah exactly it's pretty bad you know what's crazy though what they so they report that right yeah they report that extensively but when the the SPD left the east precinct in chop what happened a bunch of protesters came out with long rifles and like protected the building from anyone who might have tried to fucking set it on fire. Yep. And these are like people who, you know, uh, came to CHOP to help protect people. These weren't like, you know, like reactionary, like three, three percent, like boogaloo yeah. boys. Like these are people who are like, if you fucking set this shit on fire, they will use that as an excuse to crack down on us like crazy. And there's mm -hmm. a fuck ton of res like residential buildings around here. So, you know, knock it off. They didn't report that shit at all. That was such a good faith move by these protesters. Yeah, so, and like you know, two of the, there were like um, two, uh, there were like two things that were reported on by local media that were like, oh, it was a murder that happened. One of, uh, both of which didn't actually happen inside CHOP, but were reported by the media as having happened inside of CHOP. And the police were like, oh, we can't reply to that um, because it's in CHOP. Yep. Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah, I have a whole thing so, I'm gonna do on Chaz on Chaz Chop because um uh there's a, there this uh one of my mods um who also has done some really cool shit for my uh for my for my thumbnails um Gina gave me a video that's just like disgusting disinformation so I'm trying to uh, find time to do a whole debunk of it but it's like a, it's quite a lot yeah. of claims so yeah um. Well, yeah, I think that's all I have for for yeah. for for everybody right now. I think I gotta go get some food because my head is starting to blow Dude, up. Do it, girl. Get yeah. some water. Stretch those legs. Get some food. Everyone in the chat, if you like Demon Mama on the panel earlier, you liked any of these conversations, support this channel. Drop some Amazon Primes and hey, thank get a you. couple bucks. Maybe consider subscribing. And uh, Breakfast Detective, thanks for coming on and having the talk with me. Um, I really enjoy talking with you, even when we differ. So I agree. Um, I yeah. like disagreeing with you. I really respect your, your point of view. Thank you for clarifying some of those uh, things for me. Absolutely. And thank you for the gifted sub. That. Thank you so much. Uh, so much gifted, gifted sub. sub. Hell yeah. Yeah. So um, Mel, is there I, anything you want to talk about or do you just want to play games after this? Did I want to talk about stuff and play games? <coughs> Sorry, all right I died. all right so i'll, anyway. I'll i'm gonna i'm gonna um end the call then and then we'll talk after um okay. i'm gonna I just, just send tell, off i just want to tell everyone your stream that i love them a lot is that okay yeah you can tell my stream of course you can tell my stream that you love them a whole lot i'm sure they love you too demon mama can i signal boost our our chat tomorrow before i was just about release? to do that please do yes oh excellent. that saves okay. me the, the talking <laughs> so, yeah, so loud um, cat is so loud so tomorrow, Saturday, 2 p.m. PST, that's minus 8 UTC, co-hosted by your girl, Milk Toast Leninism, starring Demon Mama, as well as a bunch of other creators. We're going to be talking about representation. We're going to be talking about radical acceptance. We're going to be talking about a little bit of philosophy shit as it applies to the community at large. You're going to have a great time. You're going to love it. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to laugh. So come check it out. Check out your girl, Demon Mama. Check out the show. Thank you so much. And yeah, I will be on that tomorrow. Uh, looking really forward to it. Um, I'm just picking somebody we're going to raid real quick here. I think we're going to raid. 
let's raid Amy C3. There we go. All right. Have I'm going to end the call. Night. Yeah, have a, have a good night. Bye. Thank Adios. you so much. <sighs> hey, that was a really, really good talk. Um, I think we had a lot of good stuff to say. Um, yeah. Uh, I had a really good conversation. Um, we actually touched on everything that I was going to cover. We didn't even have to Tim pool any articles. So that's great. Everyone who's here to everyone who subbed, who gifted subbed, who gave bits, who talked in chat, who watched. Thank you all so much. You are the ones who make this shit possible. I love you very, very much. Mwah. And you can see me doing a whole bunch of shit coming up soon. On Tomorrow, I'm going to be on Breakfast Detective. And on Monday, I am going on to Prime K's political roundtable. So, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Gina, you get some rest. You've been doing a lot of work, too. And you deserve a ton of rest. Let me just raid out to... Wait, it's... How does this... How does it work? Thank you so much, Electric Cop uh, Copper. I appreciate that. Amy C3... I, I, I do it because I fucking love spending... I, I love talking politics and I love being able to see y'all happy in chat. So, love you all very much and I will see you too soon. What? Oh, I misspelled it. That's why. C3. Here we go. There's the raid. Go say hi to Amy C3. Um, I'm really glad to hear you learned a lot. That's my goal, um, is to provide entertaining, enlightening content that's also, you know, advances our goal to a better fucking world. I'll see you all very soon, and thank you all for being here. Ah.